Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's indigenous people. Clark. Uh, Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute as shown on the order of business. Are there any proposals for committees to meet? Yes, Mr President, a committee has lodged a proposal as shown at item 4 of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Treasury Laws Amendment Cyclone and Flood Damage Reinsurance Pool Bill 2022 for concurrence. Minister. I move that this bill now proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. question is that the bill be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Terrorism Insurance Act 2003 in order to establish a cyclone and related damage in reinsurance pool operated by the Australian Reinsurance Pool Corporation and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard. Is, there, is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Clark. No. Oh, sorry, Senator McAllister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I rise to speak to the Treasury Laws Amendment Cyclone and Flood Damage Reinsurance Pool Bill 2022. At the outset, I advise that Labor will be supporting this bill. Across Australia, millions of people are struggling with the rising cost of living. And under Mr Morrison and Mr Joyce, petrol prices cost of living generally skyrocketing and working families are falling behind. Now, this has been something that has received very little attention from the government until just very recently. And surprise, surprise, with an election in view, this now appears to be a priority, having done pretty much nothing about it for the last nine years. Because if the government actually cared, if they actually cared about the cost of living, if they cared about pressures on families, those opposite would not have spent a decade attacking wages, attacking job security and attacking Medicare. The reality is that everything, everything is going up for Australians except for their pay. This bill is designed to address some of the very specific cost pressures that affect Australians that live in parts of the country that are especially exposed to natural disaster. And Labor recognises there have been significant increases in the cost of insurance for households and small businesses in parts of Australia, particularly in Northern Australia. But let's be clear about this. The increasing cost of insurance is directly related to the increased risk of damage to life and property from severe weather events associated with climate change. Now, I recall 15 years ago the warnings that were assembled and put very, very clearly by insurance companies. I remember the work they did trying to convince the Howard government, the Howard government to do something about climate change. But that government was populated by climate deniers just like this one, and they did absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing to tackle climate change, tackle climate change. And the problem is, as we are now seeing, that a warming world is expensive. Aside from the costs that it imposes to the economy generally, it puts very significant pressure on households and business budgets, and it is leading to underinsurance in certain regions of Australia. 
Now, in recent years, there have been several reviews and inquiries into the availability and affordability of insurance in Northern Australia. And despite all these reviews, despite all the recommendations, the Morrison government has failed to act until now, until now, in what is likely the final week of the parliament. The final week of the parliament, and they want people to think that they care about cost of living and they care about underinsurance and they care about the impacts of climate change on community. Labor has been calling on the Morrison government to release the details of the reinsurance pool and in particular the modelling upon which its claims of uh, reductions in premiums are based. The Morrison government still refuses to release it. And it's not only Labor that wants to see it, wants to see the workings, wants to see the numbers, that doesn't believe what this group of incompetents and charlatans on the other side are telling us about their policies. Insurance bodies, key stakeholders, they want to see it too. Many of them haven't seen the modelling or the key assumptions that will allow them to provide information to their members about the impacts of this policy. In its submission to the Senate Economic Legislation Committee inquiry into this bill, the RACQ said, and I'll quote them, to date, RACQ cannot assess the impact the pool will have on our members' home insurance premiums primarily because we have not received proposed pricing rates or associated modelling from the Australian Reinsurance Pool Corporation. Well, it's something that the minister might want to consider addressing in replying and summing up. Why won't they show people the numbers? Why won't they provide the information that the sector is asking for? Now, this bill represents a very belated engagement with emergency management and natural disaster. As I said, the truth is that climate change is making things worse. We actually need a government that recognises the threat posed by climate change and who accepts responsibility for both the long-term and the short-term solutions to this problem. People on the north coast and south east Queensland have been devastated by recent floods. It might have prompted a competent government, a caring government, a responsive government, a government thinking about its people into some kind of action. However, when the Prime Minister finally travelled, finally travelled to the Northern Rivers, what was that for? Well, it was for a photo opportunity. Not to meet with the flood victims, not to meet with the community members who so explicitly had wanted and sought an explanation for why his government had abandoned them at a time of desperate need. What is it about this guy? What is it about this Prime Minister that makes him so desperate for self-promotion, but equally as desperate to avoid meeting with people battling to get a hearing. Mr Morrison is so invested in avoiding responsibility that he no longer even notices the real people who suffer the consequences of his failures. This is the same Prime Minister that has presided over an inequitable distribution of assistance, that has seen people receive different amounts of money depending on where they live and, in some cases, depending on who their local MP is. Well, shame. I was born in a flood. I was born in the hospital in Mwoolumba in the flood in 1973. And I know that those communities that I know so well understand natural disaster and understand the kind of community effort, the kind of collective effort, the kind of solidarity that is necessary to respond. In the aftermath of the floods just a few weeks ago, I was actually uh, stranded. I was visiting my mum and dad, uh, and I was um, at their place in the midst of the emergency. I, I should qualify that they were in no danger, but plenty of people in that community were. A week later, I returned to Lismore to meet with some of the people I know there, some of the leaders in community organisations that I know there, and to assist them in cleaning up their organisations and talking with them about what they needed. It was a very big day with a lot of emotion. What was immediately evident, though, was that community spirit that I talked about. People were cheerfully supporting one another, staffing evacuation centres, donating food, 
helping one another clean up. Emergency services, frontline workers working around the clock, municipal workers camping up at the dam to make sure night after night after night, day after day after day, camping up at the dam to make sure that the supply of potable water wasn't interrupted when so many other interruptions had occurred. Thank you to those workers. As one of their representatives in parliament, I cannot thank them enough for everything they have done. But there are also plenty of tears on that trip because the damage is enormous. Many of the people I met had lost their house and their place of work. I don't think if you, you can understand the scale of destruction if you haven't been there. The people who are running community organisations are devastated. Their job, and they know it, they understand their responsibilities, their job is to support people in their most desperate times. People facing in an area that's of importance to me, domestic and family violence. But the premises from which they provide those services have been completely destroyed. And we know from experience that tragically, in times of community trauma, the incidence of violence is likely to increase. But people have no services to turn to in a time of need because of the damage that's been done to the premises of those community organisations. I don't see any response to that from this government, any interest in responding to it. It's vitally important that in addition to disaster payments provided to individuals, the government quickly assess what is required to ensure that the community of Lismore, the broader communities of the Northern Rivers, so many of whom have been affected by flood, are not left without vital community services. As I said at the beginning of my contribution, Labor supports the establishment of a reinsurance pool for Northern Australia. We've been willing to cooperate with the Morrison government on the establishment of this pool. However, the establishment of a reinsurance pool on its own will not be enough to significantly reduce insurance premiums in the north of Australia. This policy must be accompanied by others that reduce the risk of damage to property in the future. It should be linked to better planning rules investment in mitigation infrastructure, retrofitting buildings, building for resilience into the future. Labor recognises this. My colleague Senator Watt has joined us in the chamber. I know that he is so proud of Labor's Disaster Ready Fund, which will allocate up to $200 million per annum for disaster readiness and mitigation measures. It's in stark contrast to the actions of the Morrison government, which locked up the $4.8 billion emergency response fund for three years, only to start releasing funds on the eve of an election. It's no way to govern. It's not a responsible way to govern, and it's not good enough. This fund could have built flood levees, drainage improvements, cyclone shelters and bushfire evacuation centres. It could have been used to keep people safe. Instead, it was used as a cash cow. Scott Morrison and his government had earned them over $830 million in interest in the period that it was just sitting there. And in three years, it has not spent a cent on disaster recovery or even started building a single disaster mitigation project. Under Labor's policy, up to $200 million per year will be invested in disaster readiness to protect lives and livelihoods. An Albanese government will ensure that the establishment of a reinsurance pool is just one of a suite of measures to resist the risk of loss of life and property associated with the increasing risk of severe weather. If we are elected to government, if we have that privilege, we will investigate adding flood coverage to the reinsurance pool as part of the 2025 statutory review of the operation of that pool. But I tell you what, Australians shouldn't have to wait till an election is imminent before their government decides to keep them safe. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I can indicate at the outset that the Australian Greens will be supporting this legislation, but in saying that, I want to say that this is a pretty extraordinary piece of legislation that's currently before the Senate. The Assistant Treasurer 
a member of the Liberal Party, supposedly a flag bearer for the free market, has introduced a bill that will nationalise reinsurance for cyclone and related flood damage to residential and business properties. Now, we shouldn't beat around the bush here. We are actually proposing to nationalise a section of the reinsurance market in Australia. That is, the taxpayer takes on the financial burden of offering reinsurance in some circumstances in some parts of Australia from a party that brands itself as the flag bearer of the free market. Now, the reason the Liberal Party has had to introduce this legislation to nationalise reinsurance for cyclone-related damage is because, is because tens of thousands of homeowners and businesses can no longer afford to insure their property. Now, why can't they any longer afford to insure their property? Because cyclones are becoming more intense and are causing more damage. And why is this happening? It's happening because our climate is breaking down around us. And what is turbocharging climate change? That's right, the policies of the current Liberal government. And we're going to see a budget brought down in a few short hours, and I'll make a prediction. I would put my house on this prediction coming true. There will be somewhere in the region of $10 billion in each and every year that this budget covers of subsidies to make burning fossil fuels cheaper in Australia. Public subsidies for fossil fuel combustion. Turbocharging the climate crisis. This bill is on the front line of the climate emergency. And this bill may be extraordinary, but what is uh, anything but extraordinary is that this bill, of course, is half cooked. Instead of responding to the breakdown of our climate in an urgent and holistic way, this bill demonstrates how ad hoc, how hypocritical and how artificial this government is. Remember, this is a government, the Liberal National Coalition, that has spent eight years actively hastening the breakdown of our climate, turbocharging it by pumping public subsidies into encouraging people and corporations to burn fossil fuels, a government that has done nothing in that time meaningful to prepare our country for the inevitable impacts of climate change that scientists have been warning about for decades, whether they be floods, whether they be bushfires, whether they be sea level rise and storm surge, whether they be any of the other eminently predictable and uh, very compre comprehensively predicted impacts of climate change. This government's done effectively nothing to prepare us for those things. A government which has done nothing to prepare us for those things because it is made up in part of people who deny that climate change, that human induced climate change, is even a reality, and a government that relies um, on its massive donations from fossil fuel corporations in order to run its upcoming re-election campaign. So you've got a situation where, in the face of skyrocketing insurance costs that are clearly the result of our climate breaking down, they have introduced a bill to nationalise reinsurance to remove reinsurers' profit margins from the cost to consumers, but only for a particular class of climate change-driven disasters and only for uh, a small group of climate change-related disasters that are in a particular part of our country. Now, undoubtedly, no one has felt the impact of um, the breakdown of our climate on their insurance premiums more 
than residents and businesses in cyclone affected areas. But that doesn't mean that people who do not live in cyclone affected areas are not feeling the impacts of climate change on their insurance costs. And climate change is not just impacting on insurance costs in flood prone areas. In my home state of Tasmania, people are paying more on their insurance premiums because of bushfire, increased bushfire risk. What is causing increased bushfire risk? That's right, climate change. If this government was serious about addressing cost pressures on reinsurance and therefore cost pressures on retail insurance, they would come in this, into this place with a comprehensive plan to nationalise reinsurance in Australia for any so-called natural disasters that are happening or are made worse because of climate change. And we know that climate change has impacted so tragically on so many people so recently in our country and, in fact, right now, as we debate this legislation, people in Lismore and the surrounding areas who did it so tough just a few short weeks ago are again being evacuated from their homes in some places because of the next round of climate change driven rains and floods. And I'll make the blindingly obvious point to members because it needs to be said. It needs to be said that these floods that are happening right now in Lismore and surrounding areas and the floods in the Northern Rivers area and the Brisbane area of a few short weeks ago, none of those floods were officially cyclone related. So this bill would not have provided relief from insurance premium pressures caused by those floods because those floods were not the result of a declared cyclone by the Bureau of Meteorology. And this shows the complete lack of understanding from this government about the real cost pressures facing Australian people right across so many parts of the country as a direct result of climate change. I mean, this legislation is the front line of the climate emergency, and surprise, surprise, a government that has failed at every hurdle in addressing the breakdown of our climate and preparing our country for the inevitable and predicted impacts has once again responded in a half-cooked way. This legislation is out of date before it's even been legislated. In fact, under this legislation, under the government's plan, people in Queensland and New South Wales who have just been hit by floods and in some parts are being hit by floods right now as we have this debate will effectively be underwriting insurance for those living in cyclone-prone areas along with the rest of the country. That's how half-cooked this legislation is. Furthermore, this bill should be, but unsurprisingly is not, being accompanied by a coherent strategy or serious investment of public funds to help Australia's communities better protect themselves against the impacts of climate change. Insurers, regulators and acad academics have been saying for years, and it was reiterated um, recently during the Senate inquiry into this bill, that this is of paramount importance. Only 3 per cent of government spending on climate disasters in Australia goes towards mit mitigation and prevention. This bill provides more of the cure, but where, we have to ask, is the prevention. As I said, a properly conceived government reinsurance pool 
would cover all climate-related disasters across the entire country. That would be a holistic and equitable response. All Australians should be able to enjoy the cost savings of a government scheme that removes the profit margin from the cost of reinsurance. But more than just being fair, a fully national scheme would make the risks of climate disasters transparent to government, which would make it in the government's interest to invest in the public works that are so desperately needed to help keep insurance costs down. Full nationalisation of reinsurance against climate disasters would be a collective response to a collective problem. And that is what the Australian Greens believe should be happening. Now, to that end, we will be seeking the Senate's support for a number of amendments that would make this bill more equitable and improve its effectiveness. Our amendments, on, our amendments on sheet 1559 would immediately expand the scope of the bill to cover all flood damage so that, for example, people in Queensland and New South Wales who were so terribly impacted by current and recent floods would be provided with immediate support. Sheet 1569 would include damage to motor vehicles from cyclones and floods, which is important given that a number of insurers package together home and car insurance. Sheet 1570 would require the statutory review of the Act to consider the expansion of the scope of the scheme to include any and all climate-related disasters. And finally, a second reading amendment on sheet 1581 that would require that the $10 billion to establish and maintain the reinsurance pool be derived from taxation on entities extracting and combusting fossil fuels. And I take I mean, it that you're moving that way, Senator McKim, I'll on move the second that reader. Thank you. Um, thank you, Deputy President. Um, <clears throat> And apologies if I said acting earlier on. It's just a bit hard to tell with the mask on it's who right. that is. So my, my apologies for that. Um, the, uh, let's be clear about this. And I, I speak now to the second reading amendment. Just be clear. This would require that the funding that is going to be allocated out of the public purse to establish and maintain a, re, uh, a nationalised reinsurance pool would be derived by taxing companies that extract and burn fossil fuels. We have to be upfront. It is the burning of fossil fuels, the extraction and burning of fossil fuels, that are, that are the primary driver on a global scale of the breakdown of our climate. Corporations have profited massively and obscenely from extracting and combusting fossil fuels for so many decades now, whilst for many decades we knew exactly what the impact of burning those fossil fuels would be. Those who do profit and have profited from the burning of fossil fuels should be made to pay for the costs of the breakdown of our climate. And that is why we believe that the $10 billion that will establish and maintain this reinsurance pool created by this legislation should be derived by taxing the fossil fuel corporations. Um, uh, uh, Deputy President, I can indicate uh, that regardless of the success or failure of any of our amendments, we will still maintain our support for this legislation. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Macdonald. Thank you, Deputy President. And I rise to speak to the Treasury Laws Amendment Cyclone and Flood Damage <coughs> Reinsurance Bill, Bill 2022. Uh, and I will just take a moment to compose myself, having just listened to the greatest amount of codswallop that's potentially ever been spoken in this chamber. Because most critics of the reinsurance pool don't live in the North. They don't reflect the lived experience of thousands of people in the North. I have to acknowledge the strong advocacy over the last 10 years from Warren Inch, the member for Leichhardt, George Christensen, 
the outgoing member for Dawson, Phil Thompson, the member for Herbert, Andrew Wilcox, mayor of Whitsunday and candidate for Dawson, Bryce Macdonald, chairman of Cane Growers Tully and LNP candidate for Kennedy, Deputy Mayor Andrew Cripps, Nicole Tobin, both Senate candidates for the LNP, because all of these people live, work, play and pay the increased costs of insurance and the associated costs of rentals in North Queensland. In Northern Australia, 7.9 per cent of all the senators in this place live in Northern Australia. 4.6 of House of Representative members live in Northern Australia. We have 51 per cent of the land mass of the country, 1.3 million people, 3 per cent of the population, and yet we produce 11 per cent of the GDP. And yet we have to listen to those from the South refuse to give us the same advantages and level playing field as we, we desperately need in the North. Because in these times, in these critical times, it is important that Australia gets stronger, and we get stronger quickly. And the way we do that is to invest in the places where we make our money, the places that generate the royalties and the income to ensure the highest standard of living that Australians enjoy compared to so many of our near neighbours. Roads, infrastructure, families, communities, uh, investments in the north. But none of this is possible, none of this is, is possible without affordable and accessible insurance. In the north, we pay more. We pay more for electricity. We pay more for building materials. In Cloncurry, it costs $700,000 to build the same house that it costs $400,000 in Brisbane. We pay more for flights to get in and out of our regions, and we pay more for insurance, and for a long time longer than the rest of the country because our premiums have been at least two and a half times what people in the South pay, and that's if you can get insurance at all. And that is according to the ACCC Northern Australia Insurance Report. That is data. This is especially grim for businesses. Many are forced to self-insure because no insurance companies will give them coverage and no bank will lend. But what happened? Those people who live in the north, work in the north, pay bills in the north, advocated, advocated to this government who has come forward with this $10 billion reinsurance pool. The reinsurance pool is predicted to reduce household premiums, strata title properties and small and medium enterprises. The Townsville Chamber of Commerce has calculated that if just two-thirds of the projected savings were spent in the city annually, there would be approximately $222 million in economic output, a combination of $118 million to gross regional product over $60 million in income and salaries for local workers and approximately 949 additional on time, uh, ongoing full-time jobs created. These numbers do not include reductions in small business premiums, and if they did, they would reflect even greater benefits. And importantly, these mechanisms are, will, uh, the mechanisms are in place to review this legislation within 12 months. And I want to specifically thank consumer advocate Margaret Shaw, uh, Assistant Treasurer Michael Sooker, and as I've said, all of our Northern Queensland MPs. Because without this understanding of the genuine and long-standing conditions in Northern Australia, in Northern Australia, then this legislation would not have come to pass. And as I listen to the senators in this place who are going to talk about tragic, devastating floods in other parts of the country, what about giving us a go in Northern Australia? What about lifting your eyes up and looking at the disadvantage that's been in Northern Australia for over 10 years, rather than reflect on the tragic and terrible circumstances of the most recent floods in South Australia? The Queensland Labor government, the opposition wants to talk about what they're going to do. Well, how about they talk to their mates 
in Queensland, where they have been raping and pillaging $65 million a year as from Senator North Queensland McDonald, alone. Please resume your seat. Uh, uh, Senator McAllister. Point of order. The standing orders really uh, do prohibit reflections on uh, other parliamentarians, and I think the language was unfortunate. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Um, it would assist the chamber if Senator Macdonald, if you could withdraw. Uh, I will certainly uh, withdraw the words raping and pillaging by the Queensland government. Senator Macdonald, you've been here well and truly long enough to know that you can't really retract and restate the words, so I ask you to re retract unconditionally. I, we, I retract the words that I used. Thank you for your assistance to the Senate. Uh, please continue, Senator Macdonald. It is unfortunate that the state Labor government has been raking in $65 million per year in stamp duty that has not been reinvested in resilience in North Queensland. If the opposition, and nay the Greens, were serious about wanting to focus on resilience expenditure in the North, perhaps they could turn their eyes to money that has already been swept out of North Queensland straight into the coffers to be spent who knows where else, but I suspect in southern Queensland. The politicisation of disasters in this country is tragic and unfortunate. We just heard a co um, commentary from Senator McAllister on the, uh, the disaster fund, which Labor voted for when it was introduced to the parliament recently. Uh, but now they want to pretend that they not only. I'm sorry, I can't order, hear myself. Order, think. senators. Senator Macdonald. That not only did they vote for, they continually fail to uh, raise the point that the $50 million that was budgeted to be spent annually has been spent. In fact, the third round has been announced. The third round. And you can't. You cannot deny the reality of $50 million a year of that fund has been spent and the reality that the $150 million balance was only to be spent after the billions of dollars of category C and D funding which goes to the states has been exhausted. Unfortunate that the opposition doesn't understand the legislation and focus on what they voted for and what they could have assisted change. The politicisation of the disaster, where we want to discuss, uh, discuss uh, what happened in Lismore, and I just want to call out the member for Page, Kevin Hogan, the circumstances that, have, that his people have lived through are truly cataclysmic, one of the worst disasters in, this, uh, in living memory because these houses have been completely destroyed, 10,000 people without homes, and yet we want to politicise that, discuss that while the Prime Minister had COVID, he should have magically been able to be in Lismore, but meanwhile the opposition leader had left the state to fly to Western Australia. Uh, it would be good for that reality, reality to be in place. Senators. Order, senators. Senator Ayres, Senator McKenzie, Senator Davy, Senator Davy. This is conduct unbecoming. The matter is of great interest, and it is very important. But Senator Macdonald has the right to be heard in silence. Senator Macdonald, you have the call. Thank you, acting deputy president. So back to the cyclone reinsurance pool which is, of course, relevant for Northern Australia. Relevant for Northern Australia and the people in that part of the country who generate an enormous part of the wealth for this nation. And yet, once again, once again we will see uh, the South not want to give us a go if you'd listen to the opposition. If you'd listen to the Greens, you'd have us completely depopulated and wiped out. Uh, because of their lack of understanding of the circumstances in the North. So before you call for the pool to be rolled out nationally, give Northern Australia an opportunity to rectify the terrible imbalance that has been in place. Since Cyclone Yazi in 2011, insurance has more than trebled for many people. 
for strata title, it's gone from a $25,000 premium for 25 units to at least $100,000 today. This forces body corporate fees to be painfully high and is forcing retirees out of their forever home that they'd bought to retire in. About 20 per cent of Northern Australians are uninsured and more are underinsured. The rest of Australia has not had to deal with this issue and we deserve a chance for this to be rectified first. One Townsville resident was recently quoted $14,000 to insure a $335,000 home despite being with the insurer for more than 20 years. We have had so many insurers and underwriters withdraw from the north that the market is in terrible disarray. So, at, During the Senate inquiry, uh, the Economics Committee, uh, into the Treasury Laws Amendment Cyclone and Flood Damage Reinsurance Pool Bill, uh, we had a terrific opportunity to do a deep dive into the issues in Northern Australia, not Southern Australia, not other places where uh, people live, but in Northern Australia, where the market uh, is truly in disarray. Uh, it was a great opportunity to hear from uh, the people who live uh, and pay these insurance premiums. And I just want to quote Tyrone Shandyman from the Northern Australia Insurance Lobby, whose final words at the end of his testimony was simply, pass the bill. Pass the bill. And so I just want to refer to uh, the opposition's support for this legislation. I want to thank them for their acknowledgement of the issues in Northern Australia, the importance of this legislation, uh, and, and hope that they will stand by those words when it comes to the vote. Because we obviously can't rely on the Greens party to do anything remotely practical to support Northern Australia, to instead try to move amendments that would ensure that this bill would never be passed, that we would never see a rectification of the true injustice of costs, and I guess uh, reflecting on their truly communist background to be trying to socialise uh, the costs of insurance right across this country. So I recommend this bill uh, to the Senate. It is an incredibly important piece of legislation uh, to pass to ensure that homes and communities and businesses continue to survive, continue to survive, uh, because in the north we know how to manage variable climates. We know how to live uh, through great um, uh, seasonal events. We are experts at it, but what we need is a hand. We need a hand with our very small population, our 1.3 million people across all of the top half of the country. We need a hand to support us, to continue reinvesting in the North uh, and to allow us to prosper and subsequently for Australia to prosper. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. I call Senator Ayres. Thanks, uh, Madam <coughs> Acting Deputy President. Well, we know from Senator Macdonald's speech that not only does she want the opposition to support this legislation, which we've indicated ahead of time that we will, she wants the opposition to give the government a pat on the back. Uh, as we debate this piece of legislation in the last possible sitting of parliament, uh, the government's had years to deal with this issue, and in typical Morrison government form, uh, this, this legislation is brought here at two minutes to midnight. As of 8.30 this morning, New South Wales Emergency Services issued six evacuation orders in the Northern Rivers including for the Lismore Central Business District. You might laugh, Senator Macdonald, but the circumstances there are desperate. This is a part of the world that I know well. Uh, it's tight-knit communities, and they are facing up to this crisis again. It's not yet been tallied how much last month's floods cost. What we do know is that people in Lismore could not afford to insure their homes and their businesses before the last flood, let alone before the recent ones, 
uh, and certainly not in the intervening period between these two incidents. The costs will almost certainly spiral in the wake of this difficult summer. Many households and businesses will face a difficult question about whether they can afford to rebuild in such a flood-prone area. It's not limited to the northern rivers. The towns that are rebuilding from the black summer bushfires face a similarly difficult set of issues. It's clear that there will need to be government effort to reduce the cost of insurance in parts of the country that are vulnerable to natural disasters. And of course, the people of North Queensland have been disproportionately hit by the rising cost of disaster insurance. And on that basis, Labor will support this bill. But the measures are clearly insufficient and they are clearly flawed. And they reflect a government that is far too focused on its narrow political priorities at the expense of serious long-term planning. As Labor senators on the Economics Legislation Committee noted, there are limited details on how this reinsurance bill will actually deliver any savings at all to people in North Queensland. The Treasury modelling, which underpins this legislation, hasn't been released, despite calls from not just Labor, from the insurance industry and key stakeholders. As the Royal Automobile Club of Queensland said in their submission, RACQ cannot assess the impact the pool will have on our members' home insurance premiums, primarily because we have not received proposed pricing rates or associated modelling. Any public claims by the Morrison government that it's made to the people of North Queensland, or will undoubtedly make ahead of the coming election, should be treated with the highest degree of scepticism. When the scheme was launched, Minister Sukar, who doesn't have a very good track record of following through on policy commitments, he said it would provide savings of up to 10 per cent. When it made it to the House of Representatives, he claimed savings of 45 to 58 per cent without releasing the modelling. It's just utterly, utterly unreliable. Minister Sukar has made all sorts of claims about this legislation. I suppose much like the bogus housing industry set of propositions that he was engaged in before that promised a lot but delivered very, very little indeed. There are also flaws in the government's decision to limit coverage to 48 hours after the declaration of a cyclone. That means much of the damage from Queensland cyclones in the past few decades wouldn't be covered by this reinsurance, including the majority of the damage caused by Cyclone Debbie in 2017. It's worth noting that the ACCC has argued against the creation of a reinsurance pool. The government ignored three core recommendations from the ACCC, including, their recommendation, including recommendations that would have made a substantial difference to the affordability of insurance. Instead, in the final days, in fact, in, not just in the final days, in the final hours of this squalid parliament, the Morrison government has produced last minute, weak, half baked legislation that is all about announcement in the lead up to an election and has got very little to do with actually delivering for the people of North Queensland. Our insurance system more broadly is buckling under the weight of climate risk. It's clear that the impacts of climate change are what is driving up the cost of insurance premiums, not just in North Queensland but in the northern rivers of New South Wales, on the south coast of New South Wales and the northwest suburbs of Sydney. It's why you can't buy home and contents insurance in Burke. It's why caravan parks on the south coast of New South Wales have struggled to reopen in the wake of the fires. I chaired the Senate inquiry into the 2019-20 bushfires, which included an entire chapter on the effects of the fires on the insurance industry. I heard from communities directly about what impact premium rises were having on an already devastated community. 
as the committee's final report said, that premiums can increase by a magnitude of 300 to 400 per cent following a natural disaster, particularly for commercial enterprises upon which a community may rely, is unsustainable and cannot occur after each natural disaster. The centre of this problem is, of course, a market failure and an utter failure of this Morrison government to grapple with its responsibilities. Someone is going to have to pay for the increasing costs and risks of climate change. Taxpayers, policyholders, shareholders are all going to bear this burden. Currently, those costs are almost exclusively, exclusively being borne by policyholders. But as insurance becomes more unaffordable, more people will be underinsured and uninsured. Government-backed reinsurance pools do have a role to play here. But making the Australian government the insurer of last resort is not a long-term planned sustainable approach to this problem. The restructuring of our system only goes so far, rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. At some point, you actually have to deal with the risk. The, com the committee report found that insurance market failure should be addressed through increased expenditure on mitigation and resilience infrastructure to better address the risks that climate change and natural disasters pose to the community. No amount of empty promises from this government on the price of insurance, as unbelievable as they are, can distract from their failure to invest in mitigation and resilience infrastructure. Uh, they, they have been repeatedly warned from both the opposition and the insurance industry that their investments are insufficient. They actually need to spend the money that they had supposedly allocated to disaster mitigation. As my colleague Senator Watt has repeatedly insisted, the government has barely even touched the $4 billion fund that they established specifically for that purpose, held that promise out to communities and then walked away from those communities. Instead, they have left the Disaster Recovery and Resilience Agency to their most blatantly political appointment yet, former CLP Chief Minister and Liberal Party President Shane Stone. And we saw his performance on these issues in the wake of the Lismore floods. What did Mr Stone do? It's a pretty squalid week, really, for the government. Mr Stone blamed the victims, the victims themselves, the people who live in Lismore. And the Prime Minister wouldn't get out of bed to do his job, uh, had to wait had to wait until he could present himself after his period of quarantine so that he could be there for the press conference to make the announcement. And people waited for days and days and days for this government to do its job. Nothing says more about the priorities of this government than that. Ultimately, though, the only way to reduce this risk over time is by taking meaningful action on climate change. For decades, it has been obvious that we are facing more frequent and more severe natural disasters. Australia is the most vulnerable to climate change. Our regional communities are the most vulnerable in Australia. Globally, here, globally, the insurance industry and here in Australia, Insurance companies have produced extensive research and commentary on this issue. They have played a constructive role as a global stakeholder on these questions. The IAG and the US National Centre for Atmospheric Research produced a paper, Severe Weather and a Changing Climate, as an example of the work. Its conclusions are clear and the impacts are diabolical for Australians, particularly Australians in the regions. Anyone who has read the report would be deeply saddened and disturbed by the scale of the floods in northern New South Wales and south east Queensland, but they would not be surprised. The industry has been right to have been urging governments to spend more money on natural disaster mitigation and resilience infrastructure. They have been in the media recently crowing about the success of their lobbying in this regard. 
But let's face it, the biggest, the most effective climate change mitigation measures are available to us are getting our own climate and energy policies right. But instead we've been engaged in squalid, squalid climate wars and identity politics on the government side about this issue. It is a little curious about why the insurance industry in Australia has been so quiet publicly on this question. They have a very strong interest in limiting the rate and magnitude of these kinds of disasters and in public policy responses to do that. The industry should be right out there demanding rapid and deep action on these questions. So why haven't they been doing it? In the aftermath of the Black Summer bushfires, a senior executive of one of Australia's biggest general insurers, who I won't name, was asked why. She answered, quite frankly, that the insurers would be out demanding stronger action from government on climate and energy policy, but it had been made clear to them by senior members of the Morrison government that any such demands by the industry would be met by regulatory retaliation by the government itself. They got the message from the Morrison government. Don't speak up. Don't speak up, otherwise we'll clean you up. It's disturbing on many levels. Disturbing because there's still very little prospect of insurance consumers seeing anything other than escalating premiums for increasingly scarce insurance, including in North Queensland. It's disturbing because the, gov the Morrison government wields the power of government to bully its opponents and to bully industry into acting against the interests of its shareholders and customers. And it's disturbing because an industry run by very fine people who know what they're doing shouldn't be stood over uh, by this government. So while there's some bipartisanship in this place about the need to pass this piece of legislation through this parliament, as half-baked as it is, as imperfect as it is, as last minute as it is, as token as it is, as it is as much about an announcement and allowing Mr Morrison and Mr Stone and no doubt Senator McKenzie and others to pose in front of a uh, rainwater tank in the back of some property in North Queensland and crow about the supposed benefits that they're going to deliver for North Queensland. It is an empty promise, an empty promise with no modelling, no publicly released modelling to support it. Uh, and what really, what really Australia needs, what really people in the regions needs, is a government that's actually got a plan. It's actually got a plan to deal with the issues of adaptation and mitigation, the infrastructure that needs to be built, the proposals that need to be discussed with, with communities to deal with one of the gravest threats that regional Australia faces. Thank you, Senator Ayres, and I call Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to make a contribution to the Treasury Laws Amendment, Cyclone and Flood Damage Reinsurance Pool Bill 2022, and I want to associate myself with the comments made by my colleague, Senator McKim. As I speak, I know that communities in many parts of Lismore and New South Wales have been ordered to evacuate again as heavy rains continue to batter the north coast in my home state. Residents in Lismore and surrounds, North Lismore, South Lismore, low-lying parts of Kyogle, um, as well as Tumblegum and other low-lying areas were given until 10 p.m. last night to leave their homes. And my heart goes out to people who have had to leave their homes yet again, faced by yet more life-threatening flooding. Weary residents in parts of flood-ravaged Queensland are also on high alert again. So many of these people have already faced severe floods. They've lost their homes, they lost their lifelong belongings, and much more to these floods. And here they are, faced with even more catastrophic weather with dangerous and life-threatening flash floods lapping at their doorsteps yet again. The floods in New South Wales and Queensland remind us 
that this is the everyday reality of climate change. This is what we have been warned about over and over for decades now, for decades, not a day or two, not a week or two, not a year or two, decades upon decades. The climate crisis is here and now. And it is not just on people's doorsteps. It is in their homes and it is impacting every aspect of their lives. The damage and suffering caused by these floods um, reminds us of the continued and deliberate inaction of the Liberal National Government to address climate change. They have, in fact, fueled climate change by subsidizing fossil fuels and by approving coal mine after coal mine. It's not as if we didn't know, as I said earlier, about these impending disasters and the devastation these would cause. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's report, which said climate change is widespread, rapid and intensifying, and some trends are now irreversible, sounded a code red for humanity, but was completely disregarded by this government. The same report warned us that extreme weather events caused by climate change will increase in both intensity and frequency. And here we are, a dire warning, a one that, was, that is being played out in my home state in New South Wales and in Queensland right now. They have witnessed what a climate emergency looks like firsthand, and they are devastated. Yet the Morrison government has ignored all warnings, yet they have failed to tackle the climate crisis. Yet they keep talking about var variable climate. We heard this morning from, the, uh, from a government senator, as if it has nothing to do with their actions. They are obviously being willfully ignorant because they don't want to act on coal and gas, lest they offend their pals and donors, the fossil fuel billionaires. Much has been said about the scale of these floods. They are massive. People who have lived through other floods in that area talk about never having seen anything like this, where houses were fully submerged underwater. And they are right. As my friend Lismore resident and soon to be member of the Upper House of New South Wales, Sue Higginson wrote in The Guardian, this is more than a flood. This is a catastrophe. She goes on to say, we need to look towards the future and decide what kind of future we want. Climate change has happened. It is going to get worse. The decision is how much worse do we want this to get? Strong action on climate change is not simply a flood plan or a fire plan. It means no new coal and gas, decarbonizing our economy, making our planning system climate-centered and keeping people safe. And that's why support for the Greens in that area particularly is growing. Our Greens MP for Ballina, Tamara Smith, has stood and supported the community, as has our federal candidate for Richmond, Mandy Nolan. They haven't been shy of calling it out as it is, a climate catastrophe, a climate emergency. And they are with the people who are suffering the most. And in addition to their failure to address climate change, the government is picking and choosing now who gets covered under the reinsurance plan proposed by this bill. The bill would require the public to maintain a $10 billion fund to underwrite the contingent liability associated with nationalizing reinsurance for cyclone and related flood damage. But that's where it ends. The bill does not include other climate disasters. We know that severe weather events caused by climate change are making insurance costs skyrocket in many parts of the country. Yet this bill, as currently drafted, will not cover insurance for the people of New South Wales and Queensland who have just experienced and continue to experience devastating floods. There is no doubt that the damage caused by cyclones should be covered. Of course it should be. But there is no reason that flooding for other reasons shouldn't be covered. Despite the indisputable truth of climate change-induced disasters, the government has not mentioned climate change when introducing this bill. The term is used in the explanatory memorandum, but only when quoting references. And we know why that is the case. The Liberal National Parties are still full of climate-denying criminals. Their seats in Parliament are funded by dollars 
of fossil fuel companies. And so they have their heads buried in the sand deliberately. The government is utterly failing to acknowledge the universal nature of the threat posed by the climate emergency by proposing in this bill to nationalize reinsurance for only a particular class of what have traditionally been called natural perils. But that are now very clearly anthropocentric climate disasters caused by the actions of humans, caused by the actions of the Liberal National Government. And to do this the way the bill is drafted is both inequitable and short-sighted. The climate emergency is pushing up the cost of insurance all over the country. If a government's reinsurance pool is to be established, then all Australians should be afforded the benefit. The bill is so limited in its scope, and my colleague Senator Nick McKim has circulated several very sensible amendments to address this problem and cover people who have experienced damage caused by flooding. The government's reinsurance scheme proposed by this bill should cover all climate disasters and people affected by them right across the country. The Greens want a statutory review to consider fully nationalizing re reinsurance for all climate disaster related property damage. Fully nationalizing reinsurance would directly expose the government to the cost of underinvestment in public works that are required to mitigate the impact of climate disasters because they are here and now. We are exposed to these risks one way or another anyway. They should at the very least be transparent. This would hopefully create a direct incentive for the government to invest in climate adaptation works all across the country as well as better data collection, better land use planning in coordination with state and local governments. The Greens have another excellent amendment that the money required to establish and maintain the $10 billion reinsurance pool be backed by taxation on entities extracting and combusting fossil fuels. The logic here is pretty simple and straightforward. The burning of fossil fuels is what has created the climate emergency. So those who profit from the burning of fossil fuels should be made to pay for the cost of the climate emergency. Finally, I want to speak about this government's response to climate disasters, and particularly the one that is unfolding still in northern New South Wales. People in flood-stricken areas like northern New South Wales had to wait and wait and wait for the federal government to respond. For any help to arrive, they were desperate to save what they could and who they could. Local people had to take on the extreme risk of trying to save their neighbors from severe flooding. And I'm so proud of that community because every time a disaster happens, they work with each other, they put their lives at risk to help others. You know, community members stepped in and stepped up for each other when the government was nowhere to be seen. The that's not my job, Prime Minister Scott Morrison declared the floods in New South Wales and Queensland a national emergency a full nine days after Lismore was submerged, and the local anger was palpable. I was hoping that this would be a wake-up call to Mr. Morrison, but his arrogance and the arrogance of the Liberal National Government knows no bounds. Even the support payments announced initially were carved out by local government areas and refused to cover all the flood-ravaged parts of northern New South Wales and refused to include many people who were fit, uh, hit by the floods. As if floods just recede at LGA boundaries and decide to not hit the homes of migrants, international students, or seasonal workers who were also left out of the support. What a shame. How disgraceful. The government that remembers to pinch pennies when helping people who have been hit by severe flooding but will continue to subsidize fossil fuel corporations to the tune of billions of dollars is not a government that anyone wants. This dismal lack of support and preparedness on what climate disasters will look like, what climate emergencies will look like, is actually rooted in the climate denialism inherent to the coal-loving liberals and nationals. There is no climate mitigation, adaptation, and resilience plan. 
and sadly, we do not expect one from this government either. The community is tired, really tired, of this fossil fuel loving government. This is why we have to turf them out at the election, which isn't very far, and I, for one, can't wait to do that. And the Greens and balance of power will push the next government to move further and faster to tackle the climate crisis, to end coal and gas, to do more on mitigation and resilience, and to protect people and the planet. Thank you, Senator Faruqi, and I call Senator Bragg. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to make some brief remarks on this bill. Before I do so, I'm not sure whether um, Senator Faruqi did uh, refer to the Liberal Nationals as criminals. I'm not sure whether that was what was said, but if it was, I'd just make the point that I understand that people have different sort of opinions, and I think it's a clearinghouse of ideas, but I don't know that calling people criminals is the um, appropriate approach. Senator, Senator Bragg, are, are you, it would have been helpful if you thought that if you took a point of order at well, the time. Well, I wasn't sure whether or not that's but, what was but said. But if you would like, I will refer it to the President to review at a later point of time. I was treating it simply as a statement at the beginning of your speech, but if you have— yeah, Can you get it to be checked, please? As, as a point of order, yes. yes okay, I will proceed yep. in that way, and now I call you to make your contribution to the debate on the Treasury Laws Amendment, Cyclone okay. and Flood Damage Reinsurance Bill. Thank you, Senator Thanks a Rack. Lot. Well, look, I, I just made the point that the, in terms of uh, obtaining insurance, which is an important product uh, in every community, and it is a product which is heavily regulated, but it is a product which is provided by the market, uh, we want to see all Australians be able to access that. And when there is a, a regulatory failure or market failure, there is a case for regulatory intervention. And it's been asserted that this would lower the cost of insurance in this part of the world, uh, and that is a laudable objective. But it is a significant intervention in the market, and we ought to be very careful in making interventions in the market. And um, I would be concerned if the scope of this scheme was to be expanded in any way. The way that the le legislation works is that uh, once the bomb declares that there's been a cyclone, then the scheme can be triggered. Now, um, uh, given the issue we're now facing with climate change, it is possible that because of climate change that the scope could expand, uh, and I think that gives us two implications to consider. The first, uh, we should be working as hard as we can with other countries uh, to reduce the impact of climate change uh, throughout the world. But secondly, uh, we need to get moving on the mitigation issues, um, the planning, the building codes, the council uh, issues, because uh, this should be a temporary solution. It should be a, a fix for a point in time where the mitigation approaches are not strong enough. Now, we want to have resilient buildings. We want to have buildings that are insurable by the market. We don't want to have a government insurance company. Now, this is an intervention that is required now, and I accept that. And as I explained in my additional comments in the Senate report. Um, I accept that it is a desirable uh, measure to have right now, but we want to see it uh, there whilst it's needed. So we need to get moving on the mitigation. We need to maintain our commitment to climate change. It is good that we've agreed with other countries to sign up to net zero by 2050, and there have been past governments that haven't agreed to all the international protocols, but this government has agreed at the Glasgow conference to commit Australia to net zero, which I think is an important economic measure. Finally, it is an important precedent here, and I don't want to see it expanded beyond its current bounds. And I do think that the review that is to be conducted within 12 months and then every three years after gives us cause to ensure that this scheme is only there whilst it is needed. Now, it is needed in the short term so that people in northern Australia can get access to insurance. and I accept that, uh, but we don't want to set precedents where the government ends up running insurance companies or other things that the market should, should run. That is not saying that we should let the market rip. It is saying that there should be regulation where it's needed, where there is genuine market failure. And so I look forward to us maintaining our commitment to climate change uh, adaptation, but also uh, adaptation on the ground in terms of mitigation uh, against these sort of floods. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Senator Bragg. I call Senator Watt. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, and I'd like to make a contribution on what is a really important piece of legislation for particularly people in North Queensland who have suffered under astronomical insurance premiums over recent years and have been waiting very patiently for nearly 10 years for this government to do anything about it. Uh, before I get into the substance of the bill, though, I do want to just pick up on uh, some of the comments Senator Bragg just made. Uh, and I was concerned to hear what he said, uh, and I'd invite the minister to address this when she wraps up. Uh, what I think I heard Senator Bragg said was that the reinsurance pool should not be a permanent feature of the insurance system uh, for North Queenslanders. And I'm wondering whether Senator Bragg is suggesting that at some future point the government would remove the reinsurance pool. Um, that is certainly not what people in North Queensland have been told by this government. Um, they have been assured by this government that this reinsurance pool will be around for a long time to come and will save them money. So to now hear a Liberal senator question whether this is something that should remain in place, I think is would be quite worrying to people in North Queensland and certainly goes against what several ministers of this government have spent months telling people in North Queensland. So as I say, I invite the minister in her summing up to uh, comment on what Senator Bragg has said and whether, in fact, this is just an election manoeuvre from the government and is something that they would withdraw uh, at a future date if they were to be re-elected. Um, turning to uh, the bill itself and what it seeks to do. Um, as I say, I do not need to be persuaded one little bit that insurance premiums and insurance availability is a genuine problem for people, particularly in North Queensland. Uh, it is increasingly a problem in other parts of the country as well, as we face more frequent and more intense natural disasters, which as much as this government might not want to admit it, is a direct consequence of climate change. And we know, uh, from if, if we're just prepared to listen to any reputable scientist, they tell us that climate change will be driving more frequent and more intense natural disasters in the future. Um, so the fact that many people across the country, particularly in North Queensland, cannot afford insurance uh, currently or cannot obtain insurance currently is extremely worrying when we think about what we're likely to see in terms of more natural disasters in the future. I don't have the figures before me about the premium rises, but um, I know from having spoken to homeowners and businesses, uh, community organisations and others across North Queensland uh, that it is becoming increasingly difficult to even get insurance um, as a result of the heightened risk of cyclones, floods and other natural disasters. Uh, and for those people who are fortunate enough to be able to obtain insurance, uh, the sums of money that they have to pay are frankly beyond most working families' budgets, uh, and they're getting worse, with, pre with premiums increasing uh, exponentially year after year. And as I say, this is something that the government has been promising to fix for at least 10 years. Warren Inch, the member for Leichhardt, has been in this parliament for the best part of 25 years. And for the best part of 25 years, he's been promising people in his electorate to do something about insurance premiums. And all the time that he's been here, all that's happened is that the insurance situation in North Queensland has got worse. So he has not delivered in his nearly 25 years in parliament on his promises to do something about insurance premiums and availability. And the same goes for the member for Herbert, Phil Thompson, for the member for Dawson, George Christensen, uh, for senators from North Queensland who have spent so much time promising to do something about insurance premiums and availability in North Queensland and have done so little. Uh, and so now, on the eve of an election, literally in the last couple of sitting days before an election, all of a sudden 
They rush some legislation into parliament uh, to establish a reinsurance pool and go around promising, making more promises to North Queenslanders that this is going to be the fix. Now, as I say, Labor is going to be supporting this bill. Um, we absolutely recognise the problem that people in North Queensland are experiencing when it comes to insurance. And we support anything this government is prepared to do to do something about it. We're pleased that finally the government is doing something which might offer some relief. And as I say, it's just disappointing that it's taken nearly 10 years and an election, an imminent election, before we've seen any action from this government. Um, the government has had ample opportunity to do something about this. Uh, we have had inquiry after inquiry throughout this government's life which have pointed to the problems in the insurance market in North Queensland and have put forward recommendations, but nothing has been done. Uh, most recently, we saw another ACCC inquiry into the matter, which made dozens of recommendations about what, what could be done to improve insurance availability and price for North Queenslanders. And you'll be shocked to know, Madam Acting Deputy President, that this report is still sitting on the shelf, along with every other one that this government has commissioned, um, not acting on those recommendations. And it goes beyond taking legislative or other steps in relation to insurance. Um, that this government's failure to deal with this problem is truly evident. Um, it also goes to the matter of disaster mitigation. Now, if you talk to any of the insurers who cover the North Queensland market or those who have been chased out of the market because it's just not viable for them to insure people, if you talk to any local governments in North Queensland, if you talk to businesses in North Queensland, if you talk to homeowners in North Queensland, if you just bother to speak to anyone in North Queensland, what they tell you, as they have told me, is that the best thing this government can do to reduce the risk of damage to homes and businesses from natural disasters is to invest in disaster mitigation. And the reason that matters is that if you can bring down the risk of damage to homes, businesses and other things by investing in disaster mitigation, that reduces the risk for insurers, that reduces the premiums. And there are examples all across Queensland already that we can point to where investment in disaster mitigation has brought down premiums. I know Senator Chisholm has spent some time around Roma uh, inspecting the flood levy there. I think he was there with uh, the member for Kingsford Smith, Matt Thistlethwaite, a, a little while back, looking at the flood levy there. And again, I, I can't remember the figures. Senator Chisholm might have them, but the fact that a flood levy was built in Roma has significantly reduced insurance premiums for people in that area, which tended to be uh, to get floods on a regular basis. So investment in disaster mitigation works. It saves people's lives, it saves their properties, it saves taxpayers the billions of dollars in repair costs after natural disasters, and it can actually put some controls around spiralling insurance premiums. And yet, despite all of that, despite report after report, stakeholder after stakeholder, insurer after insurer, local government after local government, saying that we need this government to invest in mitigation, instead what we've seen from this government is the world's biggest piggy bank, otherwise known as the Emergency Response Fund, a fund that was set up by this government three years ago with, at the time, about $4 billion in it. And as is often said by the government, yes, Labor did vote with the government for that legislation. We did vote to create the Emergency Response Fund because we thought it was a good idea for the government to put money aside to invest in disaster mitigation and also to have at hand for disaster recovery. But as I think all of Australia has now learnt after the tragic floods in northern New South Wales, the Emergency Response Fund has now been going for three disaster seasons. This government has still not spent a cent on disaster recovery from that fund. They haven't even started building a single disaster mitigation project from that fund, let alone completed one. But the one thing they have done with that fund is earn themselves a tidy $830 million in interest. So that fund was established to assist Australians with disaster recovery and disaster mitigation. It could have been used to build the flood levies 
the drainage improvements, the bushfire evacuation centres, the fire breaks, the telecommunications improvements, all the kinds of things that we know keep people safe in a disaster and actually can make a practical difference to insurance premiums. It could have been used for those purposes, but instead it's just sat there earning interest for the government, making their own bottom line look better. So whether it be the ACCC report, the numerous other inquiries that have recommended changes to insurance to look after North Queenslanders or investing in disaster mitigation, this government has failed over and over again. They make promises, led by Mr Ench, the member for Leichhardt, but the others are just the same, promises after promises after promises to do something about insurance. But when it comes to action, it's failure after failure after failure. And so now here we are, but the last two sitting days before an election, when the government finally decides to do something. Well, let's hope it works. Let's hope that this reinsurance pool works. And that's why Labor is backing it, because we want to give it a chance to work. Because we're just so happy to see the government do anything at all which might make a difference to, to insurance premiums in North Queensland. But I have to say that this government's track record makes us very sceptical about what difference this will actually make in practice. And that scepticism is only heightened when we see the way the government has behaved around the claims it's been making uh, about the savings that people will generate from this reinsurance pool. Several weeks ago, the government uh, put out a press release claiming that it now had modelling that showed uh, that, it, that the reinsurance pool will deliver massive savings uh, to people in North Queensland. Uh, and you know, that was what got reported in the media. But if you actually went and had a look at the press release that the minister put out at the time, and this is a few weeks ago, it, it always pays to look at the fine print when it comes to the Morrison government. Because what the press release said was that it was only homeowners in Northern Australia with the most acute cost pressures who would be expected to benefit from up to 46 per cent premium discounts. And we asked about this at estimates, and I know Senator Chisholm asked about this at the Senate inquiry into this bill as well, to try to establish who are we talking about when we say it's only people with the most acute cost pressures. Is that five people in Northern Australia who might benefit from this? Is it 500? Is it 5,000? Because you're out there making these claims that this is going to save people a lot of money, but how many people are we actually talking about? But we couldn't get answers from the government about that, and I can flag to the minister we'll be asking those questions again in this debate. Um, when we asked about this at estimates, we asked, can we see this modelling, this magic modelling that, that tells us that people are going to be saving up to 46 per cent? Uh, and Minister Hume, who was there at the table, said, no, can't release you the modelling because it's not in the public interest. How arrogant, how arrogant of this government to go out there to North Queenslanders and say, hey, 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 we're going to save you all this money from this reinsurance pool, even though we've done nothing for 10 years, but vote for us again and you'll get some savings, but we won't show you how much, and we won't show you any of the proof that we've got that backs up our claims. And you know what was worst is that Minister Hume said it was not in the public interest for North Queenslanders to see that modelling. How arrogant. North Queenslanders apparently can't be trusted by this government to see the modelling the government claims it has that backs up its claims about how much people will save. Um, so I'd still like to know from this government how much will the average homeowner in North Queensland save from this reinsurance pool? How many people will actually save 46 per cent? Or is this just more misleading tripe from a government that has spent 10 years doing absolutely nothing to fix the insurance crisis in North Queensland? Um, I don't know if this is the appropriate time, but I have moved a second reading amendment as well, which seeks to obtain that modelling. So I'd like to move that. that. I might as I move might that as, at the moment. Yes, yeah, I, might yes. as, if I seek leave to move that amendment if that's the appropriate process. So I think you're in a position, Sorry, I think you're in a position, um, Senator Watt, when you can foreshadow that you will be moving a second reading amendment. Thank you for your assistance, Madam Acting Deputy President. I foreshadow that I will be moving that second reading amendment, seeking that modelling. Um, and there are numerous other issues. Just in the very little time I've got left, I do want to address the Greens Amendment, uh, which seeks to extend this reinsurance pool to flooding in other regions. There, we, we think this is an idea that is worth considering, but for the Greens to drop this 
on the eve of this debate with no information about what it will cost taxpayers, what, imp what impact it will have on premiums. Uh, we think this is something that should be considered as part of the review into this legislation going forward. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Senator Watt. I call Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, and I, it is uh, my pleasure to follow on from Senator Watt, who raised uh, significant issues with this legislation. And, and Senator also Chisholm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, um, but there is a hard marker in, in the program at the day. So at 1.30, uh, I interrupt debate uh, to take us to two-minute statements, and I call Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Today I rise to wish Zanita Mascarenas all the best for the upcoming federal election in the federal seat of Swan. Zanita will be a key part of bringing an Anthony Albanese Labor government to power in this nation. But we are taking nothing for granted, turning over um, talking to voters in the uh, federal electorate of Swan. Zanita is an engineer and has worked on mine sites right around Western Australia for 10 years. She's also a young, uh, she's a, a mum of two young children and she cares very much about both our natural environment and conservation and the jobs of today and tomorrow. Zanita has been inspired to run uh, and at this election and to join the Great Australian Labor Party based on uh, the really important experiences of her family. Her family, uh, her parents lived in Kenya and they sought to migrate to Australia, uh, but it was during the white Australia policy. Her father is a metal worker, a trade very much needed in Australia at that time and indeed needed now, today. They applied to come to Australia and were told, yes, you've got the right skills, but you're the wrong skin colour. So when Gough Whitlam came to power, abolishing that policy, Zanita's parents were able to come to Australia and start their new lives. That is why Zanita is running. She's running because she wants people to be able to afford the freedom and fairness that her parents saw when she when they first migrated Thank to you, Western Pratt. Australia. Thank you, Senator Your time has expired. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy Chair. And I rise as the Chair of the Parliamentary Friends of Ukraine, and I acknowledge you as the, the Deputy Chair, Madam Speaker, Madam President. Russia's actions in Ukraine are illegal and criminal and must be stopped. The sanctions are working, and I'm proud of the sanctions that this government have put on Russian oligarchs and leadership. As was announced by the generals on the weekend, they're losing the war. I pay homage, and I'm so proud of the heroes of the Ukraine that are standing up for their country, that are fighting for their country, that are pushing back the Russians. But we all need to do more. There is 6.3 million uh, displaced Ukrainians. The international world needs to reflect back on its commitment to the responsibility to protect. These are war crimes. These are the sorts of crimes that the international community adopted when they took on R2P to stand up for. We need to stand up to those who threaten the rules-based order because we see other autocratic countries, both in our region and in other parts of the world, are watching what the world does with Putin in Russia. We cannot stand by and let this madman take over Ukraine or any part of it. If a settlement needs to be done, if, it, if there is a negotiated settlement, it should be done on terms that are agreeable to the Ukrainians, not just the rest of the world. I stand with Ukraine. I call on this parliament to stand with Ukraine. Slava Ukraini. Thank you, Senator Van, and thank you for your comments um, associating me with you. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. 
The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the UNDRIP, was adopted by the UN General Assembly on 13 September 2007. 144 countries voted in favour of the UNDRIP. If you want to know what shame looks like, you need to know that Australia was one of the four countries that voted against the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. Not long after the UNDRIP was adopted, Senator Payne stood in this chamber to say that something as important as the UNDRIP should not be rushed. That was in 2007. It's now 2022, and we're still waiting. Later today, I will be seeking leave to introduce a bill to end that waiting, because no one here has prioritised Indigenous rights, so I will. I'm asking for the support of the Senate today to make sure that my bill can be introduced and hopefully passed. That will incorporate the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People into law, into policy and into practice. My bill would require the government to give us a fully funded national action plan to implement UNDRIP and to audit existing laws and policies so they are compliant with UNDRIP. So let's get it done. What are we waiting for? Uh, we're talking, what, 15 years ago that uh, uh, our colleague here in the Senate raised this as something that was important. So if the government has failed us, I can guarantee you now the Australian Greens won't. Senator Brown. Um, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. In my two minutes here uh, today, I'd like to highlight the incompetence of this government, the millions of dollars wasted. They throw money at millions of dollars at lawyers, they throw millions of dollars at consultants, they throw millions of dollars at outsourcing, and their in continued incompetence had led to cost blowouts in projects in Tasmania. The cost of these blowouts on projects the Prime Minister promised back in 2019 has almost reached a staggering $250 million. $250 million. Acting Deputy President, ripping money away from health, from housing, and our st state's most vulnerable. That's what this in the incompetence of this government has led to. And so, when asked why are we having these cost blowouts on projects that have not even started, even though d um, many were promised in 2019, the Liberal member for Bass says the planning and construction sits with the state government. They blame the state Liberal government. The Liberal member for Braddon says the same thing. The federal government does not deliver projects. Well, you know, these are the words that could have come straight from the Prime Minister himself. Whenever Mr Morrison is called out on his failure, his response is the same. It is not my job. No matter how much Liberal candidates try to distance themselves from Mr Morrison, a vote for a Liberal member for Bass or the vote for a, the Liberal member for Bradham is a vote for Mr Morrison and his wasteful ways. $250 million wasted, money that could have gone to the Tasmanian health system, the housing system and, as I've already said, our state's most vulnerable, particularly those you, seeking Senator emergency. Brown. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. How do, you, every, how do everyday Australians know there's an election in the air? Well, it's simple. The leaders of the opposition and the government polish their public images. When John Howard gave himself a superficial makeover in 1998, a young Anthony Albanese called out the Prime Minister as indulging in, quote, same stuff, different bucket. Mr Albanese needs to listen to his own advice. It's not the bucket that matters, it's the contents. Mr Albanese is now bearing a bucket filled with nothing but empty buzzwords, devoid of substance, leadership and most certainly devoid of independence. Anthony Albanese will tow the globalist line and deliver Australia to China and to international capital. The billions, billionaires that run the world, as I say. This is a Labor Party that sided with the Liberals against One Nation's attempts to protect bank deposits from being stolen by the banks in a bail-in. 
Labor had to be shamed by One Nation and their own ethnic labor branches into opposing the cash ban bill. Labor will not support compensation for the historical victims of criminal banking fraud. This is not a Labor Party. It's a party of the World Economic Forum and their life by subscription model. Only two weeks ago, at the Australian Banking Association conference, ALP Shadow Treasurer Jim Chalmers spoke in support of a central bank digital currency where cash, crypto, gold and silver will be replaced by a programmable electronic currency. Programmable means the currency expires if you don't spend it, and the government gets to tell you what your money can be spent on. Central bank digital currencies are designed to prevent savings that provide everyday Australians with independence through financial security. Make us dependent. Digital currencies will most certainly expire on the death of the holder. Another form of death tax. There we go again from Labor. This is the world offered by the Labor Party. Complete control by unelectable, unaccountable foreign powers. Anthony Albanese Senator will Robert not protect your time Australians. Has expired. He will... Senator O'Sullivan. Madam Acting Deputy President, today I rise to speak about two foundations that are operating in Perth. The Motivation Foundation is an education and training organisation that trains young people in civil and infrastructure construction, offering various certificates. But they also seek to improve the employability of their students, addressing life skills and acting as if they are their employer. And one of the largest barriers to engagement in life is a lack of a driver's licence. And over 70 per cent of the wider population has a licence. This number drastically falls when you look to our lower socioeconomic communities. The McGovern Foundation is seeking to improve these figures by offering driving supervisors and vehicles. But the beauty of their model is that while they're undertaking the driver training, they're also mentoring and bonding with their students. The, Mot the Motivation and McGovern Foundations are working together and are getting extraordinarily uh, amazing results. And I thank them very much for the work that they do and for hosting me at their facilities a few weeks ago. Despite much good work being done to help disadvantaged Australians to access services such as driver's licences, the gap still remains. And I feel that the answer may lie in technology. I'm currently teaching my daughter how to drive, and while my hair is getting greyer and fewer, uh, these scenarios requiring evasive action are rare. And if we could allow students to accumulate some of the hours that they're required to do in a driving simulator, then we could virtually create those scenarios while giving kids that otherwise don't have access to a driver's license, or to a driver's license vehicle or uh, uh, even someone to instruct them that has a driver's license, then we could maybe address that issue. If we can teach pilots and train drivers and dump truck operators in a simulator, then why can't we teach someone in a car? Almost every job requires a driver's licence to either perform the task or even just to get to the job. This is a major barrier that needs to be addressed, and it's one that Senator I hope that we Sullivan, can do. your time has expired. Senator Griff. Oh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Newborn blood spot screening, known as the heel prick test, has been a vital tool to protect the health of newborn Australians since the 1960s. Screening was first used for phenylketonuria, a condition with no clinical signs at birth. Time is of the essence. With early identification, the condition can be easily treated. Without it, a child may suffer from severe intellectual disabilities. The advantages of the heel prick test were clear. Over the last 50 years, it became possible to identify more than 60 different conditions with just the one test. Many are conditions without clinical signs. Screening enables early intervention and better health outcomes for both babies and children. So you might assume the test is routinely used for Australian newborns to rule out all of those conditions. You might assume it, but it is wrong. A typical Australian family is lucky to get screening for even 25 conditions, and the actual number depends simply on where the baby is born. This is totally unacceptable, particularly since expanding the test to 50 conditions is estimated to cost just $10 per baby. Just $10. $10 to screen for conditions which might have devastating lifelong consequences. Last year, a committee recommended screening be standardised across the country and expanded to include more conditions. But incredibly, the government has not even responded to that report. 
It has certainly not implemented the recommendation. I call on the government to act to show some leadership. This is a vital, vital cheap reform that will make a huge difference to the health of Australian babies. Do it today. Thanks, Senator Griff. Senator Ayres. <coughs> Thanks, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. <coughs> we have seen reports over the last week that the government of the Solomon Islands intends to sign a security agreement with the People's Republic of China that could foreshadow a permanent Chinese military and naval presence just 2,000 kilometres off the Queensland coast. The proposed arrangement undermines our national interest and it undermines regional security. It's yet another indication of China's regional ambitions and the lengths that Beijing will go to prosecute them. We've seen China militarise in the South China Sea, flagrantly violating the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. We've seen China expanding its global footprint, including establishing its first overseas military base in East Africa and a rumoured new base on the west coast of Africa. The Morrison government has been keen to amplify and clumsily weaponise these issues in a craven effort to seek political uh, domestic support. They are full of cheap, nasty and empty slogans, but they have failed to take a methodical and structured pro uh, approach to protecting our national security. Work shy blowhards, all of them, all talk, no action. There have been clear warnings. The Morrison government was even warned about a defence pact last year by an opposition politician from the Solomons. But besides crafting crude insults for question time, this Prime Minister hasn't lifted a finger. Willful blindness to the issues facing us in the Pacific, undermined the Pacific Worker Scheme by supporting exploitation, so-called Pacific step up, but we've cut Australian aid to the Solomon Islands by 21 per cent. Uh, they've been met by a Prime Minister who thumbs his nose at legitimate demands for regional solidarity and a defence minister who jokes about water lapping at their doors. No wonder. Senator Ayres, your time has expired. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam Ad Acting Deputy President. It's nice to see you here. There's a lot to love about the Bass Strait. Us Tasmanians don't mind having a moat around us to keep the rest of you mainlanders at bay. There's one thing we don't love about it, though. How much it costs to send our products to other states. No one else has to chuck their products on a boat to sell them across Australia, but we do, and the cost is breaking us. Between port fees, the cost of labour, the warehousing, we're paying more, way more to sell our stuff to the rest of the country than you mainlanders. Tasmanian businesses who make things in Tasmania are being taxed for choosing to make things in our state, and that is so unfair. Our Tassie beer maker reckons they pay four bucks extra to ship a carton of beer made in our state compared to if they had made it in Melbourne or Sydney, and that is disgraceful. The federal government's me meant to make sure the Bass Strait doesn't put Tasmanian businesses at a disadvantage. That's why we have the Tasmanian Freight Equalisation Scheme. The problem is that the government hasn't kept up with the shipping costs. You are miles behind. You've let it go wayside. And Tasmanian businesses are now paying 45 per cent more than they did 10 years ago on their products to go across the water. The difference means the government's paying them tens of millions of dollars less than it should be. They're ripping Tasmanians off. They've left it to Tassie businesses to cover the gap, and they're going down the gurgler. Everyone says we should be supporting Tasmanian manufacturing. Well, from the Liberals just talk, talk, talk. In truth, we're making it harder to set up shop and stay in our own state. That's why I've fought so hard to get an extra $200 million for the Tasmanian Fraud Equalisation Scheme. Now we need to go further. Tasmanian farmers and manufacturers should not be sent into a fight with one hand behind their backs. If the Liberal and Labor politicians really gave a stuff about Tasmanian jobs, they'd get on board with this, and you need to. It's not an option, because Tasmanian businesses deserve to be on equal footing with every other business around Australia. They don't deserve to be left behind. Put them in a fair fight for customers, because I tell you, I can believe you they'll win. Senator Lambie, your time has expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I'm disappointed Senator Griff has, lost, uh, has left the chamber. As many of you remember my maiden speech, perhaps more memorable because most of it wasn't with me, uh, but I did to talk about autism and my son and what I wanted to achieve in this place. And part of that was an inquiry into autism, and it was with the support of Senator Griff that we were able to establish the first ever whole-of-life inquiry 
for autistic people and their families and those that work around them. I would like to acknowledge though Senator Lambie, who has also been a fantastic supporter of this inquiry and always supported me with the work that it did, and Senator Brown, who stepped up uh, as my deputy chair when Senator Griff stood down from the inquiry. We tabled the report last week, 25th of March, and I have to say it really is a very, very proud moment for me that a 400-page report with 81 recommendations, of which the key one is the formation of a national autism strategy. People are going to ask why we're not just including it as part of the disability strategy. We now know that it's just not working for the autistic community. We have a 10 times higher suicide rate than the general population. Our unemployment rate for those with autism is significantly higher than the general disability community. There are so many things we need to do better. I just did a webinar with the Australian Autism Alliance and I would like to thank them for hosting and for the 500 people that joined to have a Q&A session with Senator Brown and myself. This is something that we will continue to work towards into the future. The inquiry and the report is one thing, but the real work is about to start. So I'm very excited. I hope that all of you have the opportunity at some stage to even just flick through our recommendations. There are 81 of them. Um, and it is important that all of us get behind this community and support them in whatever way that we can going forward into the future. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy, Deputy President. The government have their, gov uh, their budget to present. Uh, to judge by the calculated leaks to various media organisations, it will include more efforts to buy votes by spraying taxpayers' dollars at marginal electorates. As a noted French, statement, uh, French statesman once said of the decaying French monarchy, they have learned nothing and they have forgotten nothing. The same applies to this government. There's no vision, just blatant political corruption on display. So at the close of this parliament, it's again necessary to highlight one of the government's most conspicuous but self-interested failures, their broken promise to establish a federal integrity commission. It's been over 1,200 days since uh, Scott Morrison promised a federal ICAC, and despite a full parliamentary term, the government never introduced any legislation into either House of Parliament. And they voted against attempts by the member for Indi, Dr Helen Haynes, and myself to move ahead with our federal, Australian Federal Integrity Commission Bill. Whether it's uh, sports rorts, car park rorts, dodgy water purchases, blind trusts, jobs for the boys, JobKeeper rorts, the government's track record on integrity is a disgrace. So enacting a federal ICAC will be the job of the next parliament. We urgently need an integrity commission with real teeth, with the, the investigative powers of a standing royal commission, able to root out corruption and misconduct at all levels of the Australian government. There's a huge task ahead to clean up Australian politics. A federal ICAC, a strong parliamentary code of conduct, full disclosure of political donations and improved transparency across the board are all vital to restore the health of our democracy. There is much work to be done and, no and nothing can be taken for granted for from either the coalition government or the Labor opposition. Independents are needed to press hard for these reforms to keep the bastards on us, whichever side wins the election. That's for sure. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. It's also good to see you back in the chamber as well and in the chair. Now, last week, on the 21st of March, was the International Day of Forests. Forests are one of our planet's greatest renewable resources, and when managed sustainably, like we do in Australia, they provide essential materials for many industries, particularly construction. Now, I've spoken about forestry at length in this place, and I do so because it is often unfairly criticised and attacked by many who wouldn't know the first thing about how the industry operates. These people do not stop to think about the impact of their misguided activism on the lives and livelihoods of the many workers, families and regional communities who rely on jobs in forestry. But these people are not the only threat to forestry. There's also been a lack of support and direction from the coalition government. The Liberals and the Nationals have made a habit of announcing support for forestry prior to an election and not following through whilst in government. Despite the coalition's promise to plant one billion trees at the last election, under their watch, Australia's plantation estate has shrunk by 500 million trees 
down 10 per cent since they formed government. Now, right before an election, we have another announcement from the Prime Minister to plant 150 million trees. But how can we trust him or his government? How can we believe anything that they say? We should strive as a country to be self-sufficient rather than relying on imported materials like timber. We must invest in domestic manufacturing, create jobs and secure our supply chains. Australia cannot afford to lock in another timber shortage crisis and we cannot afford another term of this Liberal national government. Senator Wish Wilson. If anything perfectly demonstrates the corrupted nature of this government, what they truly stand for, what their priorities are, it's this. Today we find out, in the last two days of this 46th parliament, that Ms. Minister, Mr Angus Taylor, the so-called Minister for Emissions Reductions, is bringing forward regulations before this parliament, before this Senate, to provide $32 million in public funding to a small private enterprise to develop a commercial gas deposit in the offshore Gippsland Basin in Victoria, the so-called Golden Beach Project. This at the same time that the Barrier Reef is bleaching, again the fourth time in six years. This at the same time that our communities are being flooded by extreme weather events. People have died today, Acting Deputy President, yet this government what does it do in its last dying days? It gives more money to fossil fuel companies. They seem to be proud of it. They seem to be rubbing it in our face. They seem to want to fight. Well, they're going to get one, Acting Deputy President. And I'm proud today to single out a few legends who have been travelling in northern Tasmania and around the country trying to get people to understand the dangers posed by the oil and gas industry. In particular, I'd like to do a shout out to the no gas across the Bass crew, Ali King, Ethan Turner, Annie Ford, Alex Wiley, Amelia Combe, Talon Clemo, Finn Leary, and from Surfrider Foundation, Damien Cole, Drew McPherson, and Stephanie Curlew. Thank you for your activism. Thank you for your work. The community have spoken about this right around the country. No more oil and gas drilling Thank in our you, oceans. Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Mirabella. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Victorian government's ongoing disregard of the health and safety rights of the people of Western Victoria, specifically those constituents who are in the new seat of Hawke, regarding the disposal of toxic soil out of Melbourne and into regional Victoria. The Andrews Labor government's Westgate Tunnel project is transferring toxic soil to contractors despite community outcry and frustration and an ongoing court proceeding. The residents of Bacchus Marsh and Sunbury have cried out against the dumping of toxic soil next to aged care facilities, schools, residential estate and, alarmingly, an active creek system. How much longer do regional Victorians have to go on being ignored by their own state government? It seems the Andrews government believes the project and its contractors are more important than the people they're supposed to represent. There have been several spills of contaminated soil on the roads from the dig site to the site where the soil is stored. And this only highlights the fears of the residents and, if anything, should reinforce the strange absence of consultation between the Victorian government and its contractors. And there's a further concern for the burden of transporting huge volumes of soil through regional roads. The heritage-listed Buller Bridge already has to accommodate nearly 400 trucks crossing it every day. The Bacchus Marsh Avenue of Honour is also now directly impacted by these trucks carrying their toxic cargo. The addition of these soil trucks without adequate traffic management will pose unacceptable risks to road safety. Regional Victoria must not be used as a rubbish tip for urban Melbourne. I call on the Victorian Labor government to do what is right by regional Victoria, the people of Bacchus Marsh, Sunbury and Buller. Thank you. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. As the world grapples with the horrific events of Ukraine, we are reminded that not so long ago we were dealing with another crisis, the return of the Taliban. 
the return of the Taliban in control of Afghanistan, thousands, men, women, children, fled for their lives, fearing the return of a regime with a history of violent oppression of women in all walks of life. This week, some of those fears have been realised, with the Taliban reversing its promise to allow girls to remain in secondary schools in Afghanistan. This decision represents an ugly decline into the darkest days of Taliban control, and it is precisely what's, what so many feared since the fall of Kabul last year. The women of Afghanistan warned the Taliban's word could not be trusted, and sadly they were right. The denial of this fundamental right based on gender is unacceptable, and we join calls of the international community for the Taliban to reverse this decision. Yet again, we urge the Australian government to fulfil its promises to the people of Afghanistan who are desperately waiting for visas for Senator loved ones. Wong, your time has expired. Uh, we will move up. Minister, are you seeking the call before question time? Not before question. We will move to questions on notice. Minister. Uh, Mr President, I do seek leave to make a statement regarding a ministerial absence. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, I advise the Senate that Senator Birmingham will be absent from question time today, Tuesday, the 29th of March 2022, for budget arrangements. In Senator Birmingham's absence, I will represent the Prime Minister, the Minister for Finance, the Minister assisting the Prime Minister and Cabinet, the Minister for the Public Service, the Treasurer, the Assistant Treasurer, and the Special Minister for State. Thank you. We will now move to question time. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne, and I refer to the reports that Solomon Islands Prime Minister Mr Sagavare has told his parliament a security agreement between the Solomon Islands and China has been finalised and, quote, the document is ready for signing, end quote. When did the Australian government first become aware that China and Solomon Islands were negotiating a security agreement? And what action did the Australian government take in response? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank uh, Senator Wong for her question. We have been aware of increasing engagement, uh, in increasing interest in engagement with China in the Solomon Islands for some time, uh, and we have absolutely and consistently demonstrated that Australia uh, is always ready to support the Solomon Islands, together with uh, members of the Pacific family, particularly in our work together. The most recent demonstration of that uh, is the strength of the response of Australia, New Zealand, the Pacific, um, Papua New Guinea uh, and uh, Fijian representatives of part of the Solomon Islands Assistance Force uh, in November of last year, Mr. President, which deployed more than 200 members of the AFP, the Defence Force, uh, and DFAT personnel to assist in the restoration of law and order. Uh, about 50 members of the ADF, the AFP and DFAT remain deployed uh, in those tasks in the Solomon Islands. Um, on 24th of March, the Solomon Islands Prime Minister uh, also announced that uh, we will be extending our bilateral security treaty assistance to support the Solomon Islands to prepare and assist for the Pacific Games, uh, which are in December of 2023 that we'll construct a second patrol boat outpost on Solomon Islands' eastern border, which is in addition to the western border and patrol boat outpost in the Shortland Islands. Uh, we'll also build an integrated police, health and disaster management radio network across the Solomon Islands. These are matters which have been under discussion uh, for a period of time, particularly the latter, uh, Mr. President, the radio network, with uh, Solomon Islands officials. Um, for example, Minister Andrews and I participated in a bilateral security meeting uh, with uh, Foreign Minister Manelli and the Police Minister uh, some months ago now, Mr. President, in its regular rotation, I should say, uh, as part of, uh, of that process. Uh, and I would also say to the chamber Minister, that we've been clear. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Article 1 of the reported draft framework agreement states, and I quote, the relevant forces of China can be used to protect the safety of Chinese personnel and major projects in Solomon Islands. What does the minister and the government understand Article 1 of the reported draft agreement to mean? Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr President. And, uh, a note in respect of the articles themselves. They're obviously not uh, matters to which the Australian government is a party in the preparation of or the uh, 
uh, or the progression of. And we've been clear and regularly and respectfully raised our concerns with the Solomon Islands government about uh, these matters of security engagement. Uh, and it is particularly concerning to us that there may be associated with this any actions that undermine the stability and the security of our region, uh, which I have said previously and repeated in public comments uh, in recent days. We believe that the Pacific family, in its broad, is best placed to provide security assistance to the Solomon Islands, and we stand ready to assist further if that is needed. We have been explicitly uh, and emphatically clear in relation to that, and in fact not just in words, Mr President, because that is what our deeds demonstrate uh, in all of our actions in relation Minister, to engagement on these matters Minister, with the Solomon Islands. Your time has expired. Senator Wong, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister confirm that Australian bilateral official development assistance to Solomon Islands has been cut by $41.8 million, or 21%, since Budget 2018-19. Minister. Thank you, Order. Mr. President. And Senator Seselja Senator uh, is right, but that is a misrepresentation. Order. It does not incorporate the. It does not incorporate uh, consideration of Australia's uh, construction of the Coral Sea Cable from Order. Honiara uh, oh, to land. Sydney, and also, of course, to Port Moresby. What the senator also completely ignores. Order. So, Mr. President, Order. Minister, Mr. President, Minister, I would say Minister, that resume your seat. Order in the chamber. Interjections are always disorderly. Please, let's hear the minister speak. Minister, you have the call. Mr. President, I would say it is unlikely that some of the interjections from the other side that I can hear are audible more broadly, and particularly on the broadcast. But I would say, Mr. President, that those opposite have indicated in recent weeks their strong commitment to bipartisanship in matters of foreign policy. I fail to see that demonstrated here today. Senator, order, order, Senator Davey. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, Senator McKenzie. Um, can the minister please update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals government is supporting New South Wales and Queensland communities who have been affected by the recent devastating and ongoing flood Order. emergencies? Senator Watt. Thank you, Senator Watt. I'd like to hear from the minister rather than you. Order. Order. The Minister for Emergency Management, Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Davey, for the question. Firstly, I want to extend mine and the government's, and I'm sure this chamber's, sincere condolences to the families and loved ones of the now 24 people who have lost their lives to the terrible flooding event uh, that has started in Queensland on the 22nd of February and has spread throughout the East Coast to encompass over 81 local government areas in Queensland and New South Wales. I want to also thank our amazing SES, RFS, uh, our emergency service volunteers, our ADF and all those wonderful Australians who have done what we are best known for, helping out our neighbours, our communities, when times are tough. And this isn't over. Uh, just today, the rains are continuing to fall, and right now we have six evacuation orders uh, in these already traumatised communities. We will continue to work uh, closer with both New South Wales and Queensland to ensure uh, that support is available to those communities in need. And I just want to pay tribute to both uh, my state Labor colleague in Queensland and my state Nationals colleague in New South Wales for working so collaboratively uh, during this period. Having visited Lismore, Gympie, Ballina, Brisbane other uh, communities, as the former Governor-General said, uh, Cosgrove, when he was on the ground in Lismore, it is like ground zero. This recovery effort isn't going to be a sprint, it's going to be a marathon, and our government has delivered the fastest rollout of both financial and non financial assistance to these communities we've ever seen following a major disaster Order. event. And it is at a scale, this is likely to surpass uh, our response to the Black Summer bushfires. In anticipation, we activated Comms Dis Plan on the 25th of February, and it remains active. Queensland made its first uh, 
request on the 26th of February, and on later that week we also had requests in for Category A and B assistance uh, from New South Wales. And since then, we've been able to support over 1.4 million Australians uh, in combination yeah. with our state Minister, government colleagues to Minister, get through this disaster. Your time has expired. A supplementary question, Senator Davey. Thank you, Minister. Uh, we've heard a lot about the Emergency Response Fund, which um, is available. Can you please explain how our government intends to use that fund to support Australians affected by these floods? Minister. Thank you. The Emergency Response Fund, a future fund, was designed to grow over the next decade to $6.6 billion. It's there for when Order. all other avenues of funding have been exhausted, and its primary purpose is to ensure that we're prepared for the future events, for future generations. And the legislation underpinning that fund is incredibly prescriptive about how it is used. The magnitude of the floods in this event and the extent of the damage that they've caused is exactly the type of scenario that the ERF was designed to deal with. And that is why we will draw down on the fund and use the $150 million allowed for this financial year to uh, fund emergency response and recovery, with $75 million going to both the Queensland State Government and the New South Wales State Government. And we'll use $150 million for the 2022-23 recovery Order. specifically for Lismore after the catastrophic flood event there, to, for them to be able to use it for flood mitigation uh, following a study that the government will also Minister. fund. Senator Davey, a second supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, what other resilience measures has the government put in place to reduce the impact of future natural disasters? Minister. As the first Australian government to establish a national resilience-focused agency, I can absolutely confirm we are committed to building Australia's resilience to natural disasters. Our plan is more considered than simply rebranding a fund that already exists, as Labor is doing with its Disaster Ready Fund, under which it claims it will spend up to $200 million not a ringing endorsement for a funding program. Unlike Labor, we're actually getting on with the job of building resilience, of giving communities hope for the future and support in the present, not politicising vulnerable communities who are struggling right now, uh, whether it be bushfire traumatised communities or current flooded communities, in their efforts to get back on their seat, feet. Our $600 million Preparing Australia program will support communities to undertake disaster risk reduction and resilience initiatives to reduce the impact of future disasters, because we know here in this country this will not be the last flood, this will not be the last Minister, bushfire or cyclone yeah, yeah. that our Minister, people will have to deal with. Your time with. has expired. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, Senator McKenzie. New South Wales Liberal Catherine Cusack, MLC, has described Mr Morrison's politicisation of flood relief as, and I quote, probably the most unethical approach I have Order. ever seen. She has said she will resign, and I quote, she says, I can't defend it, and I am outraged by it. How can the Morrison government defend its own approach when even New South Wales state Liberals won't defend it? The minister order, order, Senator Watt, order, 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 Senator Watt, Senator Watt, Senator Patterson, and Senator Reynolds, you're not assisting. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Well, the rainfall order. and subsequent flooding event that occurred in late February and early March and continues even today has caused devastation throughout these communities, particularly northern New South Wales and the seven local Order. government areas of the Northern Rivers. And unlike many of those opposite who are choosing to yell and scream about this devastating impact which has caused Australians to lose their lives, rather than actually Order. hear about the, the things that, as a federal government, we've done in, in conjunction with the state government to actually support these communities. So right now, at the peak Order. of Operation Flood Assist 22, there were 7,000 ADF personnel present across Queensland Senator and New Watt. South Wales. Right now, there's around 4,000 ADF Watt. in Lismore itself. 
and they're assisting that community with the very tough task of getting the piles of rubbish that I know you've seen, Senator Watt, on the streets of Lismore, off the streets of heading out into smaller communities of Wardell, Korokai, Broadwater and beyond to actually assist with the very long task of the clean-up. And they're, they've Senator been welcomed Keneally. with open arms in these communities. Open arms. And I know it was quite Minister, um, hard for Minister, the ADF. Minister, on a point of order. Uh, the point of order is relevance. The question went to the comments by Ms Cusack and, uh, in particular, her comments regarding the ethics of the Morrison government's approach to flood relief. The minister hasn't gone to that question at all. I have been listening carefully to the minister's answer. I cannot instruct the minister on how to answer a question. I believe she was being directly relevant to the question. Minister, you have 43 seconds. Uh, thank Order, you, thank you very much, Mr President. Well, as um, we know, disaster recovery funding arrangements that were set up in 2018 are jointly funded by Commonwealth Order, and State Kenyon. governments. And at the very day that these flooding events were occurring Senator in New South McAllister. Wales, these were activated by the New South Wales government, as is the appropriate governance arrangements for the disaster recovery funding arrangements. And in that first uh, days of the flood event, we were rolling out temporary accommodation assistance with the New South Wales government. We were funding it. They are responsible for rolling it out. Uh, we were also assisting them Order. with local council grants and the like for that Minister, immediate response. Now Minister, we've shifted Minister, to recovery. Your time has expired. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. New South Wales Nationals MP Jeff Provost has said, and I quote, the federal government have really messed this up. This is like a remake of the bushfires some two years ago. Yep. How can the Morrison government defend its own approach when even New South Wales nationals won't defend it? That's right. He's... Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Well, as I said uh, in my previous answer, we have been able to get, at a Commonwealth level, both non-financial, being the ADF boots Order, on the ground, the Taipan helicopters Senator rescuing McAllister. people off roofs in Lismore itself within Senator hours Keneally. because we did pre-posture ahead of that request from the New South Wales government. Uh, and we have, uh, even now, 4,000 ADF on the ground, so non-financial support in record time and financial support in record time, rolled out through Services Australia Order, and our Senator own Keneally. disaster payment and disaster recovery allowance. Now, it might not suit the Labor Party's narrative, who wants to uh, you know, politicise natural disasters, but what Australians in need want to Senator hear Wong, from their leaders, what Australians in need want to hear from their political leaders, Irrespective Senator of whether they're federal or state, irrespective of whether they're Labor or Liberal, is actually working together Minister, to get the response Minister, where it's needed, when it's Minister. needed. It is, it is becoming increasingly difficult to hear the Minister's answers. Senator McAllister, a second supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. Provost also declared that he was disgusted by Mr Morrison, yep. and I quote him again, he said, I would struggle to vote for him. Yeah. When even members of the New South Wales Liberals and Nationals can't defend Mr Morrison, can't stomach voting for him and are disgusted with him, does the minister really expect Australians to feel differently? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Minister. As I was saying, Australians in need are quite offended by those in the privileged positions that we hold for cheap political Order. point scoring. They want us to get on Order with the job on of assisting them in their time of need. And whether it is uh, that immediate response phase in the immediate days when people are actually thousands of people are homeless here, getting temporary accommodation sorted, making sure they've got cash in their accounts uh, to purchase petrol, purchase clothes. That's exactly what the Palaszczuk government Order. partnered with us to do, as did the Perrottet state government do Senator with the Commonwealth. And once Senator we move McAllister. into the recovery phase, which we are now in, and this is going to last Senator a Watt. long time, we are rolling out 
additional measures depending on what the state governments decide. So Palaszczuk government wanted to give in their Category D response $20,000 to community groups. The Perrottet Minister, government chose to— Minister, your time has expired. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to Senator Hume, representing the Minister for the Environment. Senator Hume, could you please update the chamber uh, on the Minister Susan Lay's uh, comments uh, or her updates on the devastating and very concerning news that the Great Barrier Reef is experiencing its fourth mass coral bleaching in the last six years? The Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Hume. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Wish Wilson for his question. Mr. President, the Commonwealth, the Commonwealth Government, the Morrison Government, is deeply committed to protecting the World Heritage listed Great Barrier Reef. One sentence in. The tourism industry, traditional owners, reef communities, they rely on the Morrison Government's commitment to the reef, and we will not let them down. Before COVID closed the world's borders, economic activity stemming from the reef was worth an estimated 6.4 billion dollars annually and 64,000 jobs. Mr President, the Morrison government's enduring commitment to the protection of the reef was demonstrated just last Friday with the announcement of an additional $1 billion in new funding. Now, this additional funding takes the total funding by the Australian and Queensland governments to more than $4 billion by 2030. More than $3 billion of this is from the Australian government. Benchmarked against global standards, Australia's Senator management Brown. of the reef is recognised as a leading example and is considered Minister, by many. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Wish Wilson on a point of order. Point of order on relevance, President. Um, I asked a very quick question. I asked the minister to update us on Minister Lay's comments regarding the devastating news from last week. Um, we don't need talking points. Senator, I'd Senator actually like Wish her to address Wilson. my question. I've heard your point of order. Um, I've been listening to the minister's answer. The minister was being directly relevant to the question. The min I cannot direct a minister how to answer a question. The minister was being relevant to the question. I've been listening. Minister, you have the call. You have just over a minute remaining. Thank you, Mr President. So benchmarked against global standards, Australia's management of the reef is recognised as a leading example and is considered by many to be the gold standard for large-scale marine protected area management, according to the UNESCO report. This $1 billion package will enhance Australia's world-leading management of the reef in four separate ways. Minister, resume your seat. <laughs> Senator McKim. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, Pre Senator McKim, it's been a while. It has been a while. I was just waiting, waiting for the call, uh, President. Um, the point of order is uh, on the same matter that Senator Wish Wilson raised a point of order, that is relevance. The question specifically and only related to the current mass bleaching event on the Great Barrier Reef. The minister has not mentioned the mass bleaching event uh, two thirds of the way through the time allocated for the answer. I simply ask you, President, if you would remind the minister of the question, please. You have had a chance to remind the minister of the question. I've been listening to the minister's answer. The minister was being relevant to the question. Minister, you have the call. 40 seconds remaining. Thank you, Mr President. I'm happy to mention mass bleaching. Now it is mentioned because mass bleaching is one issue that affects the Great Barrier Reef. Other issues that affect the Great Barrier Reef are changes in climate. Other issues that affect the Great Barrier Reef are crown of thorns starfish. And this additional $1 billion investment that takes the Commonwealth's funding up to $3 billion is just one of the ways that we can address all of the issues that are facing the Great Barrier Reef, for which we are known as the gold standard in response to large-scale marine protected area management, according to UNESCO itself. So there are four ways— Minister, Minister your time has expired. Senator Wish Wilson, a supplementary question. My well, supplementary question is to ask the same question a different way, so perhaps the minister can respond this time. What has the federal environment minister said about the fourth mass coral bleaching in the last six years on the Great Barrier Reef? Order. Minister, you have the call. 
Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Wish Wilson for saying it louder because I didn't hear it properly the first time quite clearly. So I will happily say that this additional $1 billion package that will enhance Australia's world leading management of the reef will do so in four ways. First and foremost, it will accelerate progress towards water quality targets. Mr. President, we're extending efforts to improve reef Order. water quality and meet our agreed targets Minister. under. Senator Wish Wilson, on a point of order. On a point of order and on relevance. Mr. President, this is an international crisis, and the minister is refusing no, to Senator answer Wish the question. Wilson. It is a Senator disgrace. Wish Wilson, it is a is bloody not... disgrace. Senator Wish Wilson, resume your seat. This is not a debating time. There is no point of order. Minister. <laughs> Senator Wish Wilson, I am not where what people are asking you to withdraw, and I do not wish you to repeat it. However, if you said something that you should withdraw, please withdraw it. Senator Wish Wilson, I will review the transcript uh, following, uh, following question time. Minister, you have the call. Thank you, Mr. President. So, this new $1 billion investment, which is in addition to the already existing $4 billion investment between the Commonwealth and the Queensland governments, will accelerate progress towards water quality targets. It will, in addition to that, continue our world leading risk Minister, management conservation partnerships. Minister, resume your seat. Senator Wish Wilson. Question What has the Environment Minister said Senator about the Wish mass coral Wilson, bleaching? What this has she is said? Not a debating time. Senator Wish Wilson, as I have said already on a number of occasions today, I cannot direct the Minister how to answer a question. You have brought the minister back to a particular um, to to the question that you asked. However, I have been listening to the minister's answer, and I believe she was relevant to the question. Minister, you have the call. You have 21 seconds remaining. Thank you, Thank you Mr. President. The third thing that that money will do is support climate adaptation, science, research, and development. And the fourth, minister, oh, minister. Minister, resume your seat. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. On, on a point of order, and the point of order is direct relevance, I simply ask you, please, and uh, later or now, a, as you wish, Mr. President, but uh, to rule on whether a question that is seeking specifically a response as to what the minister said about an issue can be responded to in a relevant way by simply talking about the issue. Um, that is the matter that I think would assist the Senate if you could uh, rule on that. I'd be very happy for you to take it away and, and, and come I'm back uh, at, at, your, uh, at your leisure, President. But I do think that's an important matter to have clarified for the I Senate. I will come back to the chamber tomorrow with a fulsome explanation. However, I believe that the minister is being directly relevant to the question in answering the way she has. I will explain my position tomorrow. And, Minister, you have the call for 14 seconds. Thank you, Mr. President. And finally, the fourth element of that funding will to fund on-the-ground community and traditional owner-led projects. Now, I understand that Labor and the Greens tend to seek to politicise the reef, Order. but the coalition will continue its long legacy Minister, of protecting it. Minister, your time has expired. A second supplementary, Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, President. Uh, two UNESCO scientists have been in Australia in the last week visiting the Barrier Reef at this government's invitation. Uh, to assess whether climate change is impacting the world heritage values of the Great Barrier Reef and its UNESCO listing, can you confirm that those scientists visited reefs that have bleached? And if so, which reefs did they visit? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I can confirm that scientists were here associating with the Reef Authority, and Reef Authority staff have been working with those research partners from the Australian Institute of Marine Science to conduct aerial surveys across the reef. Those surveys concluded on Wednesday, the 23rd of March, but the results are still being analysed. The minister is aware that these surveys have detected widespread coral bleaching over a large area of the reef, and these surveys indicate variable minister, levels of bleaching between minister, different regions. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Wish Wilson, on a point of order. On a point of order on relevance, Minister, oh. uh, President. No, no. I'm, I'm happy to rule straight away. The, the minister was being directly relevant, Senator Wish Wilson. Well, she could not have been more relevant. These, Senator Wish no, these Senator surveys Wilson. have nothing to do Senator with the Wish UNESCO Wilson. visit. 
points of order that have nothing are not to do an with the investigation to debate. Well, having a minister Senator who actually knows what she's talking about. Senator Wish Wilson. Question time is not a debating forum. Senator Wish Wilson, there was no point of order. Minister, you have. Mi Senator Wish Wilson. Minister, you have the call. You have 35 seconds remaining. Thank you, Mr. President. So these surveys indicated variable levels of bleaching between different regions and between different reefs. Some reefs are unaffected, others experiencing minor paling, and some where the heat stress is greatest are severely impacted. That is correct. It's important to note that corals can, in fact, survive bleaching events, and some corals will be mildly or moderately Order. affected, and some will recover when favourable conditions return. The Senator bleaching Wish follows Wilson. a summer of very hot weather, following record-breaking temperatures Senator across the reef. But the reef authority will continue to brief the minister on reef conditions as the data becomes increasingly available. All right, uh, Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Colbeck, representing the Minister for Health, and it relates to the cost of health care in Australia. Minister, when the Medical Costs Finder website was launched two years ago, it was found that patients in some states were paying out-of-pocket costs up to 40 times more than patients in other states for some procedures. Fee transparency was supposed to alleviate this problem. Minister, can you tell me whether the Medical Costs Finder website has helped a single patient by reducing their out-of-pocket costs? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. President. Thank Senator Griff for the question and some notice of the general topic of the question. Mr. President, the government continues to invest in Australia's world leading health system to ensure that Australians do have access to high quality health services at reasonable cost. The current situation with respect to uh, bulk billing, for example, sees the bulk billing rate at a record high of 83.5 per cent, which is 6.5 per cent higher than when we came to government in 2013. And GP billing, bulk billing records remain at record highs over the 2021 20, calendar year. The current, um, over that 21 calendar year, the bulk billing rate was 88.7 per cent, 6.9 per cent higher than in 2012, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Griff is correct. The purpose of the um, Medical Cost Web Finder site was to provide some uh, visibility and transparency to support Australians to understand what their medical costs might be so that they could make appropriate decisions with respect to where they might access those costs. Um, I don't have with me any specific data in relation to uh, the outcomes of those, um, those elements from the initial build, uh, no, noting that the Medical Cost Finder website is still in its initial stages of being developed and there are further stages to be uh, considered. I uh, understand that uh, Minister Hunt has indicated a willingness to work with you, as we have done on, our, on other previous sites that have provided visibility, to continue to improve uh, that information made, to be made available uh, to Australians across the board. Uh, but what we continue to do, Mr. President, is to invest into Australia's world-leading health system, and whether that's Minister, into the MBS system. Minister, for... your time has expired. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. Uh, Minister, you haven't actually answered my question. I would have thought that you would have been able to say that at least a single patient might have benefited in some way. Can you actually tell me whether there has actually been a reduction in how much individuals spend overall on health care? over this term of government? Minister. Uh, thanks, Mr President. I actually don't have any data on individual spends, at the, um, but uh, I, I do have uh, information, as I was just going through, about the uh, amount of funding that the government continues to put into the, Australia's world-leading health system to support um, Australians to access at reasonable cost uh, their care. So if you look at, for example, Australian government's uh, funding to public hospitals, that's grown from $13.3 billion in 2012-13 to $25.5 billion in uh, 2021. Mr President, by 90 per cent over that period of time. Uh, we can 
Minister, resume your seat. Senator Griff, on a point of order. Uh, re relevance, Mr. President. My question was not how much government spends on health care, but how much um, individuals spend on health care and whether there has been a reduction in how much they spend as a result of uh, this particular site. This, the minister did respond to, to, to that question. However, I, I will remind in, when questions are narrowly framed, it is important to remain within the bounds of the question. Uh, Minister, you have the call. If you have anything you wish to add, for 20 seconds. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I, I did addre specifically address uh, that point, and, and I did indicate that I didn't have any specific data. Um, and so, uh, on that with me, Mr. President. Uh, but, I, but what I did Senator do, Lambie. Mr. President, was indicate the continued expansion of funding into the health system to Australians to ensure Minister, that they can access Minister, a high quality health system. Your time has expired. Senator Griff, a second supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Minister, Australia has been reported as having the third highest reliance on individual health care contributions in the world. That's massive. What will government do if re-elected to lower the cost for individual Australians? Not government costs, but the actual cost to patients, to the public. Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and, and I don't accept the premise of the question because government spending, government spending on health actually does contribute to the cost that would otherwise be the case for Australians with respect to the health, health system. That's why, Mr. President, Senator that's Pratt. why we continue to invest in world-leading drugs through the MBS to make sure that Australians can access them at Senator cheaper prices. Pratt. That's why we do that, Mr. President. And we continue to list drugs, take older ones off, put new ones on, so Australians have access to the best possible drugs at, at a reduced price so that they don't have to pay so much for their health system. That's why we continue to, help, to invest so heavily in the public health system. So if they don't have it, can't have access to private health uh, services, they can access it publicly through the public health system, Mr. President. That's why we continue to invest. And Mr. President, that's why the Australian government's investment in the public health system is so important and it does actually contribute to lowering costs to Australians in, in, in accessing Australia's world health best sy health system. Senator Sheldon. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cash. Today, residents of South East Queensland and northern New South Wales face more flooding, with evacuation orders issued in a number of northern rivers towns. Residents are still cleaning up from last month's devastating floods, in which they were abandoned by this Prime Minister. What will Mr Morrison do to make these floods victims are not abandoned by his government yet again? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Sheldon for the question. And uh, in relation to the question, Senator Sheldon, I completely reject what you have just said. This Order. government has not forgotten the people in the floods. In fact, what I would say is that the floods that occurred in late February and early March, they have caused devastation throughout New South Wales or northern New South Wales and the southern Queensland area on a scale that has not been seen, as we all know, since 2011. And in response to that, the Australian government is providing over $2.5 billion, Mr. President, over $2.5 billion Order. in financial Order. support in response to this devastating flood. And Mr President, just to ensure Senator Sheldon does understand that the Australian government is working with both the New South Wales and the Queensland government in relation to the provision of our financial support, Senator Sheldon, as at the 28th of March, so only yesterday, $1.3 billion Order. has been paid to over 1.4 million Australians. And that is through the Australian Government Disaster Recovery Payment and the, sup uh, the Special Supplement and the Disaster Recovery Allowance. Mr President, there has been $291 million of 100 per cent, Senator Sheldon, Commonwealth funded, 100 per cent Commonwealth funded, direct support for those affected by the floods in New South Wales and Queensland. 
and you would be aware that this is in addition to targeted support announced for each state. Mr. President, I could go on, but Senator Sheldon, this government is working with Order. New South Wales and Queensland to ensure Minister, that we Minister, respond appropriately. Your time has expired. Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. When Lismore flooded a month ago, residents had to use their own speedboats and crowdfund private helicopters to rescue each other and were left to clean up on their own. As a Lismore community worker said in the aftermath, where is the government? Why does Scott Morrison always abandon Australians when they need him? Minister. Well, Senator Sheldon, again, I completely reject the premise Senator of that Watt. question. And I have just outlined Senator for Keneally. you, Senator Sheldon, the significant financial support that the government is providing to those Order. that have been affected by what is, Mr. President, the devastation caused by the floods. And that type of flooding has not been seen since 2011. But, Mr. President, the Australian government has taken significant action, as we often hear Senator Mackenzie outline in this chamber. And in particular, Senator Sheldon, the following actions have been taken. This is in addition to the $2.5 billion that we are providing in financial support in response to the devastating flood. The Comms D plan was activated, Senator Sheldon, as you know, on the 25th of February. We activated the National Emergency Declaration on the 11th of March 2022. Minister, Minister, your time has expired. Senator Sheldon, a second supplementary question. Well, the Prime Minister fled Hawaii, fled to Hawaii during Black Summer. He didn't order vaccines. He didn't order rats. He didn't show up for floods last month. Why does Scott Morrison always leave Australians to fend for themselves when people most need help? Minister, order, 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 Senator Watt. Minister. Well, again, Mr. President, this is what you get from Labor. Nothing more and nothing less than actually politicising events in which the government, this government is working on the ground with the New South Wales government and the Queensland government. Order. This government will stand by Australians every step of the way. And Senator Sheldon, if I took you through on a portfolio by portfolio basis, I can assure you Order that this is a government that does back Australians every single step of the way. This is a government that believes in the resilience of the Australian people. Order. This is a government that, faced with Order. a global pandemic, Senator has Keneally. ensured that we took those decisions that would protect both Australia and Senator Australians, Keneally. whether it was JobKeeper, JobSeeker or the health response. And when when it comes to the devastating Senator floods, we are again working with the affected people on the ground to ensure that Senator they Wong. get the support Minister. that they require. Order. Senator Mirabella. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cash. Senator, how does the Liberal and National Government's plan for our economic recovery ensure job security for all Australians, not only now but into the future? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. And I thank Senator Mirabella for the question. And I do understand, Senator Mirabella, that it is your first question in this place. And how fitting, Senator Mirabella, that you ask a question in which the Australian people are actively interested, and that is, of course, Australia's economic recovery and how the policies of the Morrison government have, in particular, got more people back into work. Mr. President, we know that on this side of the chamber, governments themselves do not create jobs. That is for the businesses out there, the employers out there. Governments put in place policies under which businesses are able to prosper, to grow and create more jobs for Australians. And colleagues, you will recall that in 2020, Labor's Jim Chalmers said this, 
The single biggest test of the government management of the pandemic is what happens to unemployment and jobs. Well, Mr President, on Jim Chalmers' own analysis, this is a government, Senator Mirabella, that has delivered for the Australian people. Senator and what Watt, the budget Senator tonight Kinley. will show, what the budget tonight will show is that the unemployment rate will drop colleagues to three and three quarter per cent later this year. And if you compare Senator that, Watt. colleagues, to what the unemployment was in September 13, the unemployment rate September 2013, colleagues, 5.7 per cent under Labor, and as former Senator Cormann used to always say, and rising, because that's their track record. And rising. Senator Currently, Kennelly. under the coalition government, under the Morrison government, it is 4 per cent. And what you will see in the budget tonight is three and three quarter per cent later this year. Mr. President, jobs are important to the Australian people. Work is important to the Australian people. And tonight you will see the lowest rate in half a century. This is a government that believes in policies Minister. to ensure businesses are able to Minister. employ more Australians. Senator Mirabella, a supplementary question. Yes, thank you, Mr President. Um, Senator Cash, how is the government's economic plan helping Australian families have the opportunity to achieve the Australian dream of owning their own home? Minister. Well, Mr President, again, the government we understand that home ownership is so important to the Australian people. And what Order. we are doing is we are making home ownership a reality for thousands more Australians. Mr President, as part of our government's plan for a stronger future, we are supporting even more even more aspiring homeowners to get into the market. And the way we're going to do that, and we'll have more to say about that tonight, is to build on the remarkable success of our government's home guarantee scheme. What we will now do is we will more than double, more than double the program to 50,000 places a year. This means that with this program, because it does get people into their home, we'll continue to help more single parents buy a home with a deposit as low as 2 per cent and help more first home buyers with a deposit as low as 5 per cent. That great Australian Minister. dream of home ownership tonight, Minister. you'll hear more about it. Senator Mirabella, a Thank second you, Mr. supplementary President. question. Uh, Senator, looking to the future, what are the risks to Australia's economic recovery as we continue to live with COVID-19 and the rising security challenges that face our region? Minister. Well, Mr President, as Senator Watt was screaming out across the chamber, what are the risks to the Australian people? Well, Senator Watt, what I would actually say is an Albanese government. Because, you see, Mr President, what does an Albanese government stand for? Well, over the last 30 years, Labor has delivered higher unemployment, higher interest rates, higher electricity prices, and, and colleagues, let us not forget they have not delivered Order. a single balanced budget. Contrast that with Prime Minister Morrison. Prime Minister Morrison, who is ensuring that this government puts in place policies that enables businesses to prosper, grow, create more jobs for Australians. This government that now has more Australians in work than we did prior to COVID-19. This government that understands that Australians deserve Order. more of what Senator they Kennelly. earn, and that's why we believe in lowering Minister, taxes. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is for the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Minister, you and I both know Russia is going after civilians and children in Ukraine. 300 people died in Maripol when a Russian plane bombed the drama theatre where they were taking shelter. Russia is attacking schools, hospitals and evacuation routes. Little kids are dying at a phenomenal rate. It is brutal and it is shocking. You have previously said that the international targeting of civilians is a war crime. Is Vladimir Putin a war criminal? Uh, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank uh, Senator Lambie for her question. And the uh, issues that she raises are deeply serious issues uh, in terms of the actions that 
are being taken by Russia in Ukraine. There are identified a number of acts, and Senator Lambie has uh, referred to those, uh, and the catastrophic humanitarian toll uh, is growing, uh, as we know. There has been a reference to the International Criminal Court, which Australia supported, uh, and that International Court will make its assessment. There has also been a decision by the International Court of Justice, which enables investigations of these matters to begin now. Uh, and uh, my understanding is uh, that work will be underway as a result of that International Court of Justice question. But to be clear, as Senator Lambie indeed has been, the bombing of a school where it is known that hundreds of civilians are sheltering, the forced deportation of Ukraine residents, and particularly from Mariupol, to Russia, an airstrike on a theatre where it is known that civilians are sheltering, the bombing of a maternity hospital in Mariupol, the damaging of over 460 schools, over 40 health facilities in Ukraine, indicates that these are matters of criminal behaviour in wartime. That is the reference which will be considered, Mr President, that is the reference Australia supported and supports, and I will continue to do that uh, on behalf of all members of this Senate. Yeah. 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 Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Uh, Minister, Article 8 of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court states that it is a war crime to, and I quote, intentionally direct attacks against the civilian population as such or against individual civilians not taking direct part in hostilities. Putin's men are killing kids. I don't doubt they're doing it on his orders, and I don't doubt you do either. So I'm asking you, basically, are you going to have the courage to come out and call him for what he is? Putin is a war criminal. When is Australia's foreign minister going to call him for what he is? He is a war criminal. Call it. Minutes. Order. Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Lambie, with the greatest of respect, I believe I responded to the questions that you raised in my first answer. Senator Lambie, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. President Biden says that Putin is a butcher who is bent on violence. He can't see how Putin can possibly remain in power after everything he's done. Do you at least back President Biden's statements? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. The Australian government is working as closely as possible with a range of international partners, and that most certainly includes the United States, the United Kingdom, members of the European Union, non-EU non members, uh, non-EU countries in Europe, uh, as well as our counterparts in Japan, in Korea, in New Zealand, in Singapore, and others in the region. The Australian government has taken the strongest possible approach to our sanctions listings, Mr. President, including listing over 500 uh, individuals and entities. Uh, that includes, uh, of course, President Putin himself and President Putin's most senior advisers, the members of the Duma, who I regard and, the, and Australia regards as the political facilitators of this, uh, of this uh, egregious invasion, senior members of the Belarusian uh, system oh, as sorry, well, including sorry, President Minister, Lukashenko Minister. and his immediate family. I'm sorry, Senator Lambie, on a point of order. Yeah, point of order is um, I just simply want to know is President Biden says that Putin is a butcher. Does she agree? Senator Lambie, you have reminded the Minister of your question. However, the Minister was being directly relevant. Minister, you have the call for 11 seconds. Thank you, Mr President. And let me conclude by saying that the strongest possible costs need to be imposed upon Russia. Australia is, uh, the, is a very strong participant in the sanctions process, having uh, Minister. Imp imposed Minister. the sanctions I outlined earlier and others. Minister. Se Senator Lambie. Senator, Senator Lambie. Senator Cazelio. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, Senator Mackenzie. In her train wreck interview with the Today Show, the minister was asked five times what the threshold was for declaring a national emergency after the floods. Five times she was unable to answer. 
Can the minister now explain the threshold for declaring a national emergency? Minister for Emergency Services, Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, uh, as Senator Watt rightly um, highlights, on the 11th of March, the Governor General enacted the national emergency New South Wales Floods 2022 declaration. The Prime Minister formally recommended a national emergency declaration following advice from the Director General of Emergency Management Australia, Joe Buffoni, who has also briefed uh, Senator Watt uh, in my own personal efforts to make sure that uh, we're as bipartisan as possible in dealing with this crisis on the 10th of March. This advice was provided in consultation with a range of Commonwealth agencies based on the best possible information uh, available at that point in time. The Prime Minister must be satisfied that the scale and impact of the floods meet the legal threshold to declare a national emergency. The making of a national Order. emergency declaration enlivens a range of powers to make it easier for affected communities to access Commonwealth assistance, including empowering ministers to suspend, vary or substitute red tape requirements, for example, to make it uh, easy for affected individuals with supplying identification, for instance, when they may have to um, apply for certain um, funding, disaster relief funding allows the Prime Minister to access information from Commonwealth entities Minister, on stockpiles. Minister, resume your seat. Senator Watt on a point of order. Uh, thanks, Mr President. On relevance, uh, the minister referred to a threshold in her answer, but my question was what the threshold was. So could we get an answer on that, please? You've reminded the minister of the question. I am listening, um, but so far I believe the minister has been relevant to the question. But I will also point out, seeing as those opposite are interjecting in my ruling, that the question began with a highly political preamble. A narrowly framed question cannot start with a highly political preamble. Senator Order. Senator McKenzie, order. Senator Watt, you are wasting the Senate's time now. Senator McKenzie, you have the call for yes, 38 seconds. Yes, thank you very much. Well, the Prime Minister has to be satisfied, as I said, that the scale and impact of the floods meet that threshold to declare it. Now, with this particular event, with this particular Order. event, there was not one single uh, event within the natural disaster as it occurred. Rather, it was the cumulative effect of the weather pattern as it rolled from Gympie right down the east coast, dumping, as the Bureau of Meteorology has said, a one in 500 catastrophe uh, year event catastrophe Order. on Lismore itself. And based on the cumulative impact of that event over time, Minister, the Prime Minister. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Uh, it's probably best to the, just that I re ask. Does the minister know what the threshold is that her department uses when advising to declare a national emergency? What is the threshold? Minister. As I said, the Prime Minister himself must be satisfied that the event actually meets the threshold. And he right he, he, he uh, bases that on a range of data and or advice. Order. And as I outlined, Minister, on a point of order, <laughs> on, a, on a point of order, relevance. What is the threshold? What what is the threshold? <laughs> Set, uh, order, Senator McKenzie, on the point of order. Sorry, I didn't think we were able to restate questions in points of order, so I was wondering whether that was the second supplementary, the first supplementary, or indeed just restating Senator the first McKenzie, question. Senator McKenzie, that is a debating point. Senator Wong, do you want the call? Yes, Senator please. Wong, on Thank the point you. of order. On the point of order, uh, which is a point of order around direct relevance, um, the first supplementary, there was no political preamble. It was a very clear question to this minister. Uh, about the what is the threshold, uh, I would ask you to remind this minister of the question. 
I was listening to the minister's answer, and I believe she was being relevant. So I am not going to remind her of the question. You have reminded her of the question, Senator Wong. I'm, I, I do not believe there was anything in the minister's answer so far that was not relevant to the question. Order. Minister, you have the call for 44 seconds. Yes, thank Minister. you, Mr. President. Thank you. Well, the Australian Disaster Preparedness Framework defines a severe and catastrophic disaster as an event that is beyond current arrangements, thinking, experience and imagination, has overwhelmed our technical, non-technical and social systems and resources, has dis degraded Order. and disabled governance structures and strategic and operational decision-making functions. So in developing the advice to consider a declaration, the agencies have provided information on the following criteria. Okay? Listen up. Historical analysis Order. and recurrence. The concurrence Senator and compounding Wong. effects and scale of the events, as I outlined in my first answer, demographics, Minister, weather impacts. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Watt, second supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. When asked why it took the Prime Minister so long to declare a national emergency following the recent floods, this minister replied that the Prime Minister must consult with state and territory premiers. But the relevant legislation clearly states the Prime Minister does not need to consult premiers if, and I quote, it is not practicable to do so. Why did the minister mislead flood victims when trying to explain the Prime Minister's delay in declaring a national emergency? Minister. Um, given um, Senator Watt's issue around the threshold, I can answer both the, finish the threshold because there's quite a lot of thresholds. The weather impacts, the economic impacts, the flood extent, as I said, going down the east coast, vulnerability of disadvantaged populations, information, essential services and Minister. impact duration. Minister. Now, Mr President, Minister. going to Minister. Senator Watt's substantive— On the point of order. Point of order. Mr President, I asked I, I ask two questions asking for the threshold. And now I've asked a different question, and I'm getting an answer to that question. I, the, Senator Watt. So, Senator Watt. Do I need I, to restate this question? I don't believe you do. I think the minister is very well aware of the question. Minister, uh, I, I heard the minister getting to the question. Minister, you have the call. 46 Thank you. seconds remaining. I am uh, seeking to be helpful. The fact. The fact of the matter is that the, it wasn't, uh, una the Prime Minister was not unable to consult with both uh, Premier P Perrottet and Premier Palaszczuk because he was actually able Order. to consult with both of them. He doesn't need them both to agree to declare a national uh, emergency, but he does need to have the conversation, and then he can choose to declare it or not, Order. unilaterally or not. So Order. the Prime Minister. Order. Contacted both uh, Premier Palaszczuk, Premier Palaszczuk and Premier Perrottet, um to actually consult them around the first time we've ever actually uh, Minister, used this particular Minister, emergency your, power. Minister, please resume your feet. Senator Cash. I ask that further questions be now placed on notice. And Senator Faruqi. Mr. President, pursuant to Standing Order 1643, I ask the Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture in Northern Australia, Senator McKenzie, for an explanation as to why an order for the production of documents agreed to on 9 February 2022 concerning animal welfare incident reports has not been complied with. Senator McKenzie. Uh, Thank you, Senator Faruqi. I, in the bedlam, <laughs> could I have a few moments to respond to you appropriately? Because I am prepared to do that. Uh, Senator Faruqi, you, that is a response, so you can seek the call if you wish. Um, I, uh, Madam President, are we going to give Senator McKenzie a few moments? Or? Well, um, she has responded, so really okay, it's great. up to you. So, uh, Madam Deputy President, I move that the Senate take note of the Minister's failure to provide an answer or an explanation. 
Earlier this year, I moved an order for the production of documents regarding animal welfare incident reports held by the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment. That motion was agreed to unanimously by this chamber on the 9th of February. And the agreed motion allowed more than one week for the collection of the relevant documents, setting a deadline of 17th February. On that date, 17th February, Minister McKenzie wrote to the President stating that the Agriculture Minister had advised that due to the large number of documents being sought, he was unable to comply with the time frame. Critically, Oh, beg your pardon. Sorry, Senator yeah. McKenzie. Point of order. My apologies to the Senate and to Senator Faruqi. Um, consistent Senator with, McKenzie. I would seek leave to respond to Senator Faruqi's um, request earlier. Is leave granted? I don't think leave's been granted. Thank okay. you, Senator Faruqi. Continue your point. And then, Senator McKenzie, obviously you can respond then. Hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so, as I was saying, on that date, 17 February, Minister McKenzie wrote to the President stating that the Agriculture Minister had advised that due to the large number of documents being sought, he was unable to comply with the time frame. Critically, the letter also says the Minister intends to respond to the order at the earliest possible opportunity. Well, it's now 29th March. Almost six weeks have passed since this letter was provided. So where on earth are these documents? I mean, this is a really frustrating situation where the government has promised the chamber certain materials, promised them at the earliest possible opportunity, and we are left hanging until this very last sitting week to try and get even an explanation for why they have not been tabled. The government, we know that this, this government will avoid transparency and accountability at every turn. It is quite and absolutely critical that these documents are tabled and this vital information about animal welfare is presented to the chamber. My motion in February followed an investigation published in the Age newspaper into horrific animal cruelty in export abattoirs. Documents obtained by Richard Baker of the Age related to incident reports covering just two months in 2019. The Age reported that according to these reports, some cattle and sheep arriving at Victorian export abattoirs were unable to bear their own weight, and a small number were so debilitated that they died during transportation or had to be put down on arrival. This is simply like disgusting, cruel stuff, and there must be a light shone on the extent to which these sorts of in incidents are taking place in Australian abattoirs. And that's why I moved this order. And I was very pleased to have it receive unanimous support of the Senate. When I asked about welfare in our export abattoirs during Senate estimates on 15 February, following this order being made the week before, the first Assistant Secretary of the Export and Veterinary Services Division, Ms. Nicola Hinder, stated, I'm happy to be able to provide you with details for the number of animal welfare incident reports that were lodged in 2020 and 2021 and talk about those in the construct of what they are on a proportionate basis. So these details came through just a few days ago. The department reports that across export establishments with an on-plant vet, there was an average of 316 incident reports raised annually across 2020 and 2021. So presumably over 600 reports. So where are these reports? The government clearly has them to hand. The department has reviewed them. So either the government wants to release the details of these reports, wants to show its commitment to transparency and accountability, or it doesn't. What, what is it about these documents that you're trying to hide? Could it be that there are incidents detailed in these documents that reveal more horrifying incidents of animal cruelty in our abattoirs? It seems likely, but we won't actually know until they are tabled. And sadly, this is part and parcel of this government's hostility to any form of transparency in animal welfare. No matter what animal it is, what industry it is, um, and we know what's happening in live export ships. We know that in 2019, this parliament passed draconian ag-gag anti-protest laws that targeted activists who have bravely sought to uncover evidence of vicious animal cruelty at agricultural facilities and on farms. And those laws were designed to protect big agribusinesses from scrutiny and transparency. They were an absolute shame. 
And more recently, we have seen the removal of independent observers from the expo live export ships. There hasn't been an observer on a ship since June 2020. And the government blames COVID, but we know that animal welfare is never a priority for them. In fact, their mates in the live export industry have been pushing for the program to be rolled back. We know, we know, Minister, that you lot really don't care about animals. You don't see them as sentient beings, just as commodities to be made a profit of. And that's why, that's why the Greens have been pushing for some time now for an independent office of animal welfare to take it out of agriculture, where there is a massive conflict of interest, where that department supposedly have a remit of protecting animals and looking after their welfare, but then also making mega bucks off them. And we know what wins out every time, making profit at the expense of animals wins out every single time. And now we have this big inexplicable shameful delay in the tabling of these critical documents relating to animal welfare in abattoirs. So I do call on the government to urgently provide the documents for the sake of transparency, for the sake of respecting the order of the Senate, and above all, for the sake of the poor animals who have suffered and whose suffering must not be kept a secret. Thank you, Senator Faruqi, Minister. Uh, thank you, and, and my, again, I apologise to Senator Faruqi and uh, to the Senate. Uh, my advice is that, consistent with the response that was tabled on the 17th of February uh, 2022, documents within the scope of the order are still being assessed by the Minister for Agriculture and Northern Australia. Thank you, Minister. Are there no further speakers? I've put the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move to taking note of answers. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Cash and Mackenzie to the questions asked by Senators Sheldon, McAllister and myself. Uh, can I begin by acknowledging that the people of northern New South Wales and South East Queensland again today face a very dire flooding situation? I think all of us uh, just are just shaking our heads at the fact that, particularly in northern New South Wales, the very same communities that were badly affected by floods only a month ago are now facing evacuation orders again uh, because of uh, the flooding that is occurring there right now. Uh, we have seen over the last few weeks some extremely unusual weather systems and highly unusual levels of rain, and it is tragic. Uh, that people are being put through this situation yet again when they are still in the process of cleaning up from the last floods, let alone beginning the job of rebuilding. So I'm sure I speak for everyone here today when I pass on our very best wishes and solidarity with uh, the people, particularly of northern New South Wales, but also South East Queensland, as these floods progress. And we do hope uh, that people remain safe and listen to all of the warnings that are issued by authorities. Today, in question time, we asked a series of questions uh, to Ministers Cash and Mackenzie about the, the way the government handled last month's floods. Uh, and looking back on it, it's very sad that throughout those floods and in the weeks afterwards, we saw all the worst qualities of the Morrison government and this Prime Minister on display. People being abandoned in their hour of need by their federal government a government and a prime minister that was completely missing in action as the floodwaters rose, as they receded and as the clean-up began. And, true to form, the politicisation of grant payments by a government during a natural disaster. I mean, we've become used to this government rorting every possible funding program that can get its hands on, whether it be car parks or sports rorts. Uh, every other kind of rort under the sun, but to see a government politicise uh, the allocation of grant funding uh, based on colour-coded spreadsheets uh, in the natural disaster is a new low even for this government. Now, I know we've heard members of the government object to Labor describing this as politicisation, and I can hear Senator Macdonald doing it now. 
Well, if Senator Macdonald and her colleagues don't like listening to Labor politicians describe this government's behaviour as politicisation, perhaps they'd care to listen to some of the people from their own side of politics, such as New South Wales Upper House member Catherine Cusack, who announced that after a distinguished career in the New South Wales Parliament, she was going to resign because of what she called, and I quote, the Prime Minister's unethical approach to distributing flood funding. And what she was referring to was the fact that the National Party held electorate of Page, which did suffer extremely bad flood damage. Uh, that electorate and the communities in it were receiving higher levels of disaster assistance than those communities who were equally affected uh, a little bit further up the road uh, in the elect Labor held electorate of Richmond. A New South Wales Liberal MP describing the Prime Minister's approach as unethical. And that was backed in by the National Party state member for the seat of Tweed, Mr Jeff Provost, uh, who labelled the Prime Minister's behaviour as disgusting and deplorable. And he went on to say that he would struggle to vote for the Prime Minister. So park to one side whatever anyone from Labor might be saying about the way this government has handled these floods. Let's just listen to some of the local members who are actually from the coalition. But more importantly, let's listen to people who are on the ground. And I can tell you, having been in Lismore through the floods, and I know Senator Macdonald didn't think I should be there, uh, having been in Queensland floods for over a week, uh, I can tell you that people in Lismore did feel abandoned. Because the question that I was asked most often by people who were suffering from the floods in Lismore was simple. It was, where is the government? Because during the floods, in the immediate aftermath of the floods and in the clean-up from the floods, there has barely been a member of this government present or barely an official of this government present lending a hand to people who had suffered terrible damage, who had lost loved ones. They were exhausted and yet they were left there on their own to clean up by this government. And of course, we've seen this before. It is a disgrace, Senator McCarthy. We've seen this before because this is a prime minister who went missing in action after the bushfires, who didn't bother ordering vaccines, who didn't bother ordering rapid antigen tests, and of course is only discovering cost of Thank living you, as a problem Senator in the run-up to an election. Has expired. Senator McDonald. Thank you very much. Uh, I will be Senator Watt will be amazed to hear me be in, uh, in agreement with him of the terrible catastrophe uh, that has been the flooding in southern Queensland and northern New South Wales. Uh, you'll find no argument from uh, anybody in this place that what has happened, uh, particularly in Lismore, that has been described as like a tsunami had been through there, a uh, township where there is still no power and the, and the businesses are boarded up uh, because they will not be able to be repaired uh, for months. Uh, you know, who knows how long that process will take as business owners decide uh, what, what uh, situation they're in and what position they will take. Uh, where there are still thousands of people displaced from their homes. Uh, and yes, as the rain falls now, uh, what a worrying situa situation that is for them. However, to say that the government has been absent uh, to try and link uh, this to uh, other political agendas is devastating, on top of the natural disaster, to then have their issues politicised in this way is incredibly unfortunate. Uh, I have seen uh, so many of our uh, ministers and, uh, and other government members um, show their support, both physically and in any way that they can. Uh, I applaud Senator Watts' decision to go to Lismore uh, because you know, that is the sort of help that Australians give to each other and that the community, as the floodwaters rose and there was no way for government officials, for uh, the NBN, for um, anybody else to enter that region because the roads were cut, because the, the weather was so heavy that even uh, well, it was Life Flight, Life Flight from Queensland, who had the only suitable helicopter with the suitable infrared uh, detection to be able to detect people in roof spaces and to be able to pluck people off roofs. Uh, this is the sort of equipment that was required in that that time, and you know, my my th sincere thanks to the members of Life Flight who had to 
oversee that particular uh, mission. Um, so members of the community, people who had jet skis and kayaks and other boats, they turned to help their neighbours as Australians do in the immediate aftermath or during a disaster. During a disaster. And I think we should be acknowledging uh, that community help and then what happened in the days afterwards. Uh, as uh, I know, government services who spent days in, in motels just trying to be able to get physical access into some of these regions. Uh, the army who was on the ground uh, who didn't have the benefit of some of the organisation they might have had from, say, the Brisbane City Council, who was able to mobilise hundreds of, of workers to get out and take photos and document the places where the army needed to be. Remember that the Lismore town, the council workers had lost their homes. There, there was not a, a connection of of uh, resources and support, like in Brisbane, where a portion of the town had been flooded, all of Lismore had been flooded. And to say that the government's response uh, does, was not adequate does not absolutely understand that. Uh, the Prime Minister in the weeks following had COVID. Uh, the opposition leader had gone to Western Australia, but the community kept going and government services poured in. Uh, and as part of that flood response and recovery, there has been uh, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in, in uh, support, financial support, uh, in the army, uh, nearly a billion dollars in services that have gone into that region uh, in cleanups and pickups. But this is a one in 500 year disaster. And the local member, Kevin Hogan, the member for Page, has lived through the trauma of his family, his friends, as well as the people who live in his community being without a home, without a business, and yet others on the other side seek to make this a political issue rather than do what Australians do best, which is pull together, support those people, uh, drive additional uh, resources as they are identified. Uh, I, I, I I think that we should be thinking more about the people who are in such desperate stances and how we can assist rather than how we seek to criticise. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Deputy President. The people of northern New South Wales and South East Queensland have been devastated by extreme flooding and rainfall over recent months. And this disaster is continuing. As we meet here today, People in Korokai, Lismore, Tumbulgum, Billy Nudgel, Mullumbimby, Kyogle, Mwoolumba, Kondong, all subject to evacuation orders and warnings. These floods have caused the destruction of property and, tragically, the loss of life. Tens of thousands of people have been forced to flee their homes. And the damage caused to these communities is actually difficult to adequately describe. These communities cannot be left on their own. I do know these communities well. I was born in Moolumba in the hospital, and I was born there in a flood. And yes, flooding is a fact of life for people in the northern rivers. There's something in the name that gives you a clue that there might be a bit of water about. But these natural disasters are becoming more severe, and we should be better prepared for them. This is not what the Morrison government has delivered. The floods that struck the region last month had a very personal impact. Uh, at first, I was stranded there with my mum and dad in the midst of that emergency, although fortunately, I really should say, in a safe location. Sadly, so many others in my communities were not so lucky. A week later, I returned to assist with the clean-up and met with locals. Many people have commented on this, but it was evident in Lismore uh, that the community spirit was overwhelming. Volunteers had set up community centres. They were incredibly well organised. Young people were fronting up with brooms and gloves and mops. People were preparing food. Emergency services and frontline workers were working around the clock. And I can't thank all those people enough for everything that they were doing then and everything that they continue to do. But on that visit, there were plenty of tears. Uh, the damage is enormous. I think it's difficult to imagine what it means to lose your home 
and to lose your place of work. There is nowhere to go. This community is resilient. It is caring, but it is a community that has been through a lot. People have lost everything, and they should not have to beg for support. And that support should not depend on whether they are in a National Party seat or a Labor Party seat. Locals are hurting. Our candidate in Page is a man called Patrick Deegan, and he said this, I've seen the pain and desperation in people's eyes. I've heard the stories of loss, shock and helplessness. The people of the Northern Rivers need to know that the government has their back, that there is a plan, that they are not in their own. Now, I hear people in this chamber say we shouldn't be discussing it in these terms, that it's not proper to point out where government has let people down. But when an announcement is made for support for some communities in a National Party electorate, but not for other communities, then we actually have a problem with the way that support is being administered. And the truth is that on the ground, people are saying that they feel abandoned. Flood victims across Queensland and New South Wales say this. They feel that they've been left to fend for themselves in the immediate response to the flood and now in the recovery as well. And it was made worse by the fact that when the Prime Minister finally travelled to Lismore, it was for a photo opportunity and not to meet with the flood victims who wanted to know why his government had abandoned them at a time of desperate need. My friend Janelle Safin, the local member, lost her home. She was forced to swim for her life through Lismore's floods and she has continued to work tirelessly for her community. She's continued to show up every single day. And this is Janelle Safin. This is her putting her community first. And there are so many more like Janelle who've been doing what they can to support their communities. And this is what leadership look like. It means taking responsibility when things are tough. And these communities are in desperate need of government support. And the Prime Minister could learn a lot from representatives like Janelle. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I, I would like to start my contribution by expressing my deep concern and my sympathy to um, all those communities in northern New South Wales and South East Queensland who have suffered and who are continuing to suffer from the disastrous floods. Lives have been lost and I express my sincere condolences to the families and friends of those who have tragically died. I also put out my hand of support to Senator McAllister and her family, um, who are among many families from the northern rivers who are directly impacted and are suffering from these floods. I have at the moment a very good friend who's living with me because she was caught in the floods. She didn't lose her house, but everything else has basically been wiped out. She lived in a very small community called Crabs Creek northwest of Byron Bay. And when she sent me the video of the way that Crabs Creek had erupted into a horrendous flood, it was absolutely frightening. So while I am a senator for Victoria and I haven't yet been up to the northern rivers and, and southeast Queensland, I have seen and experienced firsthand the trauma that this has and is continuing to cause. I do want to reflect on Senator McAllister's words when she said it's some people will say it's not proper for us to make these political points in relation to flood disaster relief. And I will simply say, yes, Senator McAllister, it is not proper. Because first of all, in the distribution of some one point three three billion dollars which Services Australia has paid out in Australian Government Disaster Recovery Payments and Disaster Recovery Allowance, 
allowance to over 1.4 million people in urgent need in Queensland and New South Wales. I want to put on the record very strongly there is no differentiation as to where someone lives, whether they live in a National Party seat or whether they live in a Labor Party seat. Um, every single person who has suffered and meets the criteria is entitled to that payment. And I really re reflect on the experience that I had when I was supporting my local constituents in Wye River and Separation Creek after those communities were wiped out by a bushfire in 2015. And despite the terrible trauma that they suffered—116 homes were lost, miraculously no one died—and while I have been a, a fairly <laughs> continuing critic of the Victorian government, led by Premier Daniel Andrews, I did not see the politicisation of that natural disaster that I see now from those opposite. And I do say to Labor, it is so regrettable that you have stooped to such a low to so politicise a natural disaster. And I would please say, yes, there are people who are hurting. Yes, there are people who are angry. But for goodness sake, let us work together to support Australians in their hour of need. And for Senator McAllister to, to be quoting the Labor candidate, which is clearly all about politics, at a time when all of us need to be focused on those residents who are living in these areas who are thinking, where am I going to live? How am I going to earn a living? Um, where is my next night's accommodation? Um, we understand how, how absolutely devastating this is, but Australians don't need to be confronted with this low-level politicisation of a natural disaster like we have never seen before. And I have lived through, as we all have, many natural disasters and seen firsthand, whether it's Ash Wednesday, Black Saturday, Black Summer, the Wye River uh, bushfires, and, and really I just say to Labor senators opposite and to the Labor Party, please, you can do better than this. And to characterise the Prime Minister's <laughs> visit as a photo opportunity is just so revoltingly offensive. He met with many families behind closed doors. And I really say to Labor, please, at this time, let us work together to support those who need our help and just keep the politics out of this. Thank you, Senator Thank you. Henderson. Uh, Senator Chisholm. Uh, thanks, Madam Deputy President. And uh, my thoughts are also with those people who are being impacted by floods at the moment, particularly those who are facing it for the second time in a short period. Um, through my work as a senator for Queensland, <laughs> Uh, I went and visited uh, Gympie a couple of weeks ago, um, which itself had suffered its second flood this year. Uh, and the flood that they suffered just recently was actually their worst flood since 1890 uh, in a town that unfortunately does flood regularly. So um, I uh, got a sense from my visit to Gympie just the, those people who have gone through it a second time in such a short period and how traumatic that experience is. So I hope those communities are getting the support that they need. Uh, I did want to respond uh, around this claim of politicisation because I think this is important. Uh, and when you've got nothing else to say, uh, when your response is incompetent, all you have to rely on is claims of politicisation. And that's actually what they've come into this chamber and tried to defend it today. But it's because their lack of response. And the tragedy for the Australian people with this government is they actually are incapable of learning a lesson. Incapable of learning a lesson. And it wasn't us saying it. It was actually the National Party member for Tweed. It was actually a Liberal member of the Upper House. So they're the politicians, not us. And Senator McAllister, Senator Watt, uh, the excellent member for Richmond, all they are doing is their job of voicing concerns of local residents. That's actually what they were doing. And if it wasn't for the work that they were doing, adding voice to those people who were impacted, the government response would have been more lacking than what it was. That's how disgraceful that their efforts have been. So uh, the Liberal Upper House member, uh, Cusack, called it unethical. Uh, the member for Tweed, Jeff Provost, said uh, the government have really messed this yep. up 
This is like a remake of the bushfires some two years ago. So exactly the point that I am making was made by the National Party member for Tweed, who said that this government haven't learnt their lesson from more than two years ago when it comes to bushfires. And this is unfortunately Australians are having to put up with more of these natural disasters. We've seen it in Queensland. We've seen it in other parts of the country as well. And this is the problem with this government is that they actually are not learning any lessons. Uh, they are not actually getting better in their response. And then when they do respond, it's actually more political. Uh, so we've seen that now today, um, people in Gympie are getting $1,000 compared to people in Lismore getting $3,000 as part of the response. There are people living in tents in Gympie, same as they are in those other parts, months after this has happened, and the government are doing nothing for those people as well. Uh, so it is unfortunate that we've got, to make, uh, we've got to speak out on these people's behalf because the government don't listen, um, they're incompetent, they don't actually respond and fix these problems, and all too often their response is political. Uh, they get out the spreadsheet, they decide uh, where they give additional support uh, because that's how this government operates, that's how they've always operated. And unfortunately, the only way things are going to improve is if this government are voted out. That's the only way we're actually going to see some change. And it's an example of why they don't deserve to be re-elected, uh, because of their incompetent response to floods. Uh, it flows on from two years after their incompetent response to bushfires as well. So it is uh, evident for the Australian people now that uh, when it comes to disasters, um, the Prime Minister doesn't hold a hose, um, he doesn't respond, and the government have learnt no lessons on how to respond to that in government. Uh, we also know that when it comes to the crisis of ordering vaccines, the government again were all too slow to act despite saying we would be at the front of the queue. And again, over summer and in recent months, uh, when the country so desperately needed rapid antigen testing, again the government was missing in action. So it is actually an incompetent government. There are so many ways that that is uh, highlighted, uh, and all they can do is try and claim politicisation of issues. That's because they can't actually defend themselves. Uh, they are incompetent, and the only way this will be improved, because they've shown over almost 10 years now they don't learn any lessons, is if we vote them out. That is the only option left to the Australian people. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Watt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Wish Wilson. Rise to take note of the uh, non-responses by Senator Hume to my questions today on the bleaching of the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, I've been here for nearly 10 years, uh, Deputy President. I've consistently asked questions about the changes we've seen in our oceans as the Greens Ocean Portfolio Holder. I've chaired multiple Senate inquiries in the Environment, Communications and Reference Committee into warming oceans into the grant to the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. I've consistently asked questions and estimates, not just to changes we're seeing in the Barrier Reef, but off my coastline in Tasmania, indeed all around the country. Uh, and I wouldn't have believed 10 years ago if you'd sat me down and said, Senator, you're going to witness these changes. I wouldn't have believed you, even as someone who cared deeply about the oceans and someone who followed climate change so closely. I've asked questions at Senate question time now for 10 years. I've been laughed at when I've raised the issues that our oceans are dying. I've been told I need to get a hanky by the head of government business when I've raised the very first results of the 2016 mass coral bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef. And I tell you, Deputy President, it is hard today not to be filled with rage and despair at the response that I got from this minister to the fourth mass coral bleaching on the greatest natural wonder of this planet in the last six years. 
this bleaching in a La Nina year. God help us if the reef is bleaching in a La Nina year. We know from the IPCC science that on a business as usual scenario, our current trajectory, we are witnessing the terminal decline of not just the Great Barrier Reef, but many of our ocean ecosystems. This is a fact. The IPCC says that even on a two degree warming scenario, which is the current Paris Protocols, Kyoto Protocols, we are still going to see a 99 per cent decline in the coral cover on the Great Barrier Reef. That's on a 2 per cent scenario. We've already seen radical changes on a one degree of warming, one degree above pre-industrial levels. So imagine a doubling of that, and that's somehow a good result. All I want from this government is truth, no more denial. I would like to see them come out and say that climate change is the biggest threat to the Great Barrier Reef, and we know that climate change is warming our oceans, and what is causing that is predominantly the burning of fossil fuels. Why aren't we talking about this in here all day, every day? Why isn't it on the news? Why has it barely been reported? Why are we so distracted? with other things when our planet is changing before our eyes and we can act. But we will only act if people understand what's at stake. It's the only thing they will do to vote for change is if they know how serious this is. And it might beg a simple question. Why aren't we talking about this every day? Why isn't it in the news every night? Why do Labor and Liberal not talk about this issue? Well, the answer must be simple too. That is because they are complicit in the changes we are seeing on the Great Barrier Reef and in this ocean. We know we need to cut emissions by 2030 by 75 per cent to have any chance of even meeting 1.5 degree of warming. 50 per cent more heat stored in the ocean than we already have. And that's a 75 per cent emissions reduction by 2030. But what do we get? We get laughable targets from the two major parties that are worried about their own political fortunes and worried about annoying the hell out of their fossil fuel donors. It is not good enough. And I urge Australians to vote for the Barrier Reef, to vote for our oceans. Send the strongest possible message this federal election that whoever forms government needs to act. The strongest possible message you can send is to vote green. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Furibanti Wells, were you uh, seeking the Yes, I was on call? notice no, of motion. Sorry, sorry we I do need to put the question. Uh, the question is that we take note of the answers uh, from Senator Hume to questions from Senator Wish Wilson. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Uh, now we will. Are there any notes of motion to be given for another day, Senator Firavanti Wells? Thank you, Mr. President. On behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I give notice of my intention at the giving of notices on the next day of sitting to withdraw business of the Senate notices of motion number numbers one and five for 13 sitting days after today, proposing the disallowance of the Australian Citizenship Special Residence Requirement Instrument 2021 Therapeutic Goods Standards for Human Cell and Tissue Products Donor Screen. Screening requirements, Order 2021. Thank you. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senators Canavan and Dunham from the 28th to the 30th of March. 2022 for COVID-19 medical and quarantine reasons, for Senator Molan for today for personal reasons, and Senator Zantek and Rennick for the 28th of March 2022 for personal reasons. Thank you. Uh, Senator Urquhart, I'll, I'll just put the question. The, uh, 
The question is, that be agreed to? Does that opinion say aye? Again, say no. The ayes have it. Senator Eckert. Thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the leave of absence. There being no objection, leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators. Senators Stirl, Polly and Carr for 29th and 30th of March for personal reasons and for Senator Green from the 28th of March to the 18th of August for personal reasons. The question is, that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. Senator Kim or Senator Wish Wilson? I'll just quickly um, do this if I might. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator thank Kim. you, President. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Waters for the 28th to the 30th of March for COVID 19 related reasons. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Wish Wilson. Yeah, President, is this where I withdraw a motion? That's Yes, please. Go ahead. Yep. Um, I seek leave to withdraw motions uh, un under my name and Senator Rice in reference to Foreign Affairs, Defence, Trade and Reference Committee, Mr Julian Assange. There, uh, is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you, Senator McKim. Clark. Uh, Mr President, postponement notifications have been lodged in respect of general business notices 1319 postponed to the 9th of May and 1317 postponed to the 30th of March. And committees have lodged extension notifications as shown in item 10 of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, we will move on. The Senate will now proceed to the consideration of a condolence motion relating to former President of the Senate, the Hon. Michael Eamon Bean, AM. I call the Acting Leader of the Government in the Senate, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. And I seek leave to move a motion relating to former President of the Senate, Michael Bean. There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Cash. Thank you. And I move that the Senate expresses its regret at the death on 30 January 2022 of the Hon. Michael Eamon Bean AM, former President of the Senate and former Senator for Western Australia, places on record its gratitude for his service to the parliament and the nation and tenders its sympathy to his family in their bereavement. Thank you. Senator Cash. Is anyone seeking the call? Senator Cash. Thank you. Mr President, we pause today to commemorate the life of the Hon. Michael Bean AM, former President of the Senate and Senator for Western Australia. Michael was a proud Western Australian, an intelligent and accomplished parliamentarian and a true Labor statesman, committed to the finest traditions of the Senate and to public service. Michael Eamon Bean was born in London in 1937 to Father Francis and Mother Grace. He won a scholarship to the Salzian College in Battersea, where he completed his schooling and worked briefly as an insurance clerk before migrating with his family to Australia at the age of 17. That was in 1954, and Michael soon commenced work as a process worker at the Australian Electrical Company in Perth. Completing an apprenticeship as an electrical fitter Michael went on to work as an electrician for some 10 years, including for his own small business as a contractor. During this time, Michael also undertook three months of compulsory military service, serving with the 13th Field Squadron of the Royal Australian Engineers. It was not long before Michael returned to further his education, undertaking study at the Leadable Technical College and subsequently at the Claremont Teachers College and the University of Western Australia. He attained a Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Education and Diploma of Education. His education served him well, and he went on to teach and lecture across economic psychology and education, but not before marrying Jenny Aitken, with whom he had two children. Michael became active in the teachers' union, joined the ALP in 1968, becoming president of the Bunbury branch of the party from 1969 to 1972. A move to Melbourne in 1974 saw Michael engaged as part of a three-person team 
to set up the Trade Union Training Authority. He served as the authority's WA director, which in turn would provide Michael exposure to the Labor Party at a national level during his six years at the helm. Michael won the ballot for the position of WA State Secretary of the ALP, becoming a member of the national executive of the party from 1981 until 1992. He also became a national vice president of the party from 1986 to 1989, as well as serving as a regular national conference delegate for Western Australia throughout the 1980s and the 1990s. Those familiar with this period of history in Western Australia would recognise that Michael Behan played a pivotal role in the 1986 state election, as well as the federal Labor election campaigns of 1983, 1984 and 1987, when, of course, Michael himself entered the Senate to serve under Prime Ministers Bob Hawke and Paul Keating. Upon his election to the parliament, Michael brought with him 50 years of lived experience traversing trade, education, civic service and party leadership. This was all complemented, of course, by the perspective of having been a first-generation immigrant to this great nation, having spent the first 17 years of his life in England before embarking, like so many post-war migrants of his generation, in search of a better life in Australia. It was perhaps this broad and extensive life experience that helped Michael perfect his craft in this place. He brought an enthusiasm with him to the Senate, undertaking to advance the ideals for which he proudly stood. In the Senate, it was clear Michael did not simply wish to be a representative who spoke to fill the silence, but opted to speak if his words added to the debate. As a backbencher senator, Michael delivered powerful contributions on industrial relations, as well as speaking on issues on education, the economy and electoral matters. To the latter, Michael served diligently on the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters from 1987 to 1994. On 1 February 1994, Michael was elected unopposed as president of the Senate a position he would hold until his departure from the parliament in 1996. During his time in the Senate, Michael thought deeply, not only of the political ephemera of the day, but upon the enduring role of the institution of the Senate in Australia's democracy. In his final address to this chamber, Michael reflected on how his views of the importance and purpose of this place had transformed throughout his parliamentary career. As Michael described it, he had initially held a fairly sceptical and dismissive view of this place when he was first elected in 1987, describing himself as no enthusiastic supporter of the very chamber over which he would eventually preside as president. This scepticism, however, stands in some contrast to the reflections Michael delivered in his valedictory remarks nine years later, in which he surmised, I do have greater respect for it as an increasingly effective and necessary check on the power of the executive, any executive. I believe the Senate is developing and refining its role as a house of review, and that while petty politics frequently distract it from an effective use of its powers, much useful work is done in scrutinising and critically appraising the decisions and activities of government. It is a rare but worthwhile exercise for senators to routinely challenge ourselves on what the Senate means to each of us. During his time as president, Michael also led a number of delegations overseas and effectually used the position to provide access for Australian officials to high levels of government overseas. Michael was a deep thinking man who polished his craft as a parliamentarian and deftly performed his duties as president to raise the decorum of this place 
and the standing of Australian governments on the world stage. Following his departure from the Senate in 1996, Michael married Margaret, quite literally the day after he left the Senate. He went on to be elected as director of the Pharmacy Guild of Australia, representing the interests of independent community pharmacists to government and other community and private organisations. In this role, Michael advocated for the expansion of pharmacy businesses to encompass the provision of health advice and health-related services. He continued to serve his community as a member of the board of a local community centre, as chairman of a research and advocacy group and chairman of an advisory committee managed by Monash University. In 2011, Michael was appointed a member of the Order of Australia for his service to the Parliament of Australia, particularly as a senator for Western Australia, and for his service to the promotion of international bipartisan political debate to the pharmacy profession and to the community. We can all draw strength and encouragement from Michael's diverse and significant contributions to public life and his posture towards the challenges of our time. On behalf of the government and the Australian Senate, I extend our sincerest condolences to Michael's family. Senator Keneally. Thank you very much, Mr President. I rise on behalf of the opposition to express our condolences following the passing of a Labor comrade, the Hon. Michael Eamon Behan, AM, former President of the Senate, at age 85. As I begin, I wish to convey the opposition's condolences to his family and friends. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the uh, acting leader of the government, Senator Cash, uh, for her contributions today. I thank the Bean family the on as well and the Honourable Gary Gray, AO, Australian Ambassador to Ireland and personal friend of Michael, and members of the Western Australian branch of the Australian Labor Party, particularly John Cattle and Mar Marcel Anderson, for their thoughtful consideration, advice and anecdotes about former Senator Bean. Eleven years ago, the Australian people recognised the contribution of Michael Bean by admitting him as a member of the Order of Australia for service to the Parliament of Australia, particularly as a Senator for Western Australia, to the promotion of international bipartisan political debate, to the pharmacy profession and to the community. At his funeral in Melbourne on Tuesday 7 February 2022, former Senator Bean was described as a genuinely good and kind man. For a kid who played and swam, at Collymore Harbour and attended Loretto Abbey School in Dockley, Dockley, he would rise to great heights. His career was varied. He was an electrician, a teacher, a union leader, and a secretary of the Australian Labor Party in the state of Western Australia. In 1987, he became a senator for that state, which culminated in his role as president of this chamber until he left politics in 1996. Former Senator Bann was a true Labor man and a great Irish Western Australian, and through all of this he remained good, gentle and kind. Michael Behan was born in London in 1937 and his early years were not easy. The impact of the Great Depression was still being felt. Then the Second World War came with constant bombings, including of his family home. As a consequence, the family decided to move to Ireland. Former Senator Behan often spoke of his teenage years as a time of joy. He immersed himself in Irish culture, and he became a true lover of his father's native country, especially of Yeats' poetry and Joyce's prose. In his adult life, he returned to Ireland often. When the Bean family decided to migrate from Ireland to Australia, former Senator Bean was 17 years old, and it was time for him to think of the future. In 1954, after disembarking a migrant ship at Fremantle, he found work at the Australian Electric Company in Perth manufacturing electrical equipment. And following his apprenticeship as an electrician and his introduction to trade unionism, he became increasingly interested and concerned about workers' rights and workplace safety and was determined to do something about it. In his 20s, he decided to return to formal education. He first attained an arts and education degrees from the University of Western Australia and became a secondary school teacher in the regional town of Bunbury in Western Australia. 
It was this combination of factory floor background, trade qualification, union membership and teaching that led Mr. Bean to becoming the first ever education officer of the Trades and Labour Council of Western Australia. This initiative underpinned the establishment in 1975 of the Australian Trade Union Training Authority, known as TUTA, funded by the Whitlam government to provide education and training programs for union officials. TUTA was a project of Labor Minister Clyde Cameron, and former Senator Bean was a devotee of its mission. It not only sought to educate union officials on the basics of organizing and representing workers, but greatly improved the training of officials by including courses on governance and running a business. In addition, its emphasis on extending professionalism extend to appearance, style, and language. It was the importance of image and presentation that former Senator Bean carried into his later role as a party official preparing candidates for election. And former Senator Bean was instrumental in guiding the establishment of TUTA as a statutory authority in every state and territory and became its first director in Western Australia. And it was through TUTA that he also learned the importance of training and organization to keep unions relevant in an ever-changing world. He was also attuned to the need for political action to ensure the rights and well-being of working men and women were protected. Now, Michael Bean's move to the political wing of the labor movement occurred in 1981 when he became the General Secretary of the Western Australian branch of the ALP. This was a significant time, as Senator Cash notes, to be involved as a party official as success occurred at a state and federal level. Former Senator Bean led Labor's successful election campaign to win government at the state level in February 1983, and a few weeks later, Labor won the March 1983 federal election, installing Bob Hawke as Prime Minister. Former Senator Bean would go on to oversee Labor's successful state re-election campaign in WA in 1986, as well as the local contribution to further federal success in 1984 and 1987. These elections saw Labor in Western Australia address the lack of women in state and federal parliaments, with a record number of women from Western Australia elected at both state and federal levels. I'd like to think that Mr. Bean would be a little bit delighted that two female senators were leading his condolence today. And while Michael Bean was a champion of women be elected, being elected to parliament, and his record reflects this, he was not a supporter of affirmative action or quotas, an issue at which he was at odds with his party. Michael's enduring political legacy during his time as party secretary was the modernization of Labor's political campaigning infrastructure, practice and culture in Western Australia. He brought a greater professionalism to campaigns, seeing the value in modernizing local and regional organizational structures and training campaign workers. His vision was to ensure that those who followed him would be best placed to steward his party forward. He adopted new ideas and technology from overseas, and he created a culture of campaign innovation, which deployed political imagery and themes, communicated with new tactics and methods. In the 1980s, these ideas were new and novel, and those who worked alongside him at all, time became, all, the, all the time became used to his organizational motto of crisp, concise, and contemporary. This became the campaigning hallmark of New Labour under Tony Blair in Britain, but its origin was very much in former Senator Bean's thinking 40 years ago. He further introduced wage equality for political workers and party staff, becoming the first to champion pension payments and equality of reward and opportunity for female staff. And the party adopted his approach to campaigning and organization nationally. And by 1993, Bean was the chairman of the Australian Labor Party's National Campaign Committee. And that year, under Paul Keating, Labor won a federal election victory many had dismissed as impossible, the victory for the true believers. Michael Bean won election to the Senate as the Senator for Western Australia at the simultaneous dissolution of 1987 and was re-elected in 1990. His principal participation in parliamentary proceedings focused on those areas with which he had the deepest affinity, industrial relations, working conditions, education, the economy, and electoral matters. And his contributions to committees were significant. Perhaps unusually for a senator, this included pivotal roles on two joint committees, often maligned by believers in the Senate's institutional independence, 
By contrast, he saw them as beneficial as a result of their breadth of representation and broad perspective. He served on the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters from 1987 to 1994, bringing his expertise as a party official to the fore. He argued in support of measures such as the total ban on broadcasting of paid political party advertisements and the full disclosure of political donations as, quote, vital to the integrity of the political process. He also served as the founding chair of the Joint Standing Committee on Corporations and Securities from 1991 to 1994. This committee had significant oversight of the Australian Securities Commission, the predecessor of ASIC, but it also operated in a vastly different corporate law environment compared to what we know today. It's easy to forget in the 1990s were a highly significant time in the evolution of this area of law in Australia, and Michael Behan was one who pushed for a thorough redrafting of the corporation's law. The states and the Commonwealth have been attempting to find ways to create uniform corporations law since the Second World War. They were rebuffed by practical limitations, technical defects, and the High Court, which found the Constitution limited the capacity of the Commonwealth to legislate, and saw, so the law remained the domain of the states. Finally, the impetus for reform reached a stage where the input and the hard work of many, including parliamentarians like former Senator Behan, gave birth to the Corporations Act 2001, which remains the overarching law governing companies in our nation today. Former Senator Behan was also adept at internal labor politics. He helped to found, found the center faction, focused on policy, neither right nor left politics, genuinely looking to balance the party. And the center faction played a critical role in the success and stability of the Hawke and then the Keating governments and their reforms, which started 30 years of continuous economic growth. Now, Michael Bean, having been leader of the federal parliamentary, having been a leader in the federal parliamentary Labor Party, became the 19th president of the Australian Senate on 1 February 1994, succeeding Kerry Sibra. As the Senate's presiding officer, he improved the actual working of this chamber, and his reforms continue to today. It was during his Senate presidency that changes to the committee system came into effect that sought to make committee membership and chairing arrangements more closely to reflect the party representations in the Senate. This was the beginning of the legislative and general purpose standing committee system, incorporating the examination of estimates that we recognize as still being in operation almost continuously since that time. Michael Behan might be described as something of a convert. Like many of his generation, he was skeptical of the role of the Senate due to its role in precipitating the 1975 constitutional crisis. But he came to recognize its essential role as a check on the power of the executive, as he said, on any executive. He particularly enjoyed the challenge of administering the parliamentary departments and working with the parliament's highly skilled and varied staff. Former Senator Behan was acknowledged by Gareth Evans, a fellow Labour senator and one of Australia's most significant foreign ministers, for his personal warmth, charm, and is an outstanding character who contributed to the opportunity, wealth, and humanity of Australia. The role of the President of the Senate enabled him to become a global ambassador for Australia, something he'd not previously contemplated, despite his active work as a member of both the Senate and Joint Standing Committees on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade, with a particular interest in trade and human rights. He became the Australian Labor Party's international secretary, too, and that allowed him to ca train campaign workers for social democratic parties all over the world, including Malta, South Africa, Vietnam, and Fiji. In Malta, he campaigned for the election of George Veya. It was clearly a successful campaign. Veya went on to become deputy prime minister, minister for foreign affairs, and in 2019, president of Malta. It's worth noting that in recent days, the Labor Party in Malta just won its third consecutive term in office. And here in Australia, Michael Behan's legacy lives on in Malta. In South Africa, he campaigned during the first post-apartheid post elections, supporting the election of President Nelson Mandela. And this role also provided some unusual opportunities. In 1995, the General Secretary of the Communist Party of Vietnam visited Australia to coincide with the accession of Vietnam as the seventh member of ASEAN. This was the highest ranking Vietnamese figure to visit Australia to date. Prime Minister Paul Keating hosted a reception at the Lodge, and the General Secretary from Vietnam expressed a desire to meet his counterpart 
in the Australian Labor Party. The then National Secretary of the ALP was 37-year-old Gary Gray. He was concerned that he might not fit the profile of what a general secretary from Vietnam might expect in his counterpart, and so Gary sent Michael Behan in his place. <laughs> it's understood that Michael was well received, and Australian Vietnam relations today remain strong. Michael Behan's parliamentary career was cut short uh, when he uh, did not uh, win re election in the March 1996 campaign. The constitutional architecture, however, that governs the Senate placed him in an unusual position of continuing to serve as the President of the Senate even after his term ended on the 30th of June 1996. And he remained in office until the Senate met in August to choose Margaret Reed, the Senate's first and to date only female president as his successor. Following the conclusion of his political career, former Senator Behan settled into Melbourne and devoted much of his time to the community. His endeavours included fighting for housing projects, for, and for democracy, and for an Australian republic. And I know from our colleague in the other place, the member for Wills, Mr Peter Khalil, who was former Senator Behan's local member, just how valued he was in the community. He also acted as a government relations and strategic policy consultant for the Pharmacy Guild of Australia. And the Rudd Labor government asked him to chair a review of political governance aid between 2008 and 2009. As in all his life, he dedicated his energy for good causes, even writing a letter to the editor of the Age newspaper in Melbourne just a few weeks before his death in January, making arguments for Republican presidential models. Michael Behan lived a real labor life committed to community and committed to causes. He was the epitome of politeness, a popular identity in the Senate, and someone who always worked in support of the team. From London to Dockley, from Perth and to eventually to our national capital, he remained a good, gentle, kind, and decent man. He was also someone you could trust. He would straight up tell you if he was not going to back you, and would not hold it against you if you were not going to back him. He will be greatly missed. Michael is survived by his wife, Margaret, his brothers, Terry, Peter, and Frank, by his first wife, Jenny, and his children, Daniel and Kate. The opposition again expresses our condolences following the passing of Michael Behan, and we again convey our sympathies to his family and to his friends. Call the Deputy President, Senator Lyons. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise on behalf of uh, WA, the WA branch um, to put on the record uh, my contributions to the condolence motion to former Senator and President of the Senate, Michael Behan, and I wish to associate my comments with those of uh, Senator Keneally and Senator Cash. M I knew Michael uh, really as a party member and someone who was active in the party. Um, and I, I knew, obviously, he was a senator, but my, most of my association was in uh, work with him as, um, as a member of the party and an active member of the WA Administrative Committee and the, the National Administrative Committee. So Michael joined the party, as we've heard, in 1968 and was active in the Bunbury branch. And he took that branch from a fairly moribund branch to an active branch. And I'm pleased to say he really uh, worked to increase the membership and revitalise the sorts of activities members got involved in. And I'm pleased to say that that activism of the Bunbury branch continues today under the stewardship of um, Don Punch, the local Labor member down there, and I've certainly met with the branch on, on many occasions, and uh, they are still an active branch, and I think they would be pleased to know the history of that branch as being um, revitalised by uh, Michael Behan. Michael, as we heard, has had retrained re as a teacher. He became an educator and he first worked with the WA Trades and Labor Council, now known as Unions WA, as a trainer. And he was a part of a three-person committee that established the Trade Union Training Authority, which um, 
was an amazing um, establishment, and I'm sure Senator Urquhart, like me, uh, as a union official, I attended courses um, at Tudor in Audbury, Wodonga, and certainly Michael Behan was uh, part of um, the, the group, the small group that established the Trade Union Training Authority. And I'm sure there's other people in this place, apart from Senator Urquhart and myself, and in the other place who also attended Tudor. And it was a very sad occasion um, when it was you know, uh, defunded and, and, and became lost to the trade union movement. Um, so in about 1981, as we've heard, Michael became the secretary of the WA Labor Party, and it was in this role that I uh, certainly got to know him more closely and in his role on the national executive. Um, certainly, Michael was pivotal in Labor winning the state elections, as we've heard, in 1983 and 1986. And it was probably in 1986 that I got to know Michael. Um, and of course, that followed with the federal campaigns that we won from WA in 83, 84, and 87. Now, as history shows, and I believe Senator Cash and Senator Keneally have remarked, but I lived through these times. These were heady days for the Australian Labor Party, very heady days uh, indeed, and some that those opposite uh, like to refer back to and try and still uh, tarnish us with uh, in this modern day of politics. Um, but uh, they, were, they were heady days uh, for the Australian Labor Party. <clears throat> and I have to say, in all of the time that I knew Michael, he was very gentle. I don't think I I cannot recall a time that I ever saw him raise his voice or indeed lose his temper. He was a, a very calm influence and a very good secretary to have, have at the helm uh, of the Labor Party during those years. Um, as we've heard, in 1987, Michael was elected to the Senate, and um, during his time in the Senate, he continued to pursue his passions on industrial relations reform, working conditions, education, the economy and electoral matters. Michael was also passionate about peace, something he and I shared, although we were from different arms of the party. Um, we, could, um, we certainly had a peace activism and nuclear disarmament as something that we shared together. And of course, he was also passionate about native title. Um, in 1994, Michael was elected president of the Senate, and I must say it's with great pride that as I walk backwards and forwards to my office each day, that I often look at that um, portrait of Michael, and uh, it is the Michael Behan I remember and recall. He did, doesn't didn't look any different in that to the Michael Behan that I um, that I recalled. Um, so he uh, continued on in that role, and as we've heard, he made great reforms um, to the Senate in the role of president. Indeed, even though he was somewhat cynical when he was first elected to the Senate, he became a great supporter. As we all do in this place, we are all fiercely proud of the roles that we play as senators in this place. Um, the WA Party, through its current uh, Secretary Tim Picton and the Assistant Se Secretary Ellie, Ellie Whitaker wanted me to put their remarks um, on the Senate as well. Um, so they extend uh, our deepest sympathy to the family and to indeed the friends of Michael Behan. And Michael, as we know, was a stalwart of the Labor Party, whose ongoing contributions um, continue to mean so much to us all. And um, WA Labor extends its condolences and sincere appreciation for the impact that Michael Behan made to our party and to Australia. Vale Michael Behan. I will just add a few uh, short remarks, and I also wish to uh, give my sincere condolences to the family of Michael Behan. Uh, Michael Behan was the fourth West Australian president of the Senate but the first at that point for 50 years. So it was a long time uh, between innings. Uh, his career as an electrician, uh, I understand, was cut short by an industrial accident in which he lost a finger. He actually began his pathway to the education system uh, and then uh, obviously to this place due to one of those uh, acts of fate that 
affect our lives seemingly in a terrible way, but in actual fact delivered Australia to our wonderful servant of this place. Uh, he was comfortably elected to the Senate from the fifth position on the ALP, ALP Senate team for the 1987 double dissolution election. Uh, and his views on the Senate changed over time. As uh, Senator Keneally noted, he said that the role of the Senate was increasingly important and was an increasingly effective and necessary check on the power of the executive, any executive. This perhaps can be contrasted with an earlier view that he had when he was a much more junior senator, where he said, and I quote, uh, about the Senate, and I quote, people speaking in empty changes, chambers, people's running around to bells like Pavlovian dogs, the constant repetition of quorum calls or divisions. So his views did evolve over time, as I think all of our views evolve over time about this place. And in becoming president of this Senate, obviously he played a significant role in lifting uh, the work of this chamber and enshrining the committee system, which we all know and value so highly. Uh, he was defeated in the 1996 federal election, contesting the third position, uh, only the third incumbent Senate president to be defeated at the polls. Uh, he relinquished the role in August 1996 when the new parliament met. Uh, one of his perhaps lesser known but key contributions post his Senate career was saving the bluestone lanes around his house uh, where he lived in Brunswick, Victoria, which is obviously something that all Victorians now cherish. Uh, in 2011, he was appointed as a member of the Order of Australia for services to the Parliament of Australia, to the promotion of international bipartisan political debate, to the pharmacy profession and to the community. I cannot think of a higher honour. Michael Behan AM was a conscientious servant of the Senate and his chosen political party who made a varied and constructive contribution to public life in Australia, both before, during and after his time in this place. And I would ask senators to join me in a moment's silent to signify assent to the motion. I thank senators. The motion is carried. And Are there any postponements and extensions? Clark. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. General Business Notice of Motion 1319 for today to the 9th of May and General Business Notice of Motion 1317 for today to the 30th of March. Committees have lodged extension notifications as shown at item 10 on the order of business. Thank you. I will now proceed to the discovery of formal business and I will proceed through these in a way that most assists the chamber. Uh, so we will start with Senator Wish Wilson, 1312 in your name. Are you ready to go with that one? Senator Wish Wilson. I am president. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1312 be taken as a formal motion. There being no objection, this motion is taken as formal. Senator Wish Wilson. I move Wilson. the motion. Question is that motion be agreed to? Senator Russ Minister. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Minister Ruston. Uh, while the government will not oppose this motion, we note that this project contains commercial and confidence information. The government will endeavour to comply with the request, but the documents requested will require assessment and redaction to ensure the sensitive information is not disclosed. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Uh, Senator Wish Wilson will go to 1313. Mr. President, I ask that general business under motion number 1313 be taken as a formal motion. There being no objection, it is taken as formal. Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, I move the motion. Senator Ruston. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. The government will endeavour to meet the tabling of the documents sought by the time specified, the 28th of April 2022. However, due to the range of documents, complexity of the information sought and the need to protect commercial and confidence interests, it may not be possible to produce all of those materials. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. 
Again, say no. The eyes have it. We will now move to 1320. But is someone going to move this motion for Senator Hanson? We might come back to that one. Uh, we'll move to 1322. Senator Thorpe. Senator Thorpe, you have the call. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1322 proposing the introduction of a bill be taken as formal. The question is uh, that, motion, that, um, that motion be taken as formal. There being no objection, it is so taken. Senator Thorpe. I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act relating to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and for related purposes. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Senator Thorpe. Sorry. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. Uh, Clark. No. Uh, the question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act relating to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and for Related Purposes. Senator Thorpe. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. There being no objection, leave is granted. We will now move to. Oh, sorry, Senator Thorpe. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. We'll now go to uh, business of the Senate, motion number six, in the name of Senators Thorpe and Cox. Senator Thorpe. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I ask that business of the Senate, notice of motion number six, be taken as a formal motion. The question is this motion be taken as formal? There being no objection, it is so taken. Senator Thorpe. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. The Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People is a non-legally binding resolution of the UN General Assembly. It sets out the rights of Indigenous people and the application of states' human rights obligations to Indigenous people. Australia supports the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and gives practical effect to the Declaration through programs and policies. Australia and many other states have expressed reservations due to the lack of clarity on the meaning and application of self-determination and free, prior and informed consent. I will put the motion. Those in favour say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells, close the doors, in fact. We are dealing with business of the Senate motion number six. Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Davey, tell her for the eyes, and Senator Roberts, tell her for the nose. There being 40 ayes, two noes, the question is resolved in the affirmative. I would ask senators to remain in the chamber. There will be further divisions shortly. However, uh, we'll go now to business of the Senate number seven uh, in the name of Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that business of the Senate uh, notice of motion number seven be taken as formal. If there is no objection, it is taken as formal. Senator Hanson Young. I move the motion. Minister. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. The government has been developing the biosecurity stewardship market since 2019, which has included the world first development of a mechanism to measure biodiversity. Following the introduction of this bill, the government looked to refer this legislation to the Rural and Regional Affairs Transport Legislation Committee, which the Greens did not support. This is a cynical last-minute attempt by the Greens to become relevant in this debate. The government remains supportive of an inquiry into the legislation by the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Legislation Committee in the next term of the parliament. The question is this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The... Division required. Ring the bells for... Four minutes.
One minute. Sorry, change that to one minute. One minute. Lock the doors. Ask senators to be seated. Question is that business of the Senate motion number seven be agreed to. Eyes are passed to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I point Senator McKim, teller for the eyes, and Senator Urquhart, teller for the nose. The result of the divisions is eyes 13, noes 26. Question is resolved in the negative. We will now move to, I'll just give Senator McKim a chance to get back to his place. Uh, general business notice of motion 1303. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I ask that general business notice motion number 1303 be taken as formal. Question is this be taken as formal? Those, uh, there being no objection, it is agreed. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I move the motion. Question is this motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is General Business Motion 1303 be agreed to. Ayes will pass to the right chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart, teller for the ayes. Senator Davey, teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 25, noes 27. The question is resolved in the negative. We will now move to uh, General Business Notice of Motion 1315. Senator Wish Wilson. President, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion number 1315 be taken as a formal motion. There being no objection, it is taken as formal. The motion. Minister Austin. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? No. Yes, for one minute. <laughs> Hundreds of submissions were received during the public consultation process on these matters, and without an, an unacceptable deviation of departmental resources, the department does not have the capacity to contact all of them to seek their permission to release their submissions publicly. The question is this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Four minutes. I've had a request for four minutes.
Lock the doors. Question is the motion be agreed to? Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart teller for the eyes and Senator Davey teller for the nose. The result of the division is ayes 27, noes 24. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. I will now move to 1320 in the name of Senator Hanson. Senator Hanson, you have the call. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion 1320 be moved in my name, please. Uh, are you asking for the motion to be taken as formal? Yep, there being, to be as a formal motion, please. There being no objection, it is taken as formal. Senator Hanson. I move the motion. Minister Ruskin. Um, which, uh, can I just uh, oh, clarify? Uh, is this notice of motion one three two zero? That is correct. Uh, yes, um, I seek leave to make a short statement. He is leave granted. Yes, leave is granted for one minute. Uh, the Minister, Health, Minister for Health advises that he is not aware of the existence of any such correspondence. I will now put the motion. Those in favour, say aye. Against, say no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors, and I'll ask senators to resume their seats. The question is: the motion be agreed to? Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Roberts teller for the eyes, and Senator Urquhart teller for nose.
There being three ayes, 34 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. And finally, for formal business, I will go, no need to run Senator Roberts. I will go to Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1323 be taken as a formal motion. There being no objection to this motion being taken as formal, it's agreed. Senator Roberts. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. Oh, I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Yes, for one minute. Thank you. We strongly reaffirm the safety of all COVID vaccines that have been tested, considered and approved for use in Australia. The TGA's robust processes make them one of the best medical regulators in the world. All COVID-19 vaccines have been vigorously tested and found to be safe and effective. Further, Australia has one of the highest vaccination rates and the lowest loss of life rates in the world. Question is, Senator Patrick. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. And my experience in relation to the COVID committee and Senator Gallagher is that if you simply ask her to put something on the agenda, uh, she will do so. And it seems to me that this uh, motion is irregular for that reason. Uh, I'm sure if you contacted the chair, she would uh, assist in having issues that you wish to have considered by the committee uh, brought to the fore. Question is the motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. Question is the motion be agreed to. Eyes pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Roberts, teller for the eyes. And Senator Urquhart, teller for the nose. There being five ayes, 34 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. I'll ask senators to quietly depart. That concludes formal business, unless you are participating in the urgency motion. And
I inform the Senate that at 8.30am today, 25 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator Rice proposing a matter of urgency be chosen. It is shown at item 13 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? Uh, I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. And I will give the call and I'll ask senators to quietly leave the chamber and I'll give the call to Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, thank you, President. And could you formally move the matter of urgency? Yeah, oh, yes. Um, I formally move that the Senate notes the urgency motion by Senator Ross. Please, um, that in the opinion of the Senate, the following is a matter of urgency: the mining and burning of coal, oil, and gas is the primary cause of global heating, and is causing more frequent and more intense floods heat waves, fires, and that to protect lives and livelihoods, no new coal, oil and gas projects should be started in Australia. Mr President, don't take my word for this. This is what the science tells us. This is what the IPCC panel of climate change experts, a couple of hundred of the world's most eminent climate scientists, tells us. It tells us that on our current trajectory, our business as usual scenarios, this planet is on a three to four degree warming trajectory this century. Entire parts of our earth, our home, will be uninhabitable at a three to four degree warming scenario. Not just because of drought and lack of rainfall, pests and diseases, but also because of extreme weather events. And when we think of extreme weather events, like the bushfires this country witnessed just two years ago, or the floods, the unprecedented floods we've seen on the eastern seaboard in recent weeks, but also in the oceans, the unprecedented heat waves we are seeing in the ocean that are destroying our beautiful and globally significant coral reefs, our seagrass beds right around the country, our giant kelp forests, changes in the ocean that have profound, profound impacts on Australian communities right around this country. And on the farming community who rely for their livelihood, and we all rely on the food that they grow. No one is more vulnerable than they are as an industry to our changing climate and to global warming. And the sole thing we can do, the most important thing we can do to reduce our emissions targets, our 2030 emissions targets in particular, is to stop all new oil and gas production, all new fossil fuel production in this country. But once again, don't take my word for that. Listen to the International Energy Agency, who said that 2021 was the year that we needed to leave all new fossil fuels in the ground and transition as rapidly as possible to 100 per cent renewables. But what do we do? What do we get from this government? Just today, we found that Mr Angus Taylor, the so-called Minister for Emissions Reductions, is bringing before the parliament regulations to give more public money to a fossil fuel project. They have given hundreds of millions of dollars in grants to fossil fuel projects at a time when we know we have got to be transitioning away from fossil fuels. Every time I talk to people about climate change, every time this issue is raised with me as a senator, whether it's with uh, Green supporters, whether it's with Labor supporters, whether it's with Liberal supporters, it doesn't matter. Every person I speak to, I highlight them the simple fact that climate change is actually not first and foremost an environmental problem. Nor is it 
an economic problem, even though it's caused by business activity, unregulated externalities from business activities. It is a first and foremost a political problem. Only politics can solve this. People can change their behaviour. That makes a difference. But it is a systemic issue that this place, this parliament, can help solve. We have more reasons than most to show global leadership on taking the climate action necessary to limit emissions and warming to 1.5 degree above pre-industrial levels. But what do we do? We do the exact opposite. We are a global embarrassment. We have been called out by the UN, by UNESCO, by countries all around the world, including our friends and allies like the United States, as being a global embarrassment on climate change. Not only a laggard, but we are deliberately undermining climate action because this politics in this place, the Labor and Liberal Party, are captured by fossil fuel interests. That's the problem. Until we clean up politics, we'll never fix it. So this issue has to be first and foremost on the minds of Australians when they go into their polling booth. They need to vote for climate action. They need to vote Greens. Uh, Senator McMahon. Thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak on this matter of urgency from the Greens. As always, the Greens over-exaggerate on climate change for their selfish political purposes. It is disgraceful, absolutely disgraceful, to politicise recent natural disasters and tragedies trying to political point score on the back of human misery and suffering. Shame, shame on you. Shame on you for doing that. That is just terrible. Um, if, we look, if we look at some of the claims that the Greens are trying to push, uh, they're claiming that climate change has caused the flooding that we've seen recently in eastern Australia. These claims just simply do not stack up. Um, the CSIRO, in their Climate Change in Australia report, showed that rainfall extremes in northern New South Wales have been only slightly above average, and for South East Queensland they have been average. We have rainfall records to back this up. The Brisbane River, for example, experienced a major flood last month, but there have been 10 floods that have been greater over the past 150 years. In fact, uh, dangerous floods have occurred in every Australian state over the last 150 years. And we can, we can name some of them. 19, uh, 1852, Gundagai in New South Wales. Uh, 1916, Claremont in Queensland. Uh, 1934, Melbourne. 1893, Ipswich, Queensland. 1927, Brisbane, Cairns, Townsville in Queensland. Uh, that, that 1927 flood, 47 deaths, 16 homes destroyed, an estimated £300,000 in damages. Uh, this was at a time when our population and value of property destroyed were far lower than they are today. Can you imagine the effects of that flood? today. So, and these are going back over 100 years, these floods. These are not a new phenomenon, as the Greens would have you believe. Now, if we talk about bushfires, the CSIR, CSIRO admits that there is no evidence linking climate change with, with bushfires at this stage. As they state in their Climate Change in Australia report, no studies explicitly attributing the Australian increase in fire weather to climate change have been performed at this time. Yet the Greens shockingly try and blame um, government policies on the deaths and destruction of property in fires. Now, all these, all these events are, are tragedies. I mean, it's a tragedy for someone to lose their life, their home, their livestock, their pets. In, in floods or fires, and we shouldn't be politicising and trying to score 
cheap points on the back of these tragedies. Um, but not, not all tragedies have an actual human cause that you can point the finger at someone and say, you did this. Um, the Greens try to. They point to the Prime Minister and, uh, and say, you did this. And that, that is just absolutely ridiculous. These are natural weather events. We have been having floods, fires, tsunamis, um, hurricanes, cyclones uh, for you know, as long as we've got records. And we can even point to these back before we had records. Now, if, um, if the Greens' outrageous claims were true, and, um, but they're not, they're absolutely not true, but if, they were, if, if we pretend for a second that they're true, their attempt to pin the blame on Australia for these outcomes is completely ridiculous and absurd. If we just have a look at what Australia does produce, we produce 6 per cent of the world's coal production. 3.7 per cent of the world's gas production and 0.6 per cent of the world's oil production. Even if Australia were to shut down all our coal, oil and gas tomorrow, it would make no difference to the temperature of the globe or any of the natural disasters that the Greens are trying to pin on it. Um, now, if we look at uh, carbon dioxide emissions by country, China accounts for 29 per cent, USA 14 per cent, India 7 per cent, Russia 4.5 per cent, Japan 3.4, Germany 2 per cent and Australia 1.1 per cent. In 2020, China emitted 13.8 gigatons of carbon dioxide and equivalent greenhouse gases. By comparison, Australia emitted 512 megatons. That's roughly 27 times less than China. In 2021, China was running 1,058 coal-fired power plants. That is more than half half the world's capacity. China's emissions have more than tripled over the pe previous three decades. They emit more greenhouse gas than the entire developed world combined. Yet the Greens want us to wreck our economy, to wreck our way of life uh, for the, the massive 1.1 per cent that we contribute. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do our bit in reducing all types of pollution. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm not just concerned about uh, you know, global warming, climate change. Uh, we've got a lot of other things to worry about, such as plastics in our ocean. You know, maybe the Greens could show a little bit of care for our oceans instead of banging on about what Australia does um, to the world's climate. Um, I can tell you that our little milly fluff of a percentage of emissions is not going to do a damn thing, even if we cut it to zero, to the effects of greenhouse gases on the world's climate. And as we can see from what's happening in Europe today, if Australia would stop mining coal, oil and gas, we would only strengthen countries like Russia that threaten to bully and are invading and killing their neighbours. Uh, Europe is currently paying Russia more than $1 billion a day for coal, oil and gas. Europe has re reduced its own gas production by 30 per cent over the past deca decade, while its consumption has decreased by less than 13 per cent. Europe has more gas reserves than Australia so its extra reliance on Russian gas is completely self-inflicted. This is why when Ukraine asked us for help, for us for help to fight Putin, this is why they asked us to send coal, not solar panels. Uh, Europe's dependent on Russian gas is partly because it has allowed Russian funding of anti-fossil fuel campaigns 
to remain unchecked. We have a lot of evidence that uh, Russian oligarchs are funding some of the um, anti-fossil fuel campaigners and the activist groups that are campaigning certainly overseas and even right here in Australia. Isn't it ironic that the Greens have a, a slightly well-hidden, dirty little secret? Their campaigns are actually helped by the funding Putin provides to anti-fossil fuel organisations. That's right, funded by Russia with love. Um, Senator Wish Wilson also talked about food. Well, if we look at food security, um, products of the oil and gas industries account for approximately 45 per cent of the world's fuel production, uh, food production. So um, you, we all know that, that urea, which is compo a composition of most of the fertilisers that we use in this world, um, comes from the oil and gas industry, that they want to stop. They want to stop this industry 45 per cent of the world's food production. So the Greens not only want us to freeze to death, they also want us to starve to death. And this will hurt the world's poorest nations. Uh, thank you, Senator. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today also to speak on the MPI that Senator Rice has put forth. And as most of us understand in this chamber, uh, but not all, I'm sad to say, climate change is one of the greatest challenges of our time. In Australia, we have indeed seen its devastating impacts, which have increased over recent years and even months in tragic fires, floods, cyclones and more. Here in the Labor Party, we've always been committed to strong action on climate change. You saw that when we were last in government and we committed to net zero by 2050, some seven years ago, which is, in Labor's view, an essential starting point. This is a goal that the CSIRO says will deliver higher wages and incomes and also for Australians lower power costs. Why? Because we know that renewable energy is in fact cheaper than bringing online uh, new coal or fossil fuel power. It's a goal that the University of Melbourne says will deliver 20 times greater benefit to the economy than any costs. It is a goal that is not only the right thing to do by future generations here in Australia and around the world, but it is also the right thing to do by our economic and social goals right now, today. But as the motion before us put forward by the Greens, which we don't support, um, seems to argue against. We need a real path to get there. We can't have passionate speeches. They're not worth much without discernible action and a real plan to get the job done. We want to see in our nation, and Labor has a plan for, job-creating investment, job-creating investment that delivers real emissions reduction. And this is a plan where we will need to bring the Australian people with us. I speak to many voters uh, in the course of the upcoming election about their desire to see real action on climate change. But I also speak to voters, the vast majority of voters, who aren't about to vote for a plan that's going to see them out of work and out of a job. That's why they have confidence in Labor's plan and Labor's approach on addressing action on climate change, because we know we can have a productive economic future and create a path to zero emissions by 2050.
50. We are in the Labor Party the only party that has a medium term commitment to get us to 2050 with that zero emissions uh, outcome. Its impact on the economy is properly modelled. That is how you get sustainable, enduring and long-lasting action on climate change, not stunt motions here in the Senate. Australia has the potential to become one of the world's renewable energy superpowers, but only if we have the leadership and vision needed to bring Australia together to seize the opportunities in front of us. This can't be about wedge stunts. It has to be about a real path for jobs, and that includes the jobs that exist in our fossil fuel industries currently. The Greens fail to note in their motion the ob obvious truth that changing where countries buy their fossil fuels from doesn't reduce global emissions one bit. We've seen this happen before with much of the offshoring that's already happened in Australia. We've seen jobs go offshore to countries with dirtier fuels, lower safety standards and lower labour standards. So we don't support the motion that's before us today, but what we do support is a strong plan, and Labor's put forward this strong plan that will deliver $24 billion in public investment to Australia's efforts to address climate change and energy transformation. Energy transformation of um, our coal and gas powered uh, electricity generation here in Australia. That public investment is absolutely critical to increasing the penetration of renewables in the electricity grid, and the independent modelling of Labor's plan shows that we can reach 82 per cent penetration of uh, that uh, uh, production of energy by 2030. That is, 82 per cent of our world's nation's electricity by 2030 will be renewable. We know that this transformation is already happening. Renewables and storage are already the cheapest form of new energy. We know that the international, the international outlook for coal is becoming uh, more constrained. And are ultimately the market and a commitment to global action will be the decider of timing of fossil fuel exits. But I have to say, the market is already deciding. 80 per cent of global GDP is already decarbonising. This has serious implications for our resources sector in coming years. And we will be here to support the sector to reorganise itself to create the jobs of tomorrow. We've got more than 140 countries worldwide signed up to the NZE 2050. But this government, Prime Minister Scott Morrison and his National Party buddies, like to pretend that the world won't change. They've got their heads well and truly in the sand. But the simple fact is, and Labor knows this, and we know that the Greens know it already, but they have to find a deeper way of politicising this to wedge the Labor Party. The Greens know, Labor knows, business knows, Australians already know that global capital is already moving. So here with Prime Minister Morrison, we have yet again a man without a plan, a Prime Minister without a vision and a path to get us to the future, get us to that better future that we all as Australians deserve. There hasn't been a new coal-fired power station built in Australia since 2009. And given 
how renewable energy generation is now, has now become dominant since then, the Labor Party doesn't see that changing. The Greens would have Australia exit coal and gas tomorrow, exit coal and gas but with no plan for workers, communities or our energy system. We are making those plans for that transition. The government tries to use taxpayer funds for coal-fired power stations that the market won't even touch. And Labor knows that this exposes taxpayers to a massive carbon liability. So here we are, with clowns to the left and jokers to the right, we have an opportunity here for solid, stable government that believes in real action on climate change. And we will have that opportunity before us at the next election. So we're confident in the way that we are taking our climate change policies out to the Australian people. They have strong support from business, strong support from environmental groups and strong support from the community. As we've seen uh, in the last two months alone, the closures of three coal-fired power stations have in our country been brought forward. And so with this election imminent, we're not here to uh, blame Scott Morrison and his energy minister for those closures. The fact is those closures have nothing to do with government policy. This is about the market operating. Pratt. Thank you. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, all I can say is, here we go again. The Greens, Labor, Liberal, Nationals seem to think that science occurs when someone says the words, the science says. That is a lie. That is a delusion. A dangerous lie and a dangerous delusion. Empirical scientific evidence, measured observations, decide science when presented within a causal framework that proves cause and effect. The Greens never present empirical scientific evidence showing cause and effect. So let's assess each of the Greens' statements and implied claims and the empirical scientific evidence that actually exists. Their first claim, global heating. Global atmosphere has not warmed since 1995 especially when you include analysis of natural El Nino cycles. No increase for 27 years. The longest temperature trend in the last 140 years has been 40 years from 1936 to 1976. 40 years of cooling. It was warmer by far in Australia in the 1890s and 1890s. I said 1880s and 1890s, far warmer than today. Today is now cooler than 97 per cent of the Holocene. That period of, of uh, Earth's history is the last 10,000 years since the last glaciers. No heating. That's the end of the story. No heating. End of story. But let's continue. They, they make a statement, the burning of coal, oil and gas is the primary cause. Well, human use of hydrocarbon fuels leads to the production of water vapour, H2O, and carbon dioxide. Water vapour has a net cooling effect on the planet. Human carbon dioxide is a plant food. It's essential for all life on this planet. It increases plant growth as it gets higher in the atmosphere. And it has a net cooling effect because of that on the, on the vegetation. Now, next question. Does human carbon dioxide affect the level of carbon dioxide in the air? That's fundamental. During the global financial crisis, we had, we had a natural experiment for the whole planet. We saw a 7% reduction in the level of carbon dioxide produced by human activity, industrial and transportation activity, yet the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere continued to increase. So we cut our carbon dioxide and the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere increased. In 2020, we had a second planetary experiment with the COVID restrictions. We had 
a bigger decrease in human carbon dioxide output, yet the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere continued to increase. Human production of carbon dioxide does not and cannot affect the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Full stop. Nature alone controls the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, regardless of what we do. Nature alone produces 32 times each year the level of carbon dioxide that we produce. Entire human activity is just one thirty-second of what nature produces. Nature produces 97 per cent of Earth's carbon dioxide every year. The oceans contain in dissolved form 50 to 70 times the carbon dioxide in Earth's entire atmosphere. Slight cooling in the ocean temperatures leads to absorption of carbon dioxide. Slight warming leads to release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Nature alone controls the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So let's have a look at some other statistics. Floods in Brisbane and southeast Queensland. The last 100 years, 100, 100 years, two major floods. The previous 90 years, nine major floods. In 1893 and 1841, far higher than any recent flood. In 1893, in the summer, Brisbane endured three floods within three months. Tropical cyclones, there's been no increase. There's been a slight decrease or flat in frequency and severity. Fires, similarly, today's fires are far less than in the past. Heat waves, much shorter, much cooler than in the 1880s and 1890s. Don't believe me? Go and see the Bureau of Meteorology, Bureau of Meteorology data. Next, reef bleaching. It's natural. It's record cooling in the southern Great Barrier Reef in June 2008 saw the coral bleaching due to record cooling. And it's caused by symbiosis in the corals. Who pays for these lies? The people of Australia, especially the poor. This is the Greens' lies are dishonest, treasonous, Thank you, and Senator a betrayal Roberts. of Australia and Australia. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Antic. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, here we are again in Groundhog Day. More alarmist rhetoric from the Australian Greens, who choose to take up the Senate's time moving a motion straight from the mouth of the child prophet of their climate cult, Greta Thunberg. A motion that is so out of step with the global crisis in Europe. A motion that would destroy jobs, industries and livelihoods all across Australia, and particularly in regional Australia. And what is most concerning about this is we know that if the election goes the way of Labor, there's more to come. We know that because this will be the ransom of the Greens to support the Labor government. Every bill, every motion, every vote will depend on the Greens' support. Now, petrol prices have risen dramatically following the breakout of war in Ukraine, with petrol prices climbing from $160 per litre in December to over $2 in March 2022, and there doesn't appear to be any sign of it slowing any time soon. Former US President Donald Trump was absolutely right towards, to work towards making America energy independent. He understood that like relying on foreign powers like Russia, China and the Middle East was not a practical long-term option. These are nations that do not have our best interests, and they don't have the best interests of the West at heart. Their values are not compatible with ours, and they remain, to remain dependent on energy in which they are involved is dangerous. Here in Australia, we're blessed with natural resources—oil, coal, gas, uranium. We have the resources to ensure Australia is less dependent on foreign powers. So why don't we do it? Because we're continuing to pander to nonsense like this. The Green Left's obsession with climate change is making this country weak. They have failed to grasp the importance of ensuring Australia's energy independence, as well as ignoring the fact that drilling can actually be done safely, efficiently, and it ensures that we remain precariously it ensures that we don't remain precariously dependent on other nations for our energy security. This is the same Australian Greens, by the way, who have so little regard for this country that they stand on a defence policy platform which seeks to reduce our defence spending. A platform, let's repeat that, a platform which seeks to slash defence spending at a time where the prospects of conflict are rising every single day. This is, this is a policy platform, listen to this, Senator Thought, you'll learn something, which seeks global cooperation facilitated by peaceful, non-violent conflict, which states that non-violent conflict, this is true, this is straight from their website, non-violent conflict resolution is the most effective way of promoting peace. Two fairly realistic prospects right there. I can just see it. If, they, if, if the Labor Party makes government, they'll make Adam Bant the foreign minister. They'll send him off. They'll send him off with his little hemp bag. 
They'll take him off and they'll take him down to see Putin. He'll sit there with Putin and Xi and they'll talk about peaceful solutions. It's hilarious. And when an unexpected crisis like Russia's invasion of Ukraine comes up, pressure is actually brought to bear on the international energy market. And it's Australian families who end up spending more on petrol and endure the tremendous financial strain. It's a matter that's lost on our friends across the chamber. That means Australians have less to spend on, on their groceries, less to spend on their, on their lifestyle, and it causes the economy, of course, to lag. And this is because, frankly, too many, too many in this place, too many in the community, are prepared to stand up to the petulant left. And one which, this, is a, this is a movement which has been telling us for the past 50 years that we're going to get a mass extinction episode in the next decade, one after the other. The Greens would rather have us dependent on China, Russia and the Middle East than energy independent. Now, despite Norwegian company Equinor having sadly been forced to pull out of drilling in the Great Australian Bight, there will be others that will seek to do so. And we should be ensuring that we allow every possible opportunity for them to do so. Rather than shamefully celebrating the bullying of these projects out of town, these green left activists should put down the French champagne, turn off the Tesla and stand up for Aussie jobs. What's important is that the Australian government continues to ignore the voices of the radical left and encourages companies to explore and drill the bight, which could still be, if we make it so, Australia's North Sea. So let's be clear. I'm happy to call for drilling in the Great Australian Bight. It should be explored, it should be grill, drilled and it should be used safely for the greater Australian good. Not left on the shelf to aid and abet the phony crony capitalists in interests of our strategic foes like the Chinese Communist Party. Australians need to reject the false prophets of green politics. And the same applies, by the way, to nuclear power. Because if the climate catastrophists are so concerned with carbon emissions, why not utilise an energy which is zero emission and energy efficient as a way of generating power? Because the science tells us it's safe. Remember the science? Could it be that following the science is simply a rhetorical sleight of hand to bully those into not questioning their ideology? We've got to take this opportunity to make the most of, of those opportunities that living in this country affords us and be prepared for crises like what's happening in the Ukraine as they arise. We're blessed to live in this country. Its natural resources are plentiful, and yet we continue to ignore what's available on our doorstep to appease the climate cultists. And like Australia, the US is languishing under increased fuel prices due mainly to its energy dependence under President Biden, who could have kept the Keystone XL pipeline project alive, which would have seen almost a million barrels of oil carried from Canada to Nebraska in one single day. Construction of the pipeline had been revived by President Trump after being cancelled by Obama, and then it was only to be cancelled by Biden again. And look what's happened. As usual, this kowtowing to the Green Left leaves the West and countries like the United States in far more vulnerable position for the non-existent greater good of fighting climate change, while they continue to completely ignore countries like China and India, which pollute far more than any Western country. And how often is the extreme left going to beat the drum of climate action in this country? No emissions reductions will ever satisfy them, because if they admit there's nothing more to talk about, they admit that Australia is doing its fair share, then their political relevance drops away. This country has, in fact, as we have said so many times in this, in this chamber before, both meet and beaten its 2020 targets. Emissions are 20 per cent below 2005 levels, which was the baseline for the Paris Agreement, and emissions have fallen faster than many other comparable advanced economies, outpacing reductions in the United States. The latest projections show Australia is on track to reduce emissions by 35 per cent by 2030. And yet it's still not enough. It'll never be enough. It's like green activists aren't actually interested in the environment. It's just their job-destroying ideology. The invasion of Ukraine has meant that Western nations are thoroughly distancing themselves from Russia, which has meant that a large portion of our oil must either be sourced from elsewhere or from inside our own borders. China has been spouting concerning rhetoric regarding Taiwan for some time now, and the day may soon arrive when there is an attempted invasion. And we have to ensure that we're self-reliant. We have to ensure that we're not dependent on other countries whose values do not align with our own. And, we, and, and it's time to stop pandering to the ideological left. There's no good reason for Australia not to be far more energy independent. If we prioritise our long-term national security, not to mention our economy and the well-being of the Australian family, then there's really no other option. So I say, let's start drilling the bite. Thank you, Senator Antic. Senator Watt. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. 
Uh, I rise to oppose this motion, uh, which is yet again another green stunt. Um, I suppose we are drawing the end of this parliamentary sitting, and every week of this parliamentary sitting has been characterised by green stunts, so why would anything uh, change now as this parliament comes to an end? Climate change is a real issue. Uh, we are feeling it, we are seeing it, we are experiencing it every day uh, right now. Um, as we speak, uh, northern New South Wales is flooding again. Uh, South East Queensland has had heavy rainfall. We see heat waves, we see bushfires more often and uh, of more intensity. And all of the scientists tell us that uh, unless if we take serious action on climate change, the situation will get worse, with more natural disasters more frequently and more intensely. So climate change is a real issue, and it is one that the parliament should take seriously, and it is one that, as a country, we should take action uh, on. But the way to deal with it is through a real plan that has been thought through, that has been costed, that has mod been modelled, uh, which establishes exactly what needs to be done in the most effective, most efficient way, and that is the plan that Labor has put forward. Um, Labor has put forward a comprehensive plan, as opposed to the Greens putting forward a three-line motion. That's the extent of the Greens' plans for, deal with, to, for dealing with the very real chain, uh, uh, challenge that we have around climate change. So it is only Labor that has a real plan to deal with the challenge of climate change. On the one hand, uh, we have the government, which doesn't even believe in climate change if you just scratch below the surface. We have had a lost decade under this government of action on climate change, where we've seen temperatures increase, we've seen sea levels rise, we've seen natural disasters become more frequent and more intense, with no action and simply denial from this government about the need to do anything. And finally, when they were dragged kicking and screaming to committing to net zero emissions by 2050, all they had to back it up was a flimsy booklet marketing man style from the Prime Minister, uh, which relies on technology that has not even been invented yet as its way of getting to net zero by 20, uh, 2050. Their policy is a complete joke. Uh, it has more holes in it than a piece of, piece of Swiss cheese. And the reason for that is that they don't fundamentally believe that climate change is a real risk. What they do believe is that they are now in danger of losing seats, particularly to independents in, in Sydney and Melbourne. That is the only thing that has prompted the government to even come up with a flimsy booklet that relies on technology that has not yet been existed. So that's the government's position. And on the other side, we have the Greens, who argue that we should and can exit the use of coal and gas tomorrow. And that's what this motion goes to. They have no plan for the workers who would be affected by that. They have no plan for what that means for the energy grid. They don't recognise um, that until we do have renewables at scale, we will continue to need coal and gas to back up our electricity system. That's just a reality. Um, and unfortunately, the Greens are denying that reality. They, and they, they have no plan for what happens to workers, the energy grid, or people's ongoing need to use electricity. It, it also, the Greens' plan, does nothing about the fact that other countries continue to consume coal and gas, continue to mine it, continue to supply it and continue to use it. Um, so even if we did follow the Greens' motion, it would do absolutely nothing about the rest of the world's use of coal and gas uh, and, in fact, would probably see uh, dirtier resources being used rather than those that are produced in Australia. So in contrast to both the Greens and the LNP, Labor is the only party that is taking a real plan to deal with climate change to the coming election. Our Powering the Nation uh, policy, which we launched at the end of last year, uh, will create jobs, it will cut emissions and it will cut power prices. They are the things that we need to do as a country, both to tackle the economic challenge that we have uh, around our future energy sources, and that is the policy that will deliver real change and real action on climate change, not stunts like this from the Greens party, uh, three, three, three sentence or, or three line motions that will do nothing to actually fix these problems, that won't deliver cheaper power, that won't reduce emissions, and certainly won't look after people's jobs. So, you know, I'd encourage the Greens to reflect on their behaviour and the way they approach this issue. This is a significant issue. It deserves a well thought through plan, and that is not what the Greens are offering us. Senator Thorpe. 
Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I've just come back from Larrakia country, Darwin, where I listened to and sat with around 40 traditional owners, senior law people and Jungais. They told me to give you this message. We need all of the governments to listen to us. We don't want no fracking in the Beetaloo. This is our land, our future, our water, our life. Auntie Nancy McDinney told me to tell you fellas to actually go to Borroloola, go drink their water, live like they live and go and give them what they need because none of you have. You all talk about it in here. None of you have been there. You get to sit here and make decisions for country you don't know and could never know or understand. Traditional owners do not want fracking. Not now, not ever. Some of you probably have Auntie Nancy's paintings in your offices, but when it comes to actually listening to what she wants for country and community, you're all of a sudden not interested. But you'll rave and rant about your dot paintings, I'm sure. Do not frack the Northern Territory. We also heard how the Northern Land Council is helping these mining companies like Santos and Origin destroy country and water. Both these companies had to be summoned to attend a separate hearing because they flat out refused to look traditional owners in the eyes in Darwin. Shame. Shame. Traditional owners told us that the Northern Land Council just refuses to hear the word no. Traditional owners have time and time again said no to fracking, no to destruction of country and heritage, no to the poisoning of water. The Northern Land Council is complicit in the lies that gas companies are telling our people. What's worse is that the NLC is meant to be protecting country and working with traditional owners. It's absolutely shameful and disgraceful and disrespectful. And the sooner that this parliament investigates the dodgy dealings of these land councils, the better. I say to these dodgy land councils, I'm watching you. Our people are watching you and we are coming. You are on notice. In conclusion, I would like to thank my colleague Senator Cox and Senator McCarthy, who sat with traditional owners, who were part of the story, who were part of listening, and how powerful it was to see three deadly, staunch black women senators sitting in front of them, genuinely listening to what they had to say and genuinely taking on their fight and their voice and bringing it into this place. Thank you, my sisters. Don't frack the Northern Territory. Respect the traditional owners. And again, if you have a dot painting in your office that you admire each day and you tell your family and your friends about, then maybe look at the story of that dot pointing, that dot painting. Because you're killing the people who painted them. You're killing the land of the people who painted them. You're taking their children and you're doing all you can to destroy everything that they are and everything that their country means to them. Give up your dot point paintings or don't frack the NT. It's pretty simple. So I urge all of you senators with the dot paintings to go back, have a look at them. If you don't take it down, I hope they haunt you. 
Senator Ayres. Well, if the Greens political party is going to treat this chamber like a sort of youth model United Nations, I'd, I'd prefer it if the, re if the motions were a little bit more interesting and original. Is nothing if not predictable. We got the we got the usual thundering speech. We got the usual thundering speech at the beginning from the barefoot investor, which is good for the social media posts. I get it, but it is a tired contribution from a party that looks and sounds exhausted. They have been in this Senate for 34 long years, and this is all that they have, and a record of zero achievement. A few decades ago, I suppose there was at least some energy to them. Perhaps they had enough of the old activists still around to put some fuel in their ideological tank. Instead, the party of protest has become the party of performance art and street theatre. They have lost their ambition. They have lost their drive. Now, this is all just about securing the little 10 per cent that each of them need to come back here. It keeps them occupied, I suppose. It's going to get better. Um, to turn to the substance of the motion, to turn to the substance of this motion, although substance is an optimistic assessment of what we have before us, Labor won't be supporting it. But that's a foregone conclusion. It was written so that Labor would oppose it. That's what it was for. So the Greens have something to share on social media, so they can continue to justify their position in this chamber. The Greens aren't actually talking to the communities that actually have to live with the consequences of their ideas. The Labor Party is the only political party in this country that's capable of enacting real action on climate change, because we actually come from those communities. Consider Labor's candidate for the Hunter, Dan Repicholi, who actually works in the mining industry. Dan Repicholi has a more sophisticated understanding of climate change and what action on climate change means for the Australian energy system than the entire Greens caucus combined, because he lives it, because it's his workmates and his family and his community who are in the middle of this debate. And as the future member for the Hunter, he will continue to fight for them and he'll continue their to fight for their future instead of treating this like a debating society. Now, I understand that it's attractive to have a fight between the Greens and the citizen scientists over here. You know, poor old Senator Roberts and now Senator Antic and some of these other characters who sit at home and twiddle the dials and fill out their own spreadsheets and try and work out what's really going on because the scientists must be, you know, conning them. Poor old Senator Roberts does it on the vaccines too. Well, actually there is a more serious issue here. It's a more serious issue that goes to the heart of how this country is going to deal with the failure of the last decade, the climate conflicts of the last decade that have left us stone cold motherless last, instead of leading in the world on these questions. Now, you know there is an alternative strategy. There is an alternative plan. Uh, there is an alternative strategy and there is an alternative plan. And you know what people should do? They should get behind it. You know, this resolution comes as the floodwaters are working their way through the Richmond River and Wilson River systems in Lismore. And families are once again facing up to the consequences there. We should not be ambulance chasing about these issues. We should be solving problems. After 34 long years, we've got to do better than this. There is an alternative plan, the Albanese Labor Plan, $24 billion of public investment, a fully costed plan, the most costed, effectively costed plan from an opposition in Australian political history, 604,000 jobs, five out of six of those jobs in the regions. By 2030, 82 per cent of the electricity grid from renewable sources. Power prices down, guaranteed. 43 per cent target by 2030. Net zero by 2050. A pathway to get there. Investment in manufacturing. Now, look, you can choose. My view, 
These people ought to get behind a plan that could actually work. Senator Cox. Thank you, Acting uh, Deputy President. I rise to make a contribution to this MPU calling for a moratorium on new coal, oil and gas projects. We are in a climate crisis. There is no way around this, and coal and gas are the leading causes of climate change. This is not just the opinion of the Australian Greens. This is actually detailed in the IPCC report. The science is perfectly clear, and every tonne of coal and gas burnt increases the intensity and the speed of the changes to the climate. Across Australia, there is a climate crisis. It's caused by mining and the burning of coal and gas. The continued mining and burning of coal and gas is causing more frequent floods, heat waves and bushfires that we are watching in real time. And unfortunately, it's costing lives. In my home state of Western Australia, we know this all too well. Over the summer, we experienced record-breaking heat waves and devastating bushfires. Those heat waves were both in Perth and in the Pilbara region, and we watched those bushfires in real time in the southwest. Parts of this beautiful country are now becoming unlivable due to the extreme temperatures, and, and I wish there were other senators that would have hung around for this detail. Because in Fitzroy Crossing in Western Australia, currently they experience 67 days over 40 degrees per year. If we are to stay on track with both the government and the opposition's policies, by 2050 they will be experiencing 155 days over 40 degrees, which is basically unlivable. We need real climate action now. We need real climate action, meaning phasing out coal and gas by 2030 and keeping climate-destroying coal and gas in the ground where it belongs. Real climate action means banning new coal and gas projects and stopping the gaslighting that is happening, the narrative, the false narrative that is being created by this government. Real climate action means protecting our environment for future generations, both mine and yours. So what the burning question here is what's stopping Liberals and Labor from taking action on climate change? Well, it's no secret that both the Liberals and Labor take millions of dollars of donations from coal and gas billionaires and big corporations. So this is for the folks out there watching, the Australian public. In fact, every budget, the government slips into the books more billions of your taxes earmarked for coal and gas corporations. From these tax breaks that they give to those billionaires and big corporations, they give handouts. They spend public money on making the greatest challenge that we face far worse by backing more coal and gas projects across this country. So you won't hear Labor criticise the Liberals' fossil fuel handouts, which is why it means only putting the Greens in the balance of power will stop pouring more fuel onto the climate fire. Dirty donations explain why the Labor Party is also giving the green light to climate wrecking projects like the one that's operating in my backyard in Western Australia, the Scarborough Project, on the lands of the Maroochydore people. The Scarborough Gas Project is a climate bomb and will create pollution that equals 15 coal-fired power stations every single year, and it's worse than Adani. In fact, it will be like Jukun 2.0. Now, this federal government and the state governments included claim that major oil and gas projects like Scarborough will create jobs. But what they won't tell you is that in WA, their workforce, um, in fact, does not create jobs for West Australians. They're better off literally supporting any, under, ever, any, any other industry because it's less than 1 per cent of WA's workforce. Political capture by the big coal and gas corporations through donations, through that revolving door of lobbyists and through job offers, their well-funded disinformation campaigns continue to see the Labor and Liberal parties throw money at their incumbent fossil fuel companies, all at the expense of slowing down that 
ever-present transition that we need to make. I'm proud to be from the only party who doesn't take money from the fossil fuel industry or big corporations because we won't take money from the Woodsides, the Rio Tintos of this world. The Greens have a plan for real action on climate change, but the only way we can do that is to kick the Liberals out and to push Labor, a Labor government further and faster on climate action, and it's a vote one for the Greens. A small change in a vote can put the Greens into shared power again so we can push Labor to go further and faster on tackling the climate crisis <laughs> and making those billionaires and big corporations pay their fair share of tax so that we can get money back into our community services where it's needed. The shared power, in shared power, we can tackle the climate crisis, creating hundreds of thousands of jobs and making those corporations pay their fair share of tax so we can create a safer future for all of us. We can power a clean energy revolution that, again, will create all of those long-term jobs, enabling our workers in fossil fuel industries to transition away from polluting industries. We know Thank the you, Labor Senator Party— Cox. Thank you, Senator Cox. Uh, the time uh, for this item has expired, and the question uh, now is that the motion moved by Senator Rice be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. Is a division required? Is, is a division required? Uh, a division is required. Uh, ring the bells.
Lock the doors. So the question is that, uh, arising out of the urgency motion, that the eyes should go to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Kim as teller for the eyes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the nose. Uh, order, there being eight ayes and 30 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Uh, yes, Senator Faruqi. Um, I seek leave to table a non-conforming petition to ban primate experiments. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you. I table a non-conforming petition to ban primate experiments. Thank you. Uh, Senator Rice? Conforming petition. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Rice. Thank you. I seek leave to ta I table a non conforming petition signed by 20,000 people to ensure that physiotherapy and allied health are covered for nursing home residents. Thank you, Senator Rice. Um, uh, Senator McGrath? Are we moving on to uh, the next section? Yes, I just wanted to, which is the document. Yes, so what I was going to propose to the Senate, uh, which the whips have agreed to, but of course it's in the hands of the Senate, is that we go through all of the documents that are listed uh, on the um, uh, Senate order of business, and that any you, that people want, senators want taken note of, we take note of, and any that you wish to speak to will go back to the beginning. So if we're happy with that, um, sorry. So we're dealing with the documents that are listed on pages 6 to 12 on today's order of business, and we'll start with any documents on page 6 that senators want to take note of. So we'll move along. Uh, we'll now move with. Uh, we we'll now deal with documents at the top 
of page 7, uh, ending in doc the documents listed as 15. No one wishes to take note of those. We will now deal with documents uh, tabled on the 28th of March, down to the bottom of page 7. Thank you, Senators. Uh, we will now move to documents listed on page 8, which starts at do a document listed as number 20 and finishes uh, with a document listed at number 30 under government docs. Thank you, Senators. We will now move to documents on page 9, which begin at document 31. Senator Urquhart. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I take note of document number 31 and 37 on page 9 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. No further documents on page 9. We we'll now move to documents listed on page 10. Thank you, Senators. Um, we'll now move to documents listed on page 11. Thank you. And we'll now go to uh, documents listed on page 12. Uh, starting at 42, ending at 44. Thank you, Senators. Um, and so we'll now move to item number 15, which is the tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. Senator McGrath. Uh, pursuant to order and the request of the chairs of the respective committees, I present reports from the Legislative Committees in respect of the 2021-2022 additional estimates together with accompanying documents. On behalf of the chairs of the respective committees, I present additional information received by the committees on their inquiries into the COAG Legislation Amendment Bill 2021 the Religious Discrimination Bill 2021 and related bills and the Social Media Anti-Trolling Bill 2022. On behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Corporations and Financial Services, I present the report of the committee on the 2021 annual reports of bodies established under the ASIC Act. On behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights, I present Human Rights Scrutiny Reports 1 and 2 of 2022. On behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Law Enforcement, I present the report of the Committee on Vaccine-Related Fraud and Security Risks, together with accompanying documents. On behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on the National Disability Insurance Scheme, I present the final report of the Committee on the NDIS Workforce, together with accompanying documents. On on behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on Trade and Investment Growth, I present the report of the Committee on the Prudential Regulation of Investment in Australia's Export Industries. I seek leave to present a delegation report. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you, I Senator McGrath. I present the report of the Australian Parliamentary Delegation to the 29th Annual Meeting of the Asia-Pacific Parliamentary Forum, which took place virtually from 13 to 15 December 2021, uh, and I seek leave to move a motion to take note of the document. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you. Uh, Senator Hanson Young was seeking the call. Senator Hanson Young. Oh, I beg your pardon. Have you got one more? Uh, I've got just two more. If I could just table. You, is that? It's okay, Senator Hanson Young, just for okay. tabling. Thank you. On behalf of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works, I present the committee's second and third reports of 2022. Pursuant to order and at the request of the Chair of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee, Senator Henderson, I present the report of the committee on the provisions of the Customs Amendment Controlled Trials Bill 2021, together with accompanying documents. And I also have another report that I need to seek leave to. Also, if I could seek leave yep. to present a delegation report. 
Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator McGrath. On behalf of Senator Fawcett, I present the report of the Australian Parliamentary Delegation to the 42nd ASEAN Interparliamentary Assembly, which took place virtually from 23 to 25 August 2021. I also seek leave to incorporate a tabling statement into Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I'll just move to Senator Urquhart, who's got two reports to table as well. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. On behalf of the Chair of the Finance and Public Admin References Committee, Senator Ayres, I present additional information received by the Finance and Public Administration References Committee on its inquiry into the Urban Congestion Fund. And um, on behalf of Senator Carr, I present the report of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs References Committee on family and partner reunion visas together with accompanying documents, and I move that the Senate take note of the report and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, I thought perhaps Senator Scar had to table something beforehand. Thank you. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, Madam Deputy President, I have, uh, on behalf of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit, I present this statement on the draft budget estimates of the Australian National Audit Office, the ANAO, and the Parliamentary Budget Office, the PBO. The committee is required under the Public Accounts and Audit Committee Act 1951 and the Parliamentary Service Act 1999 to consider the draft budget estimates of the ANAO and the PBO and make recommendations to both Houses of Parliament regarding these estimates. For this year's budget, neither the ANAO nor the PBO has sought additional funding. The committee therefore endorses both the ANAO's and the PBO's draft budget estimates. The committee continues to consider both offices vital in supporting the work of this parliament. The PBO's estimated expenses for 2022-23 amount to $9.253 million. Over the last year, the PBO has modernised its ICT environment, shifting to a cloud-based platform. This will have an ongoing impact on the PBO's budget, and the JCPAA will continue to monitor this over coming years. The ANAO sought and received, with support from this committee, substantial budget supplementation in the 2021-22 budget, along with additional funding to support the staged implementation of the auditing of performance statements in the Australian public sector. The ANAO's estimated expenses for 2022-23 are $90.462 million. In the last financial year, the ANAO reported an operating loss of $1.833 million, including through contracting costs to complete such audit work, investment in cyber resilience and investments in data analytics, technology and capability. I thank the Auditor General and the Parliamentary Budget Officer for their work in support of the Parliament and the JCPAA. And I also take this uh, opportunity to thank uh, Ms Lucy Wicks, MP, member for Robertson, who chaired the committee, and also Mr Julian Hill, MP, member for Bruce, who was the deputy chair. And I table the statement. Thank you very much. And uh, Senator Hanson Young. I wanted to go on to reports and government response. Oh, okay. So you didn't want to respond yeah. to that. Fair enough. Um, So I believe that we are now at the Standing Committee on Privileges for adoption. Yes, is that Senator O'Neill? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting oh, Deputy President. Um, and I wish to move a motion in relation to the 182nd report of the Committee of Privileges regarding a possible contempt. The report relates to the committee's inquiry into possible obstruction of the naval shipbuilding inquiry of the Economic References Committee. I move that recommendation one of the report be adopted. Recommendation one is that the Senate adopt a com the committee's conclusion that no contempt be found in relation to this matter. The inquiry was referred to the committee in June last year. The Senate required the committee to consider whether any conduct of the former Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds, or any other person amounted to an improper interference with the References Committee inquiry and, if so, whether any contempt was committed in that regard. 
The committee sought and considered submissions and correspondence from the References Committee, from Senator Patrick, from the late Senator Gallagher, from Minister Reynolds and Minister Payne in her capacity as Minister representing the Minister for Defence. Briefly, this matter relates to the References Committee seeking access to Australian industry capability plans which were relevant to the Naval Shipbuilding Inquiry. The References Committee made initial requests for unredacted versions of documents in February and May of 2020, which were declined by the Department of Defence in June 2020. The chair of the committee lodged a motion to order the Secretary of Defence to produce the documents to the References Committee. The Senate agreed to that motion on 6 October 2020, but then the Minister for Defence declined to provide the documents. The minister, in fact, made a public interest immunity claim centering on the commercial sensitivity of the documents. In November 2020, the Senate resolved not to accept the public interest immunity claim and ordered the minister to provide the documents to the committee. In response to this order, heavily redacted versions of the document were provided to the References Committee, including one document which was more heavily redacted than a previous version of the document actually released under the Freedom of Information Act. That document had already been published on the committee's website. I wish to make some commentary about the criteria for the finding of contempt. The first criterion the committee must consider under Privilege Resolution 3 is whether the conduct of officials or the ministers in withholding the documents could amount to a substantial obstruction of the References Committee performing its functions. The inquiry powers of the Houses and their committees are essential to support the Houses obtaining the information they require to effectively perform their legislative and accountability functions. It cannot be doubted that a committee being unable to obtain information at the heart of a matter referred to it for inquiry could substantially obstruct the committee in its performance of its duties. The second criterion the Privileged Committee, the Privileges Committee is required to consider is whether there is another more appropriate remedy available other than the Senate's power to punish contempts. The committee accepted that this power is undoubtedly a remedy available where a committee is obstructed or a Senate order is not complied with. However, as a matter of practice, the Senate has generally pursued political or procedural remedies rather than having recourse to contempt power. The committee considered the most obvious alternative remedy in this case was the provision of the documents to the References Committee on terms that allowed it to proceed with the inquiry. It therefore sought advice from Minister Payne and the Chair of the References Committee as to whether arrangements had been agreed to provide access to the documents on such terms. Negotiations for provision of the documents required by the References Committee were, to say the least, protracted. However, the References Committee ultimately reached agreement with the Department on appropriate arrangements for access to the documents. The final criterion the committee was required to consider relates to culpability and, in particular, whether any person alleged to have engaged in conduct which could constitute a contempt had a reasonable excuse for that conduct. However, the committee did not consider it necessary to evaluate the issue of culpability because of the conclusions it had reached in relation to the other criteria. Now, with regard to the findings of the Privileges Committee, the committee noted that ministers and public servants have a direct accountability obligation 
to the parliament. The government's own guidelines for official witnesses appearing before parliamentary committees state that they, and I quote, are intended to assist in the freest possible flow of information to the parliament. The intention of the government guidelines was not fulsomely adhered to in the initial responses by the officials to requests for information from the References Committee. While the committee acknowledged the public interest grounds raised by the former minister and maintained by Minister Payne, the harm, from the, public interest, the harm to the public interest would only have arisen from disclosure of the documents beyond members of the References Committee. Senate committees routinely handle sensitive information without unauthorised disclosure. And where there are particular sensitivities, committees often, often accommodate arrangements which provide added assurance that the confidentiality of information will be maintained. The committee noted its concern that officials were unable to expeditiously reach agreement with the References Committee to provide the information in a manner which allowed that committee to perform the inquiry delegated to it by the Senate. Let me be very clear. It should not require a reference of a matter as a potential contempt before officials reach a satisfactory arrangement to provide information relevant to a Senate inquiry on terms that protect any genuinely sensitive information. The behaviour revealed in this saga cannot continue. As the information has now been provided, albeit reluctantly and belatedly, the committee concluded that no minister or official should be found to have committed a contempt in this matter. In doing so, the committee recognised that the contempt jurisdiction is primarily a remedial jurisdiction which exists to prevent obstruction of the Senate, its committees or senators performing their functions. Accordingly, the committee has recommended that no contempt be found in relation to the matters referred. However, the committee cautioned that it cannot allow a creeping understanding that orders of the Senate or its committees may be ignored with impunity. The Privileges Committee has rightly been sparing in its recommendations that a finding of contempt should be made and reticent to recommend further penalties where contempt has been found. There should be no doubt that it will do so if it is necessary to resolve such matters without implicitly conceding an unfounded constraint on the powers of the Senate. In short, the committee considered these were matters which ought to have been promptly resolved through negotiation between committees and officials, applying the direction in the government guidelines for officials to assist in the freest possible flow of information to the parliament. Finally, the committee is concerned by the protracted delay in relevant information being provided to a committee inquiry by the Department of Defence. The committee therefore endorsed a recommendation of the late Senator Alex Gallagher that the Auditor-General be asked to conduct an audit of compliance with obligations to respond to the Senate and its committees in a timely and accurate manner. Specifically, the committee recommended that the ANAO conduct an audit of the Department of Defence and consider auditing compliance by other large departments. Such an audit would help to ensure that departments and agencies have a clear understanding of their responsibilities to parliament and processes which support them effectively fulfilling those responsibilities. I commend the report to the Senate. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator O'Neill be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Hanson-Young. Thank you. We're moving to documents uh, listed at um, page 12. Thank, thank you, um, Madam uh, Deputy President. Could I please seek leave to continue our remarks uh, for number eight on page 12, uh, the uh, Select Committee report into autism, uh, number uh, 12. Sorry, page eight on number 13. eight on page 13. Yep. Uh, number 12 on page 13. That's in relation to another. Uh, uh, reference to um, contempt of the Senate by um, an, a, a company uh, who refused to appear at a Senate inquiry 
and uh, number 16 on page 14 relating to job security, the Job Security Select Committee. Thank you. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Could I also add um, uh, number 24 on page 14 as well, and I also express interest in number 12 on page 13 and, and number 9 and 16. And, Asked to continue, seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, any other documents that senators wish to take note on, on those pages? No. Uh, Minister, you've got like 40 seconds. <laughs> I table a document concerning the order for the production of documents concerning Myanmar. Thank you. Yep. I seek leave to move a motion to appoint senators to a committee. Is leave granted? Uh, yes, leave is granted. Thank I move you. that senators be appointed to the Joint Select Committee on Parliamentary Standards as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. Thank you. Um, and lastly, the president has received letters nominating senators to be members of a. I oh, beg your pardon, we've done that. Um, okay, so the Senate will now uh, suspend until 8:30. Thank you, senators. Senators, I call the Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I table the budget statement for 2022-23 and other documents as listed on the dynamic red. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the documents. There being no objection, leave is granted. I move that the Senate take note of the budget statement and documents and move that the debate be now adjourned. I will put that question. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Minister. Mr President, I table particulars of proposed and certain expenditure for 2022-23 and seek leave to move a motion to refer the documents to legislation committees. There being no objection, leave is granted. Mr President, I move uh, that the documents be referred to committees for examination and report. Question is that be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. I table the portfolio budget statements for 2022-23 for the Department of the Senate, the Parliamentary Budget Office and the Department of Parliamentary Services, and I call the Minister. 
Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I table portfolio budget statements for 2022-23 for portfolios and executive departments as listed on the dynamic red. I'd hold the documents up, but they are too many to <laughs> physically carry into the chamber. <laughs> I propose that the question that the Senate do now adjourn. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And I rise to speak about an issue of great concern to the hardworking car dealers of Mercedes Benz and the car dealer network in Australia more broadly. The imposition of the agency model by car dealers Honda and now Mercedes Benz onto Australian dealers is a disaster for these local businesses who provide local jobs, apprenticeships, and community sponsorship. And of course, they pay their taxes. I'm in this place to stand up for fairness. Fairness in workplaces, fairness in our society, and fairness in business. The growing power and arrogance by large multinationals in Australia have found fertile soil in the government's stuttering actions to introduce fairness into our franchising sector. I particularly want to raise the issues regarding the agency model that have arisen since those initial hearings on the car dealership industry in Australia. Seven key assertions were made by the senior executives of Mercedes-Benz statement in statements to the Senate Education and Employment References Committee on the 24th of November 2020. Mercedes-Benz asserted that the dealers were happy with the proposed changes to the agency model that they had consulted widely with the dealers regarding the changes, that the agency model would be a win for dealers, that the reason Mercedes-Benz was shifting to the agency model was driven by consumer benefits, that dealer profits would not be impacted, that Mercedes-Benz was committed to the dealers for the long term, and that Mercedes-Benz would not profit from the shift to an agency model. I assert under the weight of current evidence that Mercedes-Benz appear to have misled the Senate committee. The dealer's detailed statement of claim uh, from the Mercedes-Benz dealer in their, dealers in their current court action instead pours water on those seven claims. The dealers were not happy with the proposed changes and in multiple meetings multiple meetings, they, they voted overwhelmingly not to proceed with the agency model. Mercedes-Benz did not consult widely with dealers. In fact, when dealers tried to negotiate some of the terms of the model, Mercedes-Benz issued a dispute notice under the franchising code. The agency model is not a win for dealers. If instituted, the agency model will cut the profitability of some dealerships by over 50 per cent. And the experience now that the model has been introduced has sadly lived up to those dire predictions. The agency model is not about consumer benefits. It merely is about ensuring greater profits in Stuttgart instead of main streets in suburban and regional Australia. Dealer profits will be impacted. Deloitte analysis said that the profitability under the new model would decline by more than 50 per cent. Mercedes-Benz wasn't committed to dealers long term. Dealers were issued non-renewal notices as a means of terminating their agreements. Mercedes-Benz will profit from the shift to the agency model. It will take profits out of dealerships and straight into the pockets of Mercedes-Benz. This is an extremely serious matter and begs the question, if Mercedes-Benz are willing to perpetuate untruths to the members of the Australian Senate, who else are they willing to lie to? These untruths must be called out in the public interest, in the interests of Australian businesses and Australian dealer networks. The Australian Senate must not be treated with contempt by large multinationals who are only concerned with extracting profit and shipping it offshore. I will be watching and given the seriousness watching developments and given the seriousness of my concerns I intend to take this matter to the Senate Education and Employment References Committee to request that it be raised with the President of the Senate as a matter of privilege. Thank you, Mr. President.
Uh, Senator Steele John, just to explain, Senator Mirabella was actually on his feet, but I wasn't sure if he was exiting the chamber or rising to speak. So I am going to give him the call next, and then I'll come to you, Senator Mirabella. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> I rise this evening to speak to this year's federal budget and a specific item contained within it, and that is the $1.6 billion for the vitally important Beveridge Interstate Freight Terminal, also known as the BIFT or the BIFT. Mr. President, I was honoured to have been present while the Treasurer delivered the national budget earlier in the other place. And this is a budget that I believe will be well received by the public because at its core, this budget is a blueprint for securing Australia's strong economy and safe and secure future. It is an investment budget. It delivers more jobs, more tax relief and, importantly, it invests in rail, roads and the critical areas of energy, defence and health to assist Australians facing the real challenges that we're currently living through. Mr President, infrastructure, rightly, is a major part of the budget. The Morrison government is investing a record $17.9 billion towards building new and upgrading existing infrastructure projects. This record adds to over $120 billion in the government's infrastructure investment pipeline that will be rolled out over the next decade. The coalition government has, since 2013, invested more than $35.5 billion in infrastructure projects in Victoria—293 distinct major road and rail projects. And currently, these projects support more than 11,500 jobs. Tonight, Victoria receives $3.3 billion in committed infrastructure funding. The Morrison government will get freight moving quickly and keep commuters safe while cutting down their travel times. Mr President, I'd like to speak to how the people of Melbourne's north and west will directly benefit from this. To the BIFT, what will it be? It is an intermodal terminal, a point of junction in our freight network that allows for the consolidation, storage and transfer of freight between port, road and rail. It will provide connectivity between the Port of Melbourne, Victoria's regional networks and, of course, north to Sydney and Brisbane. It will enable and maximise the benefits of that other great project, the Inland Rail, catering for double-stacked 1,800-metre freight trains. By integrating road and rail, freight will now travel directly from Melbourne's port to the terminal in Beverage, in Beverage without the need to put trucks on Melbourne's road. Simply said, it takes freight off our metro roads and onto rail to get it to its destination on time at a lower cost. In real terms, this will take 5,500 trucks off Melbourne roads per day. This will benefit commuters, especially those in the north and the west of Melbourne, who will no longer have to contend with large numbers of trucks clogging up their main arterial roadways. By easing this congestion, the people living around Kilmore, Wallen, Whittlesea and Truganina will get to and from work quicker. And this means working mums and dads will be at home with their children sooner and ultimately give them more time with what matters most, family. Mr President, I would now like to acknowledge a relentless advocate for this project and, more broadly, the people of the electorate of McEwen, in which the BIFT lies, my very good friend Richard Welsh who was the Liberal candidate for McEwen. Um, unlike the current ALP member, Richard, since being pre-selected last year, has tirelessly made the case for the interstate terminal to be placed in Beveridge to the north of Melbourne in the logical place between Melbourne and Sydney. He knows he sees that modernising our logistics network is a vital component that will underpin Australia's economic recovery. Uh, this this excellent project has faced resistance from the Victorian State Labor government. Uh, evidently, Premier Andrews and his ministers have not realised the tremendous potential of the BIFT. The state government has dragged its feet to assist with funding of this project, like many others, uh, um, and which have ignored the people of Melbourne's north and west. Not only will the BIFT alleviate congestion and improve travel times, but it will also address the conflicting land use between industrial and urban areas. The BIFT will contain an entirely new precinct to the north of Melbourne for working and living. 
The BIFT is a $1.6 billion commitment that creates jobs for the people of McEwen, gets freight off Melbourne roads, gets freight on rail efficiently and at low cost. It will Senator ease congestion. Senator Mirabella, your Thank time you, Mr. has President. expired. Senator Steele John. Thank you, Mr. President. Over the last four weeks, we have seen a full-scale humanitarian disaster unfold across Ukraine at the hands of a Russian oligarch and the military he controls. We here in Australia have seen devastatingly uh, in real time the effects of war relayed to us via the news and social media. Never before have the results of those who push for war been so accessible so quickly to those across the world. We are already seeing the generational scars that only wars can cause. The thousands who have died, the tens of thousands wounded, the millions who have been forced to flee their country and entire cities facing destruction at the hands of weapons of war put there by oligarchs who know they will never have to face the realities of what they cause. At home in Perth, I have seen people come together and rally behind the Ukrainian community. A few weeks ago, I attended a vigil uh, alongside uh, supporters uh, and those uh, with uh, family members living in Ukraine. I was struck by the amount of people, especially young people, who came out to show their solidarity. Our solidarity must go beyond just saying it, just saying the words. We in Australia must put into action serious steps designed to bring a peaceful resolution uh, to the conflict uh, that has already inflicted so much damage upon community and whose lives have been torn apart by the whims of a few Russian oligarchs and the militarism and colonialism that they pursue. And let me say again very clearly, Ukraine is suffering at the hands of militarism and colonialism, pursued by a tiny minority of those in Russia who have amassed incredible power. We must put this solidarity into action uh, by working uh, together as part of the international community uh, to call for an immediate ceasefire and withdrawal of all Russian troops and to end the violence and risk to life. We need a provision immediately of humanitarian aid and support that includes uh, food evacuation support uh, and other necessities needed to ensure survival of transient communities. States committing, particularly those states in Europe, uh, must without delay uh, commit to an urgent transition away from the use of Russian oil and gas. And let's place this in context. Russia has earned $119 billion uh, in revenue uh, in 2021 alone from the sale of oil and gas. This is a petro state and oil and gas is funding Putin's war machine. We also need to move immediately and globally for a program of debt forgiveness for Ukraine. Ukraine holds uh, more than $129 billion uh, in US debt and cancelling uh, this debt, particularly which uh, is owed to the International Monetary Fund and the European Commission, uh, will significantly aid in the country's future recovery. Increasing our uh, in humanitarian intake uh, via a special uh, intake of 20,000 people uh, would enable those who are fleeing the conflict to have a place to call home in Australia, as well as the immediate uh, offering of permanent visas for Ukrainian nationals or those on temporary protection visas. We must do all of this as well as continue to pursue uh, targeted sanctions on powerful Russian individuals who are supporting the invasion of Ukraine. This must be done with peace as the goal. As a global community, we have the opportunity to turn away uh, from the steps that will only work to to prolong the conflict and suffering and learn from history 
are the steps that must be taken to aid the Ukrainian people in recovery from this terrible uh, invasion, not simply uh, to line the pockets of weapons manufacturers and global energy companies. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I rise to celebrate the legacy of a particularly outstanding West Australian and Australian, the late Harold Clough. The Clough name is iconic in Western Australia and has been for more than a century. Harold's grandfather, William Clough, was an early mining entrepreneur who brought his family to the West in pursuit of the Kalgoorlie Gold Rush in 1900. John Clough, Harold's father, inherited an adventuring spirit and which took him to Gallipoli. He was awarded a Distinguished Conduct Medal, among other decorations, so clearly Harold came from a courageous and deeply patriotic tradition. Harold was born in Netherlands on 30 September 1926. He grew up during the Great Depression and the Second World War, during which he assisted his father in training the 3rd Field Regiment, WA's artillery unit. After leaving Scotch College in 1943, Harold took his first job as a junior clerk at AMP, but quickly changed to an engineering degree at the University of Western Australia. Despite being told by his professor that there was no chance he would pass, Harold ended up graduating with first-class honours and a few years later was accepted for a Fulbright scholarship to study at the University of California at Berkeley. It was in California that he met his wife, Marg, with whom he would go on to raise six children. After completing his postgraduate degree, Harold was offered a doctoral scholarship but instead returned to Perth, where he began a lifelong career as a builder, working with his father in the company he had set up in 1919, J.O. Clough and Son. They were integral to the construction of some of Perth's critical infrastructure in the post-war boom of the 1950s. In 1955, they secured the contract to build the National Mutual Life Association new WA head office, a 12-storey building and the highest in Perth at the time. Even better known and more significant was the Narrows Bridge, which finally linked the southern and northern suburbs of Perth across the historic Swan River. Upon completion in 1959, it was the largest pre-cast, pre-stressed concrete bridge in the world. Although Harold's father died just before it was opened, it stands today as a testament to the ingenuity of this father-son duo. Harold took on the business his father began and expanded it to new frontiers. Under his leadership, Clough built power stations, railways, jetties, pipelines, dams and even the Harold Holt Australian US Naval Base in Exmouth. Scores of buildings and facilities across Western Australia stand today thanks to Harold Clough. And Harold was a man who prided himself on marrying his business with service to Western Australia and the Australian community. In the 1960s, at a time when most Australian leaders were dismissive of Australia's place in Asia, his business ventures in Indonesia paved the way for stronger relations between Australia and our northern neighbours. Harold began the Clough Scholarship for Engineering students at UWA, served on the UWA Senate and made donations to many charitable causes. Perhaps the best way to illustrate how greatly appreciated Harold was by the community is to list some of these many, many honours which included the Queen's Silver Jubilee Medal in 1977, Officer of the Order of the British Empire in 1979, Officer of the Order of Australia in 1990, and the Sir Edward Weary Dunlop for improving Australian-Asian relations in 2005. Harold was not someone who was afraid to express his opinions and concerned himself wholeheartedly with the politics of his nation and his home state. He worked with former Liberal member for more, John Hyde, in establishing the Australian Institute for Public Policy, Perth's first free enterprise orientated think tank. This organisation would later merge with the Institute of Public Affairs. He also spent time as the President of the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Director of West Australian Newspapers Limited, and as a board member of the White Paper Advisory Panel on Foreign Trade for the Australian Government. In short, Harold Clough spent his life constantly servicing to, and striving to do more constantly supporting the West Australian community and his own country, Australia, pursuing meaningful projects and embodying the title of builder in every sense. When asked about retirement, he dismissed the notion and said, I've still got too much to do. As you get older, if you are busy and have a lot to do, you don't get time to die. I have too many things to do next month and I'll just have to put it off, he said. True to form, 
just days before he passed away on the 5th of January this year, Harold was working at his desk. His legacy lives on in his family and the countless contributions they have made. Western Australia is indeed a better place for his contribution. Fail Harold Clough. Deputy President, Senator Lyons. Thank you, Mr. President. Over 17 months ago, the, the northernmost region in Ethiopia, Tigray, was embroiled in a war that has led to massacres of civilians, destruction of hospitals and clinics, and an exodus of refugees and the emergence of famine. The region has been plunged into a human rights and humanitarian crisis. A member of my staff, <coughs> Niat, who is part of the Tigrayan community, tells me that her community particularly the youth, have been working tirelessly to advocate for their families. Due to the communications blackout, members of the diaspora have not been able to communicate with their family members. Niat says that even though there was a communications blackout, she tried to call her family every day in the hopes that she could hear their voices and to make sure they're okay. She hasn't heard from her family for 11 months. There have been many accounts of de Grayan people in Australia not having heard from their family members, only to find out that a number have been killed. The weight this has on the Australian de Grayan families is devastating. Researchers have estimated that as many as half a million people have died from war and famine in Tigray since November 2020. Millions of de Grayans are still going hungry. According to the World Food Programme, 80 per cent of Tigray's population <coughs> is food insecure. And three quarters of Tigray's population of six million are using extreme coping strategies to survive. What is clear is that the humanitarian situation in Tigray remains alarmingly dire and could further deteriorate if immediate action is not taken. Staff at Tigray's biggest hospital say that patients are dying due to lack of medical supplies. This means people with HIV, tuberculosis, <coughs> diabetes and cancer don't have access to treatment. In addition to this, women and girls have been subjected to sexual violence and then they're threatened to not seek medical care. The Amnesty International report titled I don't know if they realised I was a person, highlights harrowing details of survivors of sexual violence suffering from a number of medical complications. Out of the 198 hospitals and health centres assessed by the World Health Organisation, 141, almost all of them, were partially or fully damaged. Just one month ago, an Ethiopian government airstrike hit a school compound, hosting thousands of displaced Tigrayans in northwest Tigray. Human Rights Watch reports that 53 people were killed immediately. 15 of those were just children. Government airstrikes in Tigray rose in October 2021 and increased significantly in mid-December. These airstrikes that obviously target civilians have continued into 2022. For those that fled the region, now live in refugee camps in Sudan. They tell harrowing accounts of ethnic cleansing and crimes against humanity to human rights groups and diplomats. They're far from home, separated from loved ones, and pray that they will return home soon. These 70,000 refugees, a third of which are unaccompanied children, are at risk of exploitation. Conditions in the refugee camps are precarious, with a lack of food, shelter, medicine and extreme weather conditions. I echo the words of Tetros Abhaman, Director General of the World Health Organisation. A communications blackout means that Tigray has become a forgotten crisis, out of sight, out of mind. I would urge the Australian government to do what it can to raise this issue urgently at the UN and to ask the UN to, do, to immediately start to act to work towards peace and the return of refugees to their homeland of Tigray. Senator Hanson. 
Quest into the terrible death of Hannah Clark and her children at the hands of her ex-husband is a daily reminder of the epidemic of domestic violence. That horrendous crime is embedded in our memories and hopefully crystallises actions to safeguard families against all domestic violence of that nature. But what about the other aspect of domestic violence playing out in Australia, which really gets the same sort of attention? This is a difficult story to relate in this chamber, but it must be told. On the 10th of March this year, a woman is alleged to have broken into the home of her ex-partner in Logan, Queensland, doused the man in petrol and set him alight. It's difficult to imagine a more horrific death, but it could have been much worse. His current partner and his children were, were also in the house at the time, and it's believed he fought to protect their lives when the attack took place. I want to acknowledge the bravery of Stanley O'B, another victim of the epidemic of domestic violence in Australia. This incident is not the first of its kind. In 2019, a Geelong woman doused her husband in petrol and set him alight. She was later convicted of manslaughter. In 2018, a support Southport woman killed her partner with a shotgun. In June last year, a Brisbane woman is alleged to have murdered her ex-husband because she no longer wanted to pay child support. And in 2014, in a case which truly horrified Australia, a Cairns woman killed eight children all but one of them her own. The atrocities I've listed here all have one thing in common. They were committed by women, not men. The tragic death of Stanley Obese this month must serve as a wake-up call. Only a year ago, the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Social Policy and Legal Affairs handed down the report on its inquiry into family, domestic and sexual violence. This committee finally recognised the truth about domestic violence. Women can be perpetrators and men can be victims. The report made a number of recommendations that are worth repeating. The next national plan to reduce violence must be more inclusive of all victims and should be named the National Plan to Reduce Family, Domestic and Sexual Violence. The Australian Government should commission research into the prevalence of family, domestic and sexual violence against men and its impact on male survivors, and the Department of Social Services should review the adequacy of advice and referral services for men as survivors of family, domestic and sexual violence. As we have seen in tonight's budget, however, a record $1.3 billion has been committed to end violence against women and children, but no mention of men, and the new national plan is not inclusive of men. Is Stanley Obie's tragic death does not underline the need to recognise both genders are victims of domestic violence, what will? The solution in this respect is quite simple. Take gender out of the equation because the violence is committed being committed by both men and women. Men deserve a much, as much support as victims and survivors as women and children, but they do not receive it because the support is not there. Or if it is, and I mean a big if, it's not advertised. Women are told they can receive assistance of up to $5,000 to relocate and escape an abusive partner. Men are eligible too, but they're not told. Domestic violence support is too focused on women and children as the sole victims and men as the sole perpetrators. Evidence presented to the Joint Select Committee on Australia's Family Law System shows this bias also extends to family courts, although women also presented evidence of the reverse, but nowhere near the same numbers. It's one of the reasons why I've been working hard to reform family law and Australia's broken child support system. We must have a new national plan to reduce violence and recognise that anyone, male or female, can be a victim. There must be funding to support male survivors and research into the prevalence of domestic violence against them. And it must be addressed in the courts, ensuring that men get an equally fair hearing in their cases. For too many decades now, women have successfully challenged society to recognise their agency and independence. It was a long time coming and social equality between the sexes is still at work in progress. But it goes both ways and our policies must reflect that too. 
We will not end domestic violence until we recognise and acknowledge all uh, of its victims. We will not end domestic violence unless we as parliamentarians and the media portray men as victims too. And Senator Hanson, not... your time has expired. Thank you. Senator Stoker. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise tonight to speak about something that's really close to my heart and in some ways it's connected to what Senator Hanson's just mentioned. If we're serious about making sure that we reduce the incidence of violence against women and men, but violence against anyone in our community, we don't just need to invest in making sure that there are support services for people who experience this terrible phenomenon. We don't just need to make sure they've got safe places to go if the worst should happen. We also need to make sure um, that we are doing what's necessary, not just to put ambulances at the bottom of the cliff, but to put fences at the top of it, to do the preventative work that's necessary to keep people in the kind of healthy relationships with one another that underpins a society that is functioning so well that these statistics move in the right direction. And so I was really encouraged to get to know an organisation called Top Blokes. Now, what Top Blokes do is something that's really special. They engage in small group mentoring with young men aged between 10 and 17, and during a three to six month regular program of meeting up at school, they talk through the hard issues. Now, in an ideal world, everybody would have a strong father or mother figure who could do this for you. In an ideal world, people would have a home environment that has good examples of how to treat one another, relationships um, from those who raise them that, that stick together in the best possible way. Um, in an ideal world, people would have uh, parents who can talk about difficult subjects, whether that is about um, how to treat people with whom they're in a relationship, whether it's about um, body image, whether it's about work ethic, whether it's about how we present ourselves to the world, whether it's about um, expectations of um, what we expect from people of the opposite sex, even um, as it relates to young people's unfortunate but surprisingly prevalent exposure to influences like pornography. What top block blokes do is help to bring out the best in some of the most troubled uh, and high-risk young men in Queensland by providing experienced um, social work guidance from great influences like um, Zed and his peers, JT and Jason and the like, um, who I got to meet recently at Shaler Park State High School. Um, they are transforming the lives of young men and keeping them out of our jails, out of our family court system, in work and contributing to our community in a way that their parents and teachers had almost given up hope on at the time they enrolled in the program. Teachers report young men who are better able to manage their anger and calm themselves, cope with adversity and manage conflict in healthier ways. They've got clearer and healthier expectations of what a good relationship looks like. And here's something I think we can all be really excited about. Instead of turning to um, influences like drugs and alcohol as a way of numbing or blocking anger, they've got the skills needed to be able to process it healthily, direct their energies in a positive way so that they don't feel the need to or wish to use drugs or alcohol. Um, this is transformative for the lives of the young men involved. And um, it is an investment that I am so proud to see the philanthropic community of Queensland making. Um, they are doing incredible work and I can only commend it enormously. I remember the stories of one of the young blokes um, I got to talk with who was able to greet me with a strong look in the eye and a handshake, introduce himself by name, explain to me some of the things he'd done in the past that he wasn't proud of, but also all the ways he changed and the ways in which he looks to the future with positivity. He says he's going to do an apprenticeship that um, he's looking forward to being a mechanic 
and um, I have no doubt he's going to achieve that goal. That's partly due to his great teachers at Shaler Park State High, but it's got a lot to do with the talented and caring people who are transforming women's safety by giving men the skills they need to flourish. Senator Sicconi. Thank you very much, cool. Mr. Dayton, Deputy President. Uh, look, the events of the past two years have shone a bright light on Australia's vulnerability. The COVID-19 pandemic and Russia's invasion of Ukraine have exposed dangerous dependencies in, in our economy. Once um, hypothetical weaknesses have become all too real as stressed supply chains continue to adversely impact Australian businesses and consumers. But as we manage one crisis to the next, I fear that we have not addressed these vulnerabilities. We have treated symptoms as though they have arisen, and, but the underlying causes still remain largely unattended to. This is particularly true when it comes to Australia's fuel security. Steady access to quality fuel is essential for Australia. The transport sector, the backbone of so much of our economy, sources 98 per cent of its energy from liquid fuels. Given its prerequisites for our economy to function, because could we imagine an economy without our truckies and the fuel that they need to fill up their trucks? The Australian government must ensure that we have secure access to quality fuel, yet our supply of fuel continues to be largely left vulnerable to disruption in global supply chains. The last National Energy Security Assessment was conducted back in 2011, 2011. meaning the coalition has not conducted an assessment since it was elected almost a decade ago. In that time, our fuel security has diminished. By 2018, we were importing over 90 per cent of our liquid fuels. This takes the form of either oil for our few remaining refineries to process or refined fuels processed by refineries in Asia. All of this imported fuel and oil comes to Australia on foreign-owned or controlled ships. Lower costs overseas and pressures of COVID-19 pandemic have led to the impending closure of Australia's four remaining refineries in 2020. Now, faced with this crisis, the Australian government finally stepped up and stepped in with a rescue package in the form of subsidies. But it was all too little too late. BP announced the closure of the Western Australian Canara refinery back into October 2020 and Victoria's ExxonMobil Altona refinery that was announced its closure only a few months later. With only two operational refineries left in Australia, we are exposed to supply chain disruptions. This is not some imagined threat. We are seeing this play out in Europe at the moment. Approximately 60 per cent of Europe's energy is provided by gas from Russia. It took Russia invading Ukraine for Germany to cancel the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline project with Russia, which would have further concentrated Europe's energy reliance on that state. Europe is now moving rapidly to address this issue, with the European Union pledging to cut its gas dependency on Russia by two-thirds this year and cutting it entirely by 2030. Now, with China rapidly expanding its own oil refinery capacity and naval presence in our region and along vital sea routes connecting Australia to suppliers, we should learn the lessons from Europe before we are forced to learn from first-hand experience. In 2020, the Morrison government announced it would build a stockpile of crude oil that could be tapped in the event of a major disruption. But this stockpile is being stored in the United States, meaning that we could only have difficulty accessing it if the sea lines are closed, and we still do not have enough fuel on Australian soil to meet the International Energy Agency's 90-day stockpile commitment. Recent events show that we need to get serious about our sovereign capability to refine fuel and store it here in Australia. 
Prime Minister Morrison and the coalition have led our fuel security language for almost a decade, and as global tensions escalate, we must act with haste to ensure Australia has the infrastructure that we need to locally to, that we need locally to protect our prosperity. Senator Faruqi. Acting Deputy President, Islamophobia in this country is rising. The third report on Islamophobia in Australia was released this month by Charles Sturt University and the Islamic Science and Research Academy. This report tells us in no uncertain terms that many Muslim, what many Muslims living here already know, that Islamophobia is getting worse. There was a fourfold increase in in-person anti-Muslim hate incidents and online incidents were 18 times higher after an Australian white supremacist killed 51 innocent people in mosques in Christchurch in 2019. And these are just the reported incidents. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Islamophobia is also deeply gendered. Muslim women are by far the majority of targets, especially those wearing a hijab. The number of children exposed to Islamophobia is also on the rise. Australia has yet to reckon with the fact that this country produced the Christchurch killer. The Christchurch mosque murders were found to be motivated by extreme right-wing Islamophobic ideology. But that didn't really shake up the decision makers in Canberra who avoid even uttering the word Islamophobia. The multiple reports of a dangerous rise in far-right extremism and the growing threat of white supremacy haven't moved the dial either. This climate of Islamophobia and racial hatred is not happening in a vacuum. Political leaders have been complicit in normalizing hate and racism and the othering of those who don't meet their description of what an Australian should look like. Some in here have openly fueled racism, from putting up motions such as the racist slogan, it's okay to be white, to calling for a ban on Muslim immigration, to wearing a burqa in the Senate. Others dog whistle about Muslims, migrants and refugees. Yet others stand on the sidelines and remain totally silent. You are all responsible for where we are today. And it saddens me to admit that not a finger has been lifted by this government to tackle Islamophobia and racism. MPs across the board are very quick to claim Australia as the most successful multicultural country in the world. But the reality is that your version of multiculturalism is skin deep. You will happily use us for photo opportunities at our festivals, religious and cultural events. And with the Ram month of Ramadan starting in a few days, I'm sure plenty of you will come to iftars organized by the Muslim community, eat our food and celebrate with us while you brush aside the real issues of Islamophobia and Muslim hate. Australia has a racism blind spot. For too long, decision makers have chosen to pretend we do not have a problem. And it is people who highlight the existence of racism who are attacked, marginalized, and labeled as divisive. Sadly, this place is so far away from recognizing the toxicity and danger presented by racism to our society. You have absolutely no idea of the harm and damage this causes to people and communities. And why would you? The corridors of power are filled with privileged white people who have never experienced the corrosiveness of racism. So it's easy for them to ignore it, to deny its existence. Perhaps people in power don't want to acknowledge the existence of racism in case they might have be obliged to do something about it, or God forbid, share some of that power that you hold. It's time to have an honest reckoning with toxic racism. No more tinkering around the edges. It's time to challenge racism in the very echelons of leadership, right here in Canberra. MPs need to be forced to the table to unpack their white privilege, their white superiority, and their white fragility, even if it makes them uncomfortable. It's time to challenge the notion that our institutions and services such as health or justice are colorblind. It's time to mandate anti-racism training for every single federal MP so they can confront and overcome their biases and privilege. 
learn and acknowledge Australia's colonial history that is tainted with violence, dispossession, oppression, and discrimination against First Nations people that continues on to this day. It is time to once and for all start dismantling racism. Senator Antic. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Founded in 1971 by Klaus Schwab, the World Economic Forum is steeped in authoritarianism and Marxist ideology. It's an ideology which is creeping into governments across the world. To quote Schwab himself when speaking about the Canadian Parliament, we penetrate the cabinets. I know that half, that half this cabinet, even more than half, are actually young global leaders of the, of the World Economic Forum. It's true in Argentina, it's true in France, now with the president who is a young global leader." End quote. The World Economic Forum promotes globalist issues such as climate change, so-called systemic racism and sexism, and creating an online digital identity. However, closer inspection reveals the World Economic Forum is an anti-capitalist, anti-free market organisation that seeks to subvert Western values and political processes. And they are very organised and very well funded. Their message is designed to appear harmless when, in fact, the ideology that underpins it is revolutionary and destructive. They train aspirational leaders in their ideology and help them make connections in spheres including politics, business and the arts. The World Economic Forum has consistently advocated for the harshest and most extreme COVID uh, measures possible, including lockdowns, mandatory vaccinations, vaccine passports and mask mandates, despite these policies assaulting many of our basic liberties. At the centre of the World Economic Forum's ideology is stakeholder capitalism. Essentially, this is a theory that traditional free market capitalism ignores the dangers posed by climate change, and so the government must enforce restrictive policies to save the environment, even if that means less wealth. Why, then, are the forum's criticisms, criticisms of capitalism always directed at Western nations rather than the great polluters such as China and India? The forum believes that your freedoms should be minimised to prevent the imminent climate catastrophe the one that's becoming coming for 10 years in the last 50 years, by the way. The central theme of the World Economic Forum's material is what they call the Great Reset, which is Klaus Schwab's term for the opportunity the pandemic has presented to reimagine and reinvent the economic policies of the West. The term comes from Schwab directly himself with his 2020 book entitled The Great Reset. In a now-deleted video titled Eight Predictions for the World in 2030, the World Economic Forum claimed that you'll own nothing and you'll be happy, a slogan that hits the same dystopian note as work makes you free and ignorance is strength. You don't have to be a political philosopher to figure out that if you own nothing, the state owns everything. There's a word for this. It's called communism. The World Economic Forum and its affili affiliates shamelessly promote the abolition of private property, a central facet of Karl Marx's demented utopian ideology which led to the deaths of tens of millions of people worldwide in the 20th century. To quote Margaret Thatcher, quote, communism never sleeps, never changes its objectives, and nor should we. No matter how sophisticated the World Economic Forum tries to make the abolition of private property around the world sound, uh, the fantasies of Karl Marx always lead to the crushing of individuals' liberties and lives and the expansion of the state's tyranny and power. It is imperative that we pay close attention to the World Economic Forum and do all that we can to preserve liberty and reduce government intrusion in our lives. And if we fail to do so, the anti-democratic forces in the West will continue to march on, and we may wake up to an Australia that we no longer recognise. Australians deserve to know the extent to which the World Economic Forum's influence and infiltration of our country and how far it has gone, and we're going to find out. Uh, Senator Ferravanti wells uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, given the events and outcomes of the dodgy pre-selection where I lost by a handful of votes last Saturday. My time in this place will finish on 30 June 2022. Accordingly, there are a few matters I wish to place on the record before my departure. Many in this place would be aware of the history I have had with Scott Morrison. Let me give some clarity and context to that history so there can be no misunderstanding. In order to understand the man, it is best to look at his past actions. While professing to be a man of faith and claiming centre-right status, Morrison is a product of the left, having worked for Bruce Baird. He is adept at running with the foxes and hunting with the hounds, lacking the moral compass and having no conscience. His actions conflict with his portrayal as a man of faith. He has used his so-called faith as a marketing advantage, 
We learnt the leader of his Hillsong church group, Brian Houston, was a mentor to Morrison. Houston, Houston recently stood down as head of Hillsong because he was charged with sexual offences. It is noteworthy that in the past Houston fl flew top cover for his pedophile father. When Morrison worked for Tourism Australia, he backstabbed his minister, Fran Bailey. Eventually, he was fired from the position. As state director of the New South Wales Division of the Liberal Party, Morrison honed his manipulative skills when overseeing the Wentworth pre-selection to unseat Peter King. About 120 membership applications were rejected to help Turnbull get selected, the person Morrison ultimately backstabbed. Morrison might profess to be Christian, but there was nothing Christian about what was done to Michael Toke. When Morrison made his run for the seat of Cook, there were several hopefuls, including Toke, Fletcher and Coleman. Toke won the ballot on the first round with 84 votes. Morrison got eight votes. Having lost the ballot, Morrison and his cronies went to Sam Dastiari to get dirt on Toke, who had been in the Labor Party for a period of time whilst at university. This dossier of anecdotes was weaponised and leaked to the media to the point where Toke's reputation was destroyed. I am advised that there are several statutory declarations to attest to racial comments made by Morrison at the time that we can't have a Lebanese person in Cook. The state executive voted 12 to 11 not to endorse Toke and ordered a modified selection process. The only way that Toke could get political exoneration for a future run was to agree to put his numbers behind Morrison. Morrison met with David Clark and I and promised various things. Of course, he took our votes and never delivered. After the selection, Toke joined my staff. He subsequently also sued the newspapers for defamation. He won his cases, but this was cold comfort. Morrison, his cronies and the Liberal establishment in New South Wales had destroyed a good young man. I regret the day that Clark and I agreed to put Morrison into Cook. Since then, Morrison has never faced a pre-selection. Hence the trampling of members' rights in New South Wales and denying them proper pre-selections and installing captains' picks is classic Morrison. He and his consigliere, Alex Hawke, have deliberately contrived a crisis in New South Wales through a year of delays in not having selections. Hawke, as his representative on state executive for months and months, failed to attend nomination review committee meetings to review candidates, thereby holding up pre-selections. Spurious arguments were mounted to justify the unjustifiable. The constitution was trashed. There is a putrid stench of corruption emanating from the New South Wales division of the Liberal Party. All of this under the eye of Philip Ruddock. As a former Attorney-General, I am appalled that he has allowed Morrison to bully his way to a situation where the next election has been put at risk, all to save Hawke's career. This is what it's all about. Hawke knows that if he faces a plebiscite pre-selection, he, he will lose. Morrison has railroaded federal executive into setting up a committee which not only endorsed Hawke, Lee and Zimmerman, but a second committee is now endorsing captains' picks in seats like Parramatta and Hughes that were scheduled for pre-selections this week. So what is the hold that Hawke has over Morrison? Good question, especially given Hawke's own corrupt antics in New South Wales. During a speech advocating a Federal Integrity Commission, I referred to Hawke's activities and the dealings of the Balkham Hills branch. At a meeting in 2018, Ten members were admitted to the branch. This was confirmed in text messages from the branch secretary. Hawke was present at the meeting. He saw what went on. I am told there is video evidence of the meeting. I also have relevant documents, including correspondence sent to Morrison on the issue. After the meeting, the minutes were falsified to show that the ten members were not accepted. Statutory declarations were provi provided to counter this falsity. The branch was eventually suspended by state executive. The branch president and secretary, both acolytes of Hawke, refused to provide statutory declarations. Despite clear evidence of fraud, Hawke's role in this process has never been fully disclosed. The New South Wales state director has sat on this matter for years. Legal proceedings are now on foot, and I look forward to the day when Hawke will be required to give evidence under oath to explain his corrupt conduct. There is a very appropriate saying here, the fish stinks from the head. 
Morrison and Hawke have ruined the Liberal Party in New South Wales by trampling its constitution. Indeed, I understand at a federal executive meeting, Morrison was asked whether he was running a protection racket in New South Wales. In recent months, I have kept members of the division updated. I have received hundreds, if not thousands, of emails outlining their disgust. They have lost faith in the party. They want to leave. They don't like Morrison and they don't trust him. They continue to despair at our prospects at the next federal election, and they blame Morrison for this. Our members do not want to help in the upcoming election. By now, you might be getting the picture that Morrison is not interested in the rules-based order. It is his way or the highway, an autocrat, a bully who has no moral compass. And now to my own situation. Having lost by a handful of votes last Saturday and having analysed the data, numbers tell their own story. Clearly, my push for democracy in the New South Wales division was certainly not welcome. This would mean that the factional operatives can't control pre-selections. For years, figures in the Liberal Party have denied the existence of factions and criticised the ALP. This is hypocrisy, given that the Liberal Party is now no different to the Labor Party. In addition, having been a critic of Morrison on a range of policy matters, I was a marked woman. I have known for a number of years of the machinations involving the PMO and others to move me on. Recent media reports confirmed a deal agreed to by Hawke, Euron Finkelstein from the PMO, Charles Perrottet, Dallas McInerney, Trent Zimmerman and Matt Keane. In my case, Dallas McInerney from Catholic Schools New South Wales was encouraged to run against me. Realising he did not have support from the Conservative base to win a pre-selection, they resorted to getting Jim Molan to run, despite Molan having promised he would only see out the synodinous term. In my case, Wade McInerney, brother of Dallas, worked in my office for five years following his departure to work for Robert Asaf at Greyhounds New South Wales. I discovered he was engaged in inappropriate conduct and activities. I was duty-bound to refer him to the Australian Federal Police, the Department of Finance and the Australian Government Vetting and Security Agency. Having engaged lawyers and fought hard for a pre-selection, I got it. Because my enemies realised my strong support from delegates meant Plan B had to be implemented. Don Perrottet's premiership is held together by a threat by a thread through a so-called unity deal with the keen Poulos left. For years, the Perrottets have railed against Hawke, threatening to prosecute the Borkham Hills matter but never delivering. The Perrottets, the McInerneys, Asaf, etc., only had about 30 votes between them. In the ultimate act of treachery, those numbers were press-ganged into voting for Hawke's candidate, Molan. Why? In short, the so-called Conservative Premier aligned with his so-called enemy Hawke to do a deal. Morrison gets his captain's picks in federal seats and no state members jump ship to the federal arena, which would in turn have crippled the premiership of a supine and weak state leader. In my public life, I have met ruthless people. Morrison tops the list, followed closely by Hawke. Morrison is not fit to be Prime Minister, and Hawke certainly is not fit to be a minister. Senator Wish Wilson. Holy smokes. Uh, Acting Deputy President, I'm happy to offer another five minutes to Senator Favanti Wells if she'd like to continue. Tell me about the environment, Senator. Uh, okay. Um, well, I have ten minutes to talk about the environment, but I, I, yeah, I will say that was certainly worth. Uh, being in the chamber for late night adjournment to witness in person. Um, okay, I'm just t taking my time. <laughs> Acting Deputy President. Um, so tonight's Morrison government final budget for this 46th parliament has made housing in this country more expensive has locked in tax cuts for the wealthy and provided more funding for coal and gas projects rather than acting on the climate crisis. This Liberal budget contains more than $37.6 billion for coal, oil and gas companies. 
and gives $13 billion of public money to property investors and has no money, no money to build affordable public housing in this country. The Greens want government to invest to build a million affordable public homes. Scott Morrison's budget makes housing more expensive, locks in tax cuts for the wealthy and funds more oil and gas projects. This budget of election bribes will not keep you safe from the climate crisis and it won't put a secure roof over your head. It doesn't have a cent of new money for building new affordable housing and it continues to pour more petrol on the climate crisis. Even as floods again threaten the northern rivers for the second time in a month, Scott Morrison's plans to give more than $38 billion in handouts to coal, oil and gas corporations to fuel the climate crisis and apparently Labor backs him in. There is $1.6 billion for renewables, $2 billion for disaster recovery and more than $38 billion in subsidies to coal, oil and gas. It's an insult to every flood victim that the Prime Minister is spending more than 10 times on coal, oil and gas as he is on protecting us from future major climatic events. Scott Morrison's budget spends $13 billion on unfair tax breaks that will push up the cost of housing and lock people out of the housing markets, handouts that, once again, Labor will wave through. A temporary cut to fuel excise may not even make its way to people's pockets. There's every chance that world oil prices or profiteering from oil corporations will wipe out any gains to motorists overnight at very substantial cost to the budget. We need to permanently boost the pension by almost $250 a fortnight, not $250 per election. To tackle cost of living pressures, the budget should have wiped out student debt, got dental into Medicare and built a million affordable public homes that people can rent for 25 per cent of their income or buy for $300,000. That is the Greens' plan. That would have been much fairer, better and cheaper than proceeding with stage three tax cuts and temporarily, temporarily cutting fuel excise. This budget shows more than ever that we need to kick this government out and get the Greens in balance of power in the next parliament to push the next government to tackle cost of living pressures by taxing the billionaires, getting Denticare into Medicare, wiping out student debt and building affordable homes. This budget is a budget for billionaires and big corporations, not for people who are struggling. Under this budget, cost of living will increase and wages won't catch up. Heroic assumptions for wages growth to keep inflation at bay and to cover cost of living expenses. The structural holes in our economy will keep widening the gap between rich and poor under this government. A $420 payment won't go far for a family that's stuck spending half their income on housing, and the $250 payment will lift a pension out of poverty for one pay packet and then send them back the next. We need a budget that ensures the billionaires and the big corporations pay their fair share so we can invest in getting Denticare into Medicare, ensuring that everyone has a livable home. This government will never deliver the budget that the Australian people deserve. And without pressure, Labor is not going to support the structural changes needed by everyone who is struggling. With the Greens in balance of power, we'll tax the billionaires and big corporations so the 2023 Labor Greens budget will be one that builds a more equal Australia. Uh, I just wanted to say tonight uh, a thank you to all those people who have supported me over my last 10 years in the Senate. Um, it's nearly 10 years for me, coming up in a few weeks' time. Uh, and uh, while I'm confident that the people of Tasmania uh, will recognise the good work that the Greens do in this place, will recognise that we have a good chance of holding balance of power in the next government, recognise that this is a climate emergency 
and more than ever they need to vote for the environment. They need to vote for real climate action. Um, this is the last week of parliament, the last couple of, well, the last adjournment certainly for the 46th parliament. So I'd like to take this opportunity uh, to thank all those people who have supported me over the last 10 years, those people who voted for me in 2013, the Tasmanians who also voted for me in 2016. Uh, I am up for election this time around, uh, and I'd ask those people who have supported the Greens and have supported myself and my team, um, if you've liked what you've seen, please continue to vote Green. Um, we're needed more than ever in this place. We've just as a party celebrated uh, 50 years of Green politics uh, in Tasmania uh, last weekend in the Hobart Town Hall. Uh, we're very proud uh, of our heritage. On the 23rd of March 1972, a group of people moved a motion at a very rowdy town hall meeting in Hobart uh, to start the United Tasmania Group, the world's first green political party. Um, that political party spawned a green political movement that has now gone around the world. From that very humble beginning on an island on the bottom of the world, uh, Tasmania exported green politics to the globe. Uh, we now have Greens in significant balance of power in Germany, including a chancellor position. We have a Green Prime Minister in Iceland. We have Greens in nearly every country around the world. Uh, and uh, I'm incredibly uh, honoured and privileged to have been uh, pre-selected by my party and elected by the Tasmanian people twice to this place. Uh, I feel like I have been honest to the contract that I made with my party uh, and with the voters of Tasmania. I've worked as hard as I could over the recent decade uh, to protect our oceans, to put the environment first, to do everything uh, we, I possibly could uh, to tackle climate change. Uh, I've also been fortunate enough to have had the Greens Treasury and Finance portfolio for nearly half the time that I've been in this place, and we've achieved great things as a political party, working across party lines too, may I say, uh, over many years. Uh, and I would ask the voters of Tasmania to, uh, to, to back that 10 years of experience. Uh, I, there's plenty more work that I would like to do in this place, uh, and I just wanted to once again thank uh, the people of Tasmania who have given me this amazing opportunity. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, tonight I'm speaking to this parliament's therapeutic response to COVID-19 and its horrific medical harm and loss of life in that response. Last week, leading Australian parliamentarians came together in an event I organised called COVID Under Question to present documented evidence and victim testimony proving a catastrophic failure of Australia's regulatory framework. COVID vaccine injuries are hidden behind anonymous government data, while COVID virus supposed harm is splashed across prime time. The very least we can do for the victims of COVID vaccines is to say their names. Victims like Caitlin George, Georgia Gotts, a healthy and vibrant 23-year-old studying at Griffith University to become a vet while working as a horse strapper. Caitlin dropped dead at work of a heart attack following his second Pfizer shot. Her death was recorded as asthma, a condition Caitlin has never had. Reginald Lynn Shearer, a formerly healthy, fit and active man who quickly went downhill and passed away from effects that began after receiving the AstraZeneca vaccine. Daniel Perkins, a 36-year-old healthy father from Albion Park who died of a heart attack in his sleep following his second Pfizer injection. Douglas James Roberts died after taking AstraZeneca. His family are concerned that his GP didn't warn him of the side effects of the vaccine. In other words, no informed consent was obtained. Neurosurgeons at the Royal Brisbane Hospital attributed his death to a stroke, despite no family history and a clean bill of health. They refused to report his death to the TGA. Refused. The Australian Health Practitioner Regulatory Agency, APRA, has been bullying medical practitioners into not reporting or even for talking about the harm they are seeing. The TGA erased 98 per cent of the 800 vaccine deaths. 98 per cent erased that physicians reported without autopsy or suitable, and TGA did so without autopsy or suitable consideration of all the patient medical data. 
TGA, Atagi and APRA are the three monkeys of the pharmaceutical industry. Hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. Section 22D2 of the Therapeutic Goods Act 1989 requires the Secretary of the Department of Health to ensure the quality, safety and efficacy of the vaccines were satisfactorily established for each cohort for which the provisional approval is being, guaranteed, is being granted. Data recently revealed in court papers in the United States clearly shows vaccine harm was apparent in the clinical trials that Pfizer, BioNTech and others conducted. This information, if Atagi had bothered to ask for it, should have resulted in a refusal of the application for provisional use. No data was provided to the Secretary regarding individual test subjects, technically anonymised patient clinical data. No independent analysis of the fundamental issues surrounding novel mRNA vaccines was conducted in Australia. None in Australia. Instead, the Secretary took Pfizer, AstraZeneca and Moderna's word for it. I will say that again. The Secretary took pharmaceutical companies' word for the safety of their products. These are the same pharmaceutical companies that have been fined over and over for criminal behaviour. AstraZeneca, you, 355 million US dollar fine for fraud and, separately, 550 million dollar fine for making unfounded, unfounded claims about efficacy. Pfizer, 430 million dollars fine for making unfounded claims about efficacy, efficacy and 2.3 billion dollar fine, billion dollar fine for making unfounded claims about efficacy and for proving and for paying kickbacks. This is who the Liberal, Nationals, Labor and Greens, a very own pharmaceutical lobby, wants to pay more money to, not on the basis of extensive local testing and inquiry, simply on the basis of taking pharmaceutical companies' safety insurances. No testing. An assurance made easy by indemnity against any damage the vaccines cause. What deceit, what criminal incompetence. The Labor Party and the Liberal National Party have accepted $1 million each from the pharmaceutical, benefit, uh, pharmaceutical establishment in this election cycle alone. Billions more are being set aside in this week's budget to pay the pharmaceutical companies to keep their COVID-19 gravy train going. What great value this parliament provides for those electoral donations. Mention should be made of the TGA's decision to ban safe, fully approved and widely accepted alternatives to COVID-19 vaccines. This includes hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin, vitamins, minerals and natural antivirals, as well as proven messaging around healthy eating and lifestyles. The decision to ban proven, safe, affordable, accessible alternative treatments that are working around the world was taken to ensure the fastest and widest possible adoption of the vaccines. The TGA's own customers fund the TGA. That means pharmaceutical companies fund their own products approval. That fails the pub test. Where are the checks and balances? There are none. The Australian Bureau of Statistics is culpable in this scandal and cover-up. The Australian Bureau of Statistics annual budget is $400 million. And the most recent mortality data they provide is November last year, four months behind. The most recent breakdown of mortality by cause and age is 2020. The most recent data on live births is 2020. Birth data used to be available six weeks after, not 15 months and counting, hiding miscarriages. At what point do we consider the actions of the TGA, ATAGI and the Australian Bureau of Statistics as interfering with the operation of the Senate? Peer-reviewed and suitably published data has been released from outside of the government that must require the Secretary to cancel the provisional approval of the vaccines. Let me review those quickly so the Senate fully understands the extent to which we have been misled. Firstly, freedom of information documents indicate the TGA has failed to assess the reproductive toxicology of the COVID vaccines. Freedom of information documents indicate the TGA has failed to assess the impact of microRNA sequences and related molecular genetic issues on the human body. Peer-reviewed and published in in vitro research shows gene-based vaccine-generated spike proteins can migrate into human cell nuclei, nuclei to disrupt DNA repair mechanisms. The TGA has dealt with this abysmal, abysmally, murderously. Vaccine-derived RNA can be reverse transcribed, leading to possible integration into the human genome, which the TGA denies based only on pharmaceutical companies telling them to deny it. Five, 
Internal Pfizer data released in February indicate they accept 1,272 different adverse vaccine events, including paralysis and death. German and US insurance actuarial data suggest the TGA's database of adverse event notifications is under-reporting side effects ninefold. Freedom of information documents from 2018 shows the TGA keeps two databases of, of adverse event notifications, one internal showing all reports of harm and one public that shows only a part of those. This means vaccine harm is most likely significantly higher than reported. Significantly higher than reported. Without honest and accurate data, the Senate has no way of deciding how much harm is too much harm. German pathologists describe pathological aggregates of spike proteins and lymphocyte infiltrations in inflamed organs in autopsies related to deaths post-vaccination. In response, the TGA is failing to conduct autopsies on the 800 Australians the patient's own doctors have reported as having died from the vaccines. What the hell is the TGA hiding? Whistleblowers to the British Medical Journal provided reports of inadequacies, irregularities and possible fraudulent practices in the Pfizer vaccine trial. You know, the same trials for which the, the TGA took Pfizer's word. From a modern immunological perspective, too frequent vaccines for respiratory viruses runs the risk of desensitising the immune responses to the virus and thus lead to hypoimmunity and worse illness than without the immunisation. To put that more simply, repeated vaccination is doing more harm than good. These are the matters I sought today to refer to the Select Committee on COVID-19 without success. And I thank Senators Hanson, Abetz, Rennick and Antic for their support, for their integrity and courage. The truth is the Select Committee on COVID-19 has been running a protection racket for the pharmaceutical industry and today's vote proves that. This unprecedented betrayal of the Australian people must be referred immediately to the Royal Commission, to a Royal Commission, to the Prime Minister, the Health Minister, the, Fed, the Federal Health Department and all those in the Senate and the House of Representatives, all of you who have perpetrated this crime, I direct one question. How the hell do you expect to get away with it? We're not going to let you get away with it. We won't let you get away with it. We are coming for you. We have the stamina to hound you down, and we damn well will. Uh, Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting uh, Deputy President. First of all, can I acknowledge everyone who has suffered from a vaccine injury, someone, uh, the people who have lost their jobs from the mandates, or those who have suffered discrimination uh, because of their vaccination status. The suffering incurred by so many Australians should not be occurring in a plural democratic society where rights of the individual, especially in regards to their own health choices, should be considered sacrosanct. The destruction of the civil liberties in the name of COVID demonstrates the blatant abuse of powers by all levels of government dealing with it. All this in the name of a virus that has an extremely high survival rate, greater than 99 per cent, and an average age of mortality similar to life expectancy. By all means, we should protect the sick and vulnerable, but you don't destroy the strong to protect the weak. But let's be honest. This is no longer about COVID. It's about the vaccine rollout and the government control that comes with it. This became obvious last year when the vaccination rate went past 80 per cent and the state premiers completely ignored their promise to the Australian people that they would open up and lift the cruel and unnecessary COVID restrictions of the last two years. Rather than open up, they doubled down with unnecessary mandates and discrimination. And it's not just the state premiers who doubled down. Employers doubled down. The federal government, despite saying they don't believe in uh, mandates, double down with border restrictions and hypocritical rules for vaccine exemptions from a target. But here's the rub. The vaccines don't work. They didn't prevent immunity, uh, provide immunity. They didn't prevent transmission. They didn't prevent hospitalisation. And they didn't prevent death. It wasn't that long ago that the definition of a vaccine was that it gave the recipient immunity and in most cases for the best part of a lifetime. Do we get that with the COVID vaccines? No, we don't. No, what we get is the requirement that you have to take a jab every three months because, hey, if the first didn't work, then try a second. And if the third didn't work, try a fourth. 
What's that defini definition of insanity again? So let me say this loud and clear. The COVID-19 vaccines are not fit for purpose. Despite the fact that over 90 per cent of the population is jabbed, COVID still ran rampant throughout the community once we opened up late last year. No herd immunity was achieved. According to the New South Wales Health Day data based at, uh, based at the 12th of February, there was no statistical clinical difference in outcomes between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. None at all. I wish I had a larger or more recent data set, but unfortunately no other state governments want to release their COVID cumulative clinical outcomes. I wonder why. And even New South Wales, which actually did release data on a granular basis, has actually, have actually scaled their reporting back so that it's not clear about the outcomes between the vaccinated and unvaccinated, because the data was showing that the vaccination didn't work. I can't say I'm surprised, though. New South Wales Health introduced us to the practice of back capturing, a process whereby you count anyone who had COVID in the last 28 days prior to entering the hospital, even if they had recovered. A masterclass in fudging numbers, if ever I've seen it. And because the vaccines are not, for are not fit for purpose, they should not be mandated or required, period, by an employer, by a government, by a business, uh, by a school, a sporting association or a show association. No one has the right to force someone to take a medical procedure, especially one that is ineffective but, even more importantly, is dangerous. To date, according to the official government figures with the TGA, there have been over 116,000 reported suspected adverse events here in Australia. This is more than all other drugs put together in Australia since 1971. And this number is still climbing. Is it any wonder our health system is struggling? It is important to note that most of these cases are prepared by medical professionals, and nearly every one of them has ticked the box indicating that they suspect the vaccine uh, injury was caused by the actual vaccine. 116,000 reported cases is the mother of all safety signals. To put into context, there are only 60,000 public hospital beds in Australia. And in, by ignoring this signal, the TGA, the TAGI, APRA, the Health Department and all other government officials, including politicians who fail to speak up, are destroying the lives of so many Australian people. One of the key criteria the World Health Organisation uses as guidance for assessing causality is in this patient, did the event occur within a plausible time window after vaccine administration? And of course, we know the answer to this is yes. But that's not all. All science is based on actual data. In medicine, the gold standard for data is based on a doctor's diagnosis. It is not based on models conjured up by bureaucrats in the health department and the TGA. Sure, that may help to show correlation but it does not determine causation. But yet again, this is the standard we apply here in Australia. We have a bunch of unelected bureaucrats at APRA, none of whom have any experience in frontline medicine, gagging the very doctors, nurses and other allied health professionals from doing their job, from writing the very diagnosis that our injured need feedback on that our community need feedback on so they know just how dangerous these vaccines are. By gagging our medical professional, APRA are stopping vaccine victims from getting the treatment and support they need, and they are stopping the rest of society from understanding just how dangerous these vaccines can be. It is completely unacceptable that APRA have bullied our medical professionals into silence. I should, however, acknowledge the medic many medical professionals who have the courage to speak out at great cost to themselves and to their fa families. Your efforts will not be forgotten. We have people injured from the first vaccine or the second vaccine that can't get an exemption from, the, from, the, from their next shot 
because doctors are afraid to write anything down. How cruel is that to force someone to get a second vaccine after they've been injured from the first? But what's even worse is that many people who've been injured actually can't get an exemption. Some get a medical exemption, but then they get the sack anyway. I mean, what, what is going on here? This is just unbridled abuse. I've heard these stories every day for the last five months. It has got to stop. But APRA's bullying doesn't just lead to poor treatment. It leads to further cover-ups, the worst being the underreporting of vaccine injuries. I know a cardiologist in Brisbane who lodged three myocarditis reports from the vaccine with Queensland Health. And they knocked the reports back saying that the cardiologist wasn't qualified uh, to give an assessment on the condition of someone's heart and that these uh, vaccine victims had to go back to their GPs. Just how many adverse events are being underreported because of this systemic cover-up of vaccine injuries? Not just by APRA, but by our good friends at the TGA. The TGA rushed the approval pr process with Pfizer and they are now trying to cover up their own mistakes, hiding adverse events from the vaccines. The very fact that Pfizer wanted 55 years to release all their data should have been a red flag. The number of injuries and deaths is a red flag. The lack of controls in initial testing should have been a red flag. There was no genotoxicity testing, no carcinogenic testing, no reproductive testing, no development testing, no longitudinal testing. The trial was unblinded after two months, but even more importantly, the two key safety clinical outcomes from the trial, trial injuries and deaths, were worse in the group that were vaccinated. But despite all these safety signals, the TGA still refused to pull the vaccines. So let me conclude. It is time to stop the vaccine rollout. It is time to stop the mandates. It is time to stop the vaccine discrimination. And it is time that government stop the tyrannical overreach in the name of COVID. Thank you. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. Like so many around the world, the Greens are devastated by and condemn Russia's horrific invasion of Ukraine. And we are deeply moved by the heartbreaking stories coming out of Ukraine. The lives lost, the families devastated, the communities torn apart, and the buildings turned to craters and the cities turned to concrete wastes. Clearly, there has been a massive human toll of this war. We welcome the Australian government's urgency in responding and the fact that this suffering on the other side of the world has generated a rapid and a genuine response. And we support the targeted sanctions that have been, been imposed on oligarchs with direct links to Putin's regime and to the suffering and the devastation that has been inflicted in Ukraine. We welcome the restrictions in Australia on importing Russian fuel and we welcome the steps taken by the Future Fund to divest from Russian investments. These are all important steps, and the Greens support them. Beyond that, we think, that, however, there is more that the Australian government can do. In particular, we think that globally cancelling Ukraine's national debt is a clear step that the international community could take, and we urge the Australian government to be advocating multilaterally towards that end. We welcome the immigration policy changes made to support Ukrainians fleeing the conflict, but we think that more can be done. The Greens call on Australia to provide an additional 20,000 humanitarian places above Australia's existing an annual humanitarian quota, specifically for Ukrainian nationals fleeing conflict and or persecution. We would like to see the fast tracking of any outstanding visa applications by Ukraine nationals. We'd like to offer we think we should offer permanent visas to Ukraine nationals on temporary visas in Australia, to grant family reunion visas to applicant families of Ukrainian Australians, and revoke any visa cancellation decisions for any Ukraine nationals held in detention. And for a long time, the Australian Greens, of course, have called for an urgent energy transition to address the climate emergency. The invasion of Ukraine and the way Putin's war machine has been funded by fossil fuels shows how urgent this transition is. Exports of oil and gas are worth 120 
$1.5 billion to Russia every year. They are fueling the Russian war machine, and they have to be brought to an end while Russia is waging war on its neighbour. We need to work multilaterally to support other countries, particularly in Europe, to urgently shift from Russian oil and gas. We need to act at emergency speed to safeguard our future, both from the climate emergency and from the potential outbreak of World War III. And if you want to know what's in Australia's national interest, this is a massive opportunity for Australia to use government investment to drive new export industries in green hydrogen and minerals processing, ensuring that Australia becomes a renewable energy superpower. So let me be clear. We support the Australian government responding urgently to the crisis in Ukraine, but there is a lot more that we think could be done. And more broadly as well, I urge the Australian government to act urgently to uphold human rights wherever serious violations occur, and not just where it is geopolitically convenient to do so. Because without that, sadly, there's a real risk that the Australian government's response is seen through the lens of hypocrisy and racism, serving to highlight the many instances where the Australian government has refused to act despite desperate pleas from diaspora communities and human rights advocacy groups. The simple truth is that we, the Australian Greens, believe that universal human rights are fundamental and must be respected and protected in all countries and for all people. Our commitment to this is reflected in my efforts over the course of this parliament to raise serious human rights violations that occur around the world. I want, to I want to particularly mention here Myanmar and the actions of the military junta there. For over a year, we have been calling for the Australian government to meet with the National Unity Government and to impose targeted sanctions on the key generals who have led the coup and who have been responsible for the most appalling atrocities against the people of Myanmar. And sadly, we have not seen that happen. The Foreign Minister, to the best of my knowledge, has not met with the National Unity Government. So I urge her to do so. I hope that it will happen. And we again urge the Australian Government to not just meet with the National Unity Government at the highest levels, but to recognise the National Unity Government. Sadly, instead, what we've seen so far is Minister Dutton legitimising the junta through ASEAN Defence Minister's meetings. Now, I really do want to thank the many community members here in Australia and around the world for their advocacy and the work that they've done to be working for justice in Myanmar. I do now actually want to congratulate the government in the unexpected but very positive announcement of 16,000 visas for refugees from Afghanistan over the next four years. This, for me as a Green, was by far the best news of the budget tonight in a sea of climate denialism and massive handouts to fossil fuel companies and projects. But it was not before time. I mean, just last week, the Taliban announced that they are banning schooling for girls who were previously attending school. And today, the news came through that they are banning the broadcast of foreign news reports and banning women from flying domestically or internationally. Um, without an approved merhan, a male relative accompanying them. It is absolutely horrifying. There is much more that the Australian government could be doing to be supporting refugees from Afghanistan, and they should be acting with urgency. The plans for 16,000 visas is great news, but it's urgent for people to get out. We could and should be issuing people with emergency visas and doing everything we can to facilitate getting them out of the country. We should be issuing permanent visas to the thousands of Afghans here on temporary visas who don't have rights to health care, to go to university or to apply for visas for their partners or other immediate family members. We should be resettling Afghans who have been living in limbo in Indonesia for over a decade. There is a lot more that we can be doing about human rights abuses that have been perpetrated by a whole range of other governments 
often against their own citizens, including vulnerable minority groups. And I urge the Australian government to do more in relation to human rights violations wherever they occur, including through the use of targeted sanctions using our Magnitsky legislation. For example, we should be acting on the actions of the Philippines government, who are Act, basically waging war against their own citizens, targeting, targeting environmental, labour and human rights activists. The actions of the Indian government against a range of minority groups in India and in Kashmir, particularly Muslims who have been targeted by the RSS, with Hindu nationalism, nationalism has been absolutely flourishing under the Modi government. And including groups, there have been Hindu extremist groups who have been actively calling for mass killings of Muslims. We should be doing more about the actions of the Chinese government, the government with their attacks on the human rights of their own citizens and their attacks on Tibetans, Uyghurs and Hong Kongers. We should be doing more about the actions of the Israeli government with their ongoing brutal occupation of Palestine, which has been assessed by Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch as apartheid. In relation to Ethiopia, we have consistently called for greater action to address the humanitarian crisis in Tigray in particular, where millions are facing starvation from a government blockade. I have spoken in this place previously about the actions of the Sri Lankan government and the serious human rights violations faced by Muslim communities there also. I have called for action to respond to the attacks by the Sudanese military on protesters in response to the violent coup that occurred there a year ago that has resulted in the deaths of hundreds, if not thousands, of people. And then there are the human rights violations committed by our ally, the US. Over many years, the evasion of Iraq, the imprisonment of Julian Assange, or the horrific border policies of the Trump administration. But throughout, the Australian government has remained silent. We need an independent foreign policy, not an unthinking alignment with the US. So, to conclude, we welcome the urgency of the Australian government's response to the invasion of Ukraine, but we want to see an urgent response that advocates for human rights wherever human rights violations occur, not where it's just geopolitically convenient. And I and the Greens will continue to speak out for the protection of human rights wherever in, a, in the, a, in the you, world Senator they Rice. are under Time attack. Has expired. Senator Lambie. Oh, thank you, Acting Deputy Madam President. Last year, an eight-year-old Tasmanian girl was allegedly sexually abused repeatedly by a new boy she knew at school. The abuse happened on school property, where the teachers wouldn't see it. The girl, were, the girl has intellectual disabilities, which made her especially vulnerable. Here's the thing. We say to our young people in Australia, well, if you've been abused, speak out, tell an adult, trust the grown-ups, because we're here to protect you. This little girl, and I'm going to call her Rose, to protect her identity, she did that. She spoke up. After months of abuse, she worked up the courage to tell her mum what was happening. She did the right thing. Her mum, who I'll call Aileen, she did the right thing too. When she found out what happened, she did everything possible to keep Rose and her brother safe. She raised the allegations with the school, with state police with state and federal Labor members, with the, state, with the former state education minister and the current education minister, the deputy premier and the premier of Tasmania. Literally, she has gone to everyone she can possibly think of asking for help. What a mother line. Honestly, you could not find a mum who does a better job of fiercely advocating for her children. There's nothing more that Elaine could possibly do to fix this situation for Rose and her brother. Elaine needs people in the government to stand up and do something. She's known that for months. She's told them she needs them to step up and do something. But here we are, 12 months later, and Elaine and her kids are homeless. They are couch surfing. They have no stability and no safety. Elaine is sleeping on the floor so the kids can have a bed. She had to quit her job to homeschool her children. 
She is living on a carer's payment from Centrelink. They have nothing. They are completely stuck. This is what we do to our victims in Tasmania. This is how we treat them. This is what the police do, the government people do, and the schools that sit in denial that say there is no abuse going on in their schools. She can't get bond together to get a private rental, and even if she could, she's not working. She isn't going to get approval for a lease. She can't go back to work until the kids have a school to go to. And they are not going back to a school where Rose was abused. That is completely unacceptable. They can't go to school because until they find a house, they don't know what school, what school they're going to be going to. Got to have the house before we can put the kids in the school. Because they've already gone through enough trauma. Elaine and her family are stuck in a classic catch-22, and the only people who can help them are in the state government. For 12 months now, absolutely nothing from the Liberal state government. I'm talking about a young woman, a young lady that has been abused in a public school in Tasmania where politicians down there know what's going on, and I watch you fighting in state parliament with each other over abuse matters. But apparently this young girl you couldn't give a stuff about. You don't give a stuff about how bloody shameful of state parliament in Tasmania today. You are shameful. And while her kids wait, their mental health is going down the drain. They've had years of disruption. Their kids are having nightmares. They check the locks every night before they go to sleep. No child in Australia should feel that they need to do that. No child should be going to sleep wondering if they're safe. And don't get me wrong, Elaine's daughter Rose is bloody brave and bloody strong. But we're asking way too much of a young girl who hasn't even hit her teens. We never should have made her wait this long to get to a safe place to live. I've got to be honest, I'm at my wit's end and I cannot believe we're talking about all this abuse going on uh, with kids, uh, the sexual abuse going on up here and all this abuse and they're all fighting over and throwing abuse at each other down in state parliament but nobody seems to give a stuff about this young lady. This young girl that's been abused at a public state school in the state of Tasmania. I've been around on this for months now. I'm banging my head up against a brick wall. Everywhere is roadblocks, bureaucracy, government cover-up and government, and government incompetence at its best over abuse. I cannot tell you, Premier Gutwin, how disappointed from one person to another, for someone I had so much respect for, how disappointed I am in you today. But frankly, I find you bloody shameful. I am asking for Elaine and her kids all they need is a house. All they need is a safe place to live so they can move on with their lives. This is how the bad things are in social housing in this country. A kid gets raped at school. The state government can't, st can't stop the family from becoming homeless. It's not good enough. So the victim, the victim gets punished. The boy who raped the girl, running around, no questions asked. God only knows if anybody else has been raped at this school, because we're all playing cover-up in Tasmania, aren't we? Has there been any more kids at that school? Because I, as a mother, I'm this far from naming that school. This far. Because my worry is this. If my children were going to that school, I would want to know whether one of my children has been raped while you are playing cover-up. God forbid. I've been told the Department of Housing doesn't have a single spare property in Tasmania to put them into, and this has been going on for months. Not one. It just goes to show how, things have, how bad they've become in our state. 
You can be travelling along a normal family, working hard and trying to do the right thing, and all it takes is for one horrible thing to upend your life. One person who takes advantage of your children. One, her, one person who is filth and everything turns upside down. And it's up to the state government to protect people when they're down on their luck. That's how things are done in Australia. We expect everyone to get on and work hard and give back to their neighbourhood. But when someone falls on tough times, there has to be a net to catch them. We don't let people fall through the cracks, no fault of their own. That's not the Australian way. I don't know why the Tasmanian government doesn't get that, but quite frankly, I find you appalling. Absolutely appalling. Yet you've known about this. Housing Commissioner, you've known about this. Housing Minister, once again, appalling effort from the both of you. You are shameful. And every one of you has said, not my problem, Jackie. Not my problem. What's your bloody problem now? It is your problem now. And you don't want me back up here in August and to name, start naming a few things and a few people, and that's school. This is your warning. You get this fixed. Because the next time I stand up in here, I'm going to let loose. I'll use my privilege for this family. It is enough. And I will use it as a mother knowing that if my children went to that school, I would want to know that this was going on. I would want to know that my children were not touched either or raped. This is a cover-up of the worst, and it is disgusting. You know, the new education minister, he told me he couldn't say anything substantial about the matter because it was from the police. Well, here's a flashpoint for you, minister. Guess what? Get your story right, because the police aren't investigating, mate. They're not investigating. Where's the police minister? Go and put a bird up your police officer's butts. Something is wrong here. When are you going to do it? When I start naming and shaming? Because by then it's all going to be too late. I'm telling you, I'm not going to let this go. Of this go. The most basic job of politicians, state and federal, is to look after Australian kids. It is the most fundamental basic thing, and we have a responsibility to protect our children. And the Tasmanian government, you have failed to get the job done, and you are shameful. You have about six weeks or two months before I get back up here to get this fixed. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Senator Patrick. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Two themes of my work as a senator have been national security and campaigning for better transparency and accountability in government and in the parliament. Against the background of my service with the Royal Australian Navy, I have often spoken in the Senate about defence and security issues, including the rise of Chinese military power. In the years ahead, Australia will face new strategic challenges of a scale we have not experienced for decades. This emerging state of affairs has been highlighted this week by China's diplomatic manoeuvres to gain a military foothold in the Solomon Islands. To ensure Australian security, we will need to significantly boost the capabilities of the Australian Defence Force and to do uh, so much sooner than the 20-year long time frames contemplated by the present government. Recent experience shows that Australia must be prepared to rely on our own resources, military and civilian, to a much greater extent than in the past. Sovereign capabilities and greater self-reliance will be vital for our future security. In particular, our critical infrastructure, especially telecommunications, must be completely secure from foreign interference and possible sabotage. Our vital defence industries, including naval construction, aerospace uh, surveillance and electronic warfare capabilities in South Australia, must be fully safeguarded from espionage. Anyone who seeks to represent our state in this parliament must be fully cognisant of these threats from the Chinese state and free from entanglement that might compromise their preparedness to act without reservation in Australia's national interest. 
In this regard, while I acknowledge former Senator Nick Xenophon's political skills and past rec record as a representative of South Australia, I am strongly of the view, now that he's put his hand up to return to this place, that he must be completely transparent about his dealings with the Chinese te telecommunications giant Huawei. This is a corporation closely aligned with the Chinese state and the Chinese Communist Party, and which has been implicated in Chinese state espionage. Huawei has also aided the internal surveillance activities of, of Chinese state security, especially the oppression of the Uyghur people in Xinjiang. <clears throat> After his resignation from the Senate and failed 2018 political campaign to re-enter the, the uh, South Australian uh, parliament, Mr Xenophon undertook, through a new partnership with former journalist Mark Davis, to represent Huawei as so-called strategic council. At that time, in December 2019, Huawei had already been banned by the federal government. Since then, security concerns about Huawei have only grown. For example, in February 2020, the US government disclosed that Huawei covertly exploited backdoors in carrier equipment supplied to law enforcement agencies. In October 2020, the British Parliament's Defence Committee released a report detailing evidence of the close links and cooperation between Huawei and Chinese state and the Chinese Communist Party. In December last year, it was revealed uh, further that as early as 2012, Australian intelligence detected a sophisticated penetration into our telecommunications system, an intrusion that began with a software update from Huawei that delivered malicious code. While working for Huawei, Mr Xenophon did not register with the Australian Foreign Influence Transparency Scheme. Um, in this, he appears to have relied on the exemption for persons providing legal advice to foreign organisations and a claim that um, he was not directly lobbying government ministers. However, the work that Xenophon Davis did for Huawei appears to have been largely in the public relations field and directed towards influencing the federal government to reopen the door for Huawei to infiltrate Australia's 5G telecommunications network. <clears throat> that is, of course, one of 14 demands the Chinese government has made before they will reconsider their current hostile stance towards Australia. Mr Xenophon declared that Huawei was an underdog. I'm not sure how a vast Chinese conglomerate with global networks backed by the Chinese state could ever be described as an underdog, but that was his description. This was all a misjudgment on Mr Xenophon's part. He was entitled as a private individual to work uh, for, her, for whoever he wished, but the choice he made was akin to someone choosing to do PR work for the German companies Krupp or Messerschmitt in 1938. Mr Xenophon now says, says that he has not worked for Huawei for some time, though we don't know when he ceased. He now claims to support the Australian government's 5G ban on Huawei. As a declared Senate candidate, he should now, in the interests of transparency and accountability, disclose the full details of his contractual relationship with Huawei. He should disclose the terms, conditions and duration of his contract, what instructions he accepted from Huawei and precisely what services he and Mr Davis were paid for. Speaking in 2016 about another former senator who took a controver controversial position in a business, then Senator Xenophon said, and I quote, whether you're a minister or not, I think it's not unreasonable to, to disclose how much you're getting paid and how much lobbyists are getting paid for particular jobs. I think we need to know that. That's a level of transparency that I think is essential. Mr Xenophon chose not to make such a disclosure when he began working for Huawei. He hasn't done so since. It has always been my view that if Mr Xenophon were to again be a candidate for public office, he would need to be fully transparent about his work for Huawei. 
and we have, uh, have to be very clear about the nature of the company that he has been engaged with. It's a huge Chinese corporation intimately connected with the CCP, which supports Chinese state espionage and which, according to documents published in the Washington Post in December last year, was, uh, has helped Chinese authorities create the surveillance network that targets that country's Uyghur minority. There can't be any compromises when it comes to Australia's national security, nor can there be compromises on human rights. Mr Xenophon has declared his political uh, candidacy in the interest of transparency and accountability. He should make an immediate disclosure of all the details uh, about his work for Huawei. I urge him to do so. Voters can then make their own judgment. Thank you. Senator McGrath. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Allegra Spender's candidature in Wentworth has the appearances of another get up 350.org.au dodgy scam with implications for policy on Israel, serious implications. Recently, independent candidate for Wentworth, Allegra Spender, met with David Adler, president of the Australian Jewish Association. Spender said it was really valuable to hear about the current BDS boycott and anti-Semitism. She also said, I oppose the BDS boycott. It is counterproductive to building peace and I'll continue to speak out against it. Meanwhile, a spokesperson for Spender told the Australian Jewish News that former 350.org.au CEO Blair Polisi, who retweeted a post from Sydney Festival boycott organiser Fahad Ali praising the artists who had pulled out, does not and has never worked on Spender's campaign. But the thing is, Spender's tilt for Wentworth is being orchestrated by a group linked to organisations who are increasingly targeting Israel, the main being GetUp. GetUp is founded on the fundamentally false claim that it's independent. Since its inception, GetUp has set out to deceive voters. In 2007, the Electoral Commission warned GetUp's vote, genera vote generator, which put coalition candidates last, was misleading and deceptive. In 2016, GetUp claimed the coalition was cutting hospital funding and backed Labor and the Greens, a lie. Worse, GetUp's campaign was premised on a sham survey of its members. GetUp then misled the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters about this survey. Also in 2016, GetUp and 350.org.au ran a dirty tricks operation against five coalition MPs, buying web addresses likely to be found while searching them on the net and populating these pages with disparaging content. These sites were authorised by Christina McPhail from a Dodgy Brothers Get Up address in Collingwood. McPhail had started at 350.org.au in 2015. In 2019, GetUp telephoned voters telling them lies about coalition candidates and worryingly dispatched goons to bird dog Liberal MPs. The only seat where GetUp was successful was Warringah, where a small group with links to GetUp and 350.org had selected the so-called independent candidate. In January 2018, Ray Yoshida, a former 350.org employee, supposedly took a three-month break from GetUp to lay the groundwork for the North Shore Environmental Stewards. McPhail also helped set up this group, formed to infiltrate Liberal branches and create fake defections. Mossman businessman Rob Grant became its president, and Julie Giannassi joined in August 2018. The instigator of the Rowinga independent movement, Louise Hislop, also had links to the North Shore Environmental Stewards and GetUp. By Islop's account, she calls Small Cow, standing for Coalition of the Willing, comprising of herself, Grant and Giannissini, along with others selected, Zali Stegall. Something similar is now occurring in Wentworth, where a clique with left-wing left links has installed their chosen candidate. By all accounts, Lyndall and Daniel Droger are the prime movers of Wentworth Independent Proprietary Limited. They were quickly joined by Blair Polisi from 350.org.au. Lyndall Droger is created with convincing spender to stand. Daniel Droger is a short seller and typical of the financial spivs like, venture, like vulture capitalist Damien Hodgkinson, who are now backing independence. The Drogers have supported GetUp for at least 15 years, giving $20,000 in 2019 and Daniel giving 
$20,000 in 2007. GetUp's 2000 election report thanked them for this support. GetUp's 2006 seven financial report also thanked Daniel Droger. Voices of Wentworth is still pretending to be uncommitted, but will no doubt have a campaign that will put the Liberals last. Inevitably, GetUp will also publicly back Spender, as it did Karen Phelps. Recently, GetUp organiser Tracy Hamilton was spotted working for the Spender campaign. Spender is also using campaigners called, called Populaire's Agency, comprising former GetUp and Labor campaigners. The people of Wentworth need to know that GetUp is increasingly anti-Israel. GetUp board member Sarah Saleh co-organised the recent BDS boycott of the Sydney Festival. Last year, GetUp posted a video in which Saleh accused Israel of wanting to erase, to erase the Palestinian presence from all over Palestine. It used the false ethnic cleansing claim and bizarrely even charged Australia with direct complicity. Boss of GetUp, Paul Oosting, defended it. He said, we are proud to platform our board director, Sarah Salih. GetUp has joined the civil society groups across the world in a growing global movement of solidarity and hope as people everywhere speak out for justice in Palestine. Executive Council of Australian Jury co-CEO Alex Rivershen said it was another example of an organisation being manipulated into becoming a mouthpiece for the anti-Israel movement. Anti-Defamation Commission Chairman Devere Abramovich said GetUp has lost its moral compass. Regrettably, an anti-Israel stance has been in GetUp's DNA since inception and nowadays is increasingly strident. In 2016, hacked documents from George Soros's Open Society Foundation shed light on Soros' support of groups promoting the Palestinian cause and BDS actions targeting Israel. In 2004, Soros Fund Management gave $150,000 to win back respect, a US campaign started by Jeremy Hymans and David Madden, who founded GetUp a year later. In 2007, Hymans and Madden launched Avaz, a New York-based global online activist platform. In 2008-2009, Avaz received $850,000 from Soros' Open Society Institute via ResPublica. Among the hacked OSF documents is a 2010 memo to Soros which notes, Avaz is already an Open Society Foundation grantee and close collaborator. The OSF documents confirmed its extensive activities in supporting an ugly anti-Israel agenda. They detail numerous grants to organisations advocating for BDS and worse. And surprise, surprise, Avaz is at the forefront of anti-Israel campaigns, in particular BDS. Avaz vows it will keep pushing until all companies financing the occupation of Palestine withdraw their investments. Avaz has given GetUp $340,000 over recent years. And in Australia, GetUp has edged closer to advocating for Palestinian causes and the BDS campaign. In 2009, Anthony Lowenstein blogged how he was contacted by GetUp to begin an online debate on Israel and Palestine as a way for the group to dip its toe into the problem. In 2016, activist Sarah Sally joined GetUp's board, a month later proclaiming, we must force Israel into a perennial state of existential anxiety. We've had GetUp's video demonising Israel and now sailors organising of the Sydney Festival boycott. Speaking of which, the claim by a spokesperson for Allegra Spender that Blair Polisi, who retweeted the post from the Sydney Festival boycott organiser for Hidal, does not and has never worked on a campaign doesn't wash. In fact, it's a lie. Uh, another lie from Spender's campaign. Polisi may not have literally worked on Spender's campaign, but she certainly is a key figure on it. She is a key founder of Voices of Wentworth. Polisi spoke at the first Voices of Wentworth virtual town hall. She was at Spender's campaign launch in a Spender shirt and regularly boosts Spender on her social media. Can the people of Wentworth trust a candidate who has been installed by a long-term GetUp supporter and 350.org.au figure and whose campaign relies on senior GetUp operatives? Allegra Spender can say she opposes BDS, and she may do, but she is the cat's paw for forces who support it. Thank you. And on that note, the Senate stands adjourned and we will meet again tomorrow at 9.30am. Thank you.